Improve your Node.js skills by building four projects. This course is taught by John Smilga, the wonderful instructor from Coding Addict. What's up everybody, this is John from Coding Addict and welcome to another Node.js video. And in this video, we're going to make four Node.js projects. While working on the projects, amongst other things, we'll cover what is MongoDB and how to set it up in our app, how to get up and running with Mongoose, how to set up error handling in Express, and eventually we'll deploy our project to Heroku and implement Swagger documentation as well. Just like my other videos, we'll start with the fundamentals and slowly but surely move up to more complex functionality. This is the second part of Node.js tutorial video. So my assumption is that you're already familiar with Node.js and Express basics. If you're interested in the first video, Node and Express tutorial, you can find the link in the description. In order to follow along with the project, you will need a starter. And the fastest way you can get it is by navigating to johnsmilk.com. Again, the URL is johnsmilk.com. And once you hit this lovely site, look for the projects, more specifically node ones. And then all of these three links lead to the same repo. So you can pick any of them. And once you click, you'll navigate to the repo node express course. And essentially in here, just pick your weapon, whether you want to download zip, or if you just want to clone it, I think in my case, I'm just going to go with download option, then go back to your computer, look for your downloads, then crack open the zip file. And right away, open up your favorite editor. In my case, that is Visual Studio Code. I'll drag and drop. And during this video, we'll work on following projects. So we'll work on zero three task manager, store API, as well as JW2 basics, and jobs API. And for all the projects, you'll have the same structure, where there's going to be a final and a starter. So final is a complete project. And starter is where we'll do all of our work. Now, keep something in mind where for the final one, not only you'll need to install all the dependencies, basically run npm install, but you'll also need to add some additional info. What info? Well, that we will cover during the project. So don't be surprised if you just run npm install and npm start in the final folder and you get back bunch of errors. That's about it for overall setup. And when it comes to project specific setup, I'll cover that right after each project intro video. So once you've got the repo in your text editor, feel free to continue with the video. Awesome. And uh, welcome to our first project, Task Manager API. And um, before we cover the features, let me list the main goals of this project. And they're following. With the help of this project, we will learn how to set up and connect to the cloud database. So effectively, we'll learn how to persist our data to the cloud. And not only that, We'll also learn how to perform all the CRUD operations and CRUD stands for create, read, update, and delete on our data, which is fundamental, fundamental to any application. Also, let me mention that since it's a node course, we will only work on a backend. So essentially the front end app you see right now is already prepared for you and is only there so you get the full picture. And the same is going to be for the rest of the project. I'm probably not going to make front ends for all of them. But if I'll see that a matching front end app can provide more clarity, I'll definitely whip up one as well, just so you can see the entire request and response cycle, not just postman responses. As far as the first project on the front end, we've got a form and a list. And by communicating with our backend, meaning by sending requests to our API, the user can create, read, update, and delete or destroy tasks. Again, let me stress something. This is not your typical to-do list app that stores everything in local storage. What's fundamentally different is that we're going to be responsible for setting up the API that communicates with the cloud database and persist the data to the cloud. And as far as the functionality, it goes something like this, where we have the form. And of course I can enter a new task. And that's exactly how I'll call it. We press submit. So we send off the post request. And since we're successful, we get back all the tasks and the nearest task 
is added to the list. Now we can also delete task. So if I don't want to walk the cat, I just remove it from the list. And then if we want to edit, we click over here. And first, we'll see only the specific data about that one task. And then if we want to edit, for example, if I want to set it up as completed, and if I want to rename it as old task, then of course, we just press edit. Again, we send off the request. And now if we navigate back to all the tasks, now as you can see, it is completed. And the name is different as well. And as far as the task manager setup, like I already previously mentioned, we have final folder. So this is where you'll find complete project. However, not only we need to install all dependencies, but also if you take a look at the readme, you'll notice a text where it says in order to run the project, you need to set up dot env and set up the Mongo URI connection variable. And essentially, these are the things that we'll cover during the project. So in order to spin up the project, yes, you'll have to watch some videos where we actually cover that. And only then you'll be able to do that. Now, as far as the setup, a lot of things should look very familiar. So in here we have the public. And of course, in the public, this is where we have our app. Again, everything is already prepared for you. And just so we all are on the same page, I actually created that with vanilla JS. And then of course, we have the app JS. And here I simply have one line task manager app. And then if you take a look at the package JSON, as far as the packages, we have express something we covered in the second part of the course. And then you see two more packages dot env and mongoose. And of course, these ones will cover during the project why they're there. And what is going to be the use case. Now, in order to make our dev setup easier, I also installed nodemon as a dev dependency. And as far as the script, well, you just need to type npm start. And that essentially will spin up nodemon with app js. And then we also have git ignore, which we're going to cover a little later once we create the dot env. But long story short, this is just a file that prevents specific files being added to the source code. And essentially with this setup, these two things will be ignored if we decide to push this up to the GitHub. So we'll ignore node modules because usually they're pretty big and then dot env because this is where we want to keep our secrets. And of course, we will cover this one later in the project. And once we're familiar with the setup, let's kick things into gear and actually start working on a project. And the first thing that you need to do is to navigate to the starter folder. Again, you're looking for the third project, the task manager, and then more specifically, the starter folder. And I think the fastest way to navigate there is by just typing CD and then grab the star folder and drop it here. And then once you're in a star, before you do anything, make sure that you install all the packages. And of course, we do that by running npm install. And then once all the packages are in place, in order to spin up the nodemon, we need to go with npm start. Unless, of course, you want to change it to different command. If that's the case, then make the changes and then use that command instead. So in my case, I'll just wait a little bit. I mean, it shouldn't take too long. There's not that many packages in there. And then once I have all the packages in place, then of course, like I said, we're going to go with npm start. And if you see task manager in a console, we are in good shape. And now let's set up the most basic express server. Essentially, it's just going to be listening for one route forward slash hello, and it's going to be on a port 3000. Now, if you want to jog your memory and test it up yourself, just pause the video and resume once you're done. If you don't want to do that, just keep on watching the video. And the way we set up the most basic express server is by setting up a variable by the name of express, then we'll set it equal to require, and that's going to be equal to our express package. Then we need to initialize it. So we go with app and that is equal to express and we invoke it. And then unlike the previous examples, 
we'll actually set up a variable by the name of port. And for time being, we'll hard code this to 3000. But eventually, there's going to be more code. And I'll talk about the reasoning later. So for now, just set up the variable, and we'll be in good shape. And in here we need to go with app that listen, of course. And first thing we pass in is the port. And the second is the console log. So we go here with some kind of text. And I'm going to go with server is listening on port. And then of course, we pass in the port value. And I always like to add those three dots as well. So I'll do it in this case. And then I'll open up my console. The moment I have server is listening on port 3000, which is just awesome. So now let's also set up that one lonely route. So above the port, I'm going to go with my comment routes, and then we'll just say app.get. So this is going to be a get request. Now what is going to be the URL? Well, we'll go with port slash and hello. So that's going to be the path. And then of course, we have the callback function. Once the user hits the route, and we're looking for a rec and res, so request and response. And we simply want to go with res dot send, and then we'll pass task manager and app. So I'll save it here. I'll navigate to the browser. And I'm looking for port 3000, of course. And then we'll go with hello. And if we see task manager app displayed in the browser, then of course, we are off to the great start. Beautiful. And once we have the bones in place, Next, let's take a look at our application. So we can decide what routes eventually we're going to have. And I can see that I'm getting all my tasks. So there will definitely be a get request that gets me all my items. Now I can also create a new task. So there will be a post request that can create a new task. Now we can also delete one. So there will be a route for that. And if we click on edit, we open up a new page. And in here, we get info about a specific route. So there will be a get request that just gets me info about one single task. And also, we'll have the ability to edit. So if I change the completed from true to false, and if I successfully edit that, then if I go back to the tasks, of course, in here, I don't see the check mark, which means that I successfully edited the task. And what that means is that there's also a route for the update. And in summary, our routes are going to look something like this, where there will be a get request on API version one, and then tasks. So this will get all the tasks, then there will be a post request on API version one tasks, again, the same URL, however, the method is different. So total different functionality. In this case, we'll create a new task. And then we have get route with params. So with the ID of the task that gets us that single task. And of course, one for update and one for delete. And since there's a lot to unpack over here, I'll spend the next video on the reasons behind such API structure. All right, so let's go step by step. And probably your first question is, well, why do we go here with forward slash API and then version one? And essentially, that is just a convention. We need to understand that on the server, we also might have different routes, not just the routes for the API. So for example, you could be serving a index page here on a forward slash, meaning there could be a nice index HTML page that you're serving up over here. And then also on the same server, you have the API routes. So convention is effectively just to signal that all of these are the API routes. Now, as far as the version, well, as you're setting up the API, eventually you might want to change some things. So it's easier if you have this version, because that way, when you create a new one, then you can just direct everybody to API and then version two, three, or whatever. And while we're still on that same note, why don't we navigate to a hacker news one, the one that I showed you previously with Algolia, and you'll notice exactly the same setup, where essentially they go with domain, 
and then forward slash and then API and then version number one. And that leads me to my next point, where if you're ever in doubt, or if you're just interested on different setups, just check out the different APIs. There's tons of APIs out there. And you can just look for one, then take a look at their setup, and then decide if what they're doing makes sense to you. Then of course, you can implement in your project. If not, then just move on to a different API. And eventually, you'll find a setup that makes the most sense to you. After that, you're probably wondering, okay, I understand the API and then version, that kind of makes sense. But why do we go here with get and then tasks, then we have the post and the same tasks, and then for get patch and delete, we go to the tasks, but then we're looking for the colon. Why isn't this written in a different way where we're just looking for a single task or something along those lines? And to give you a short answer, that is a convention. But since there's more to it, I want to actually cover that in a few videos. So I want to set up the basic routes with just some simple responses. Then I want to open up the postman and do a little bit of setup over there. And then right before we start setting up the database, I actually want to spend one video on just talking about the convention. And then lastly, if you remember, in tutorial, we worked with put. And now for the update, we're using patch. And I know that this might be a little bit frustrating to you. But that's also going to be something that we will cover a bit later. Once we have already a working application, because that way, I believe that I can give you a solid example of the differences between the put and patch. That's about it for the general route structure. So now let's start implementing it. Not bad, not bad. I think we're good with the general structure. So now let's start implementing it. And I want to right away set up the router as well as the controllers. And if you remember at the very end of the express tutorial, I covered why is that necessary. And essentially, the short answer is that as our application grows bigger, it's not going to be very sustainable if we'll just start dumping everything in the app.js. And for the time being, I just want to create this one route. Now, as far as the response, it's just going to be a simple string that says, hey, here are all the items or something along those lines. And then once we have that one in place, then we'll add the rest of them. And then we'll test it out in the postman. So let's get cracking. And I'm going to go with new folder. So here will be all the controllers. And in this case, I'm going to be looking for the tasks. And I also want to set up a routes folder. So in the routes folder, we'll go with new file. And same thing, we're going to go with tasks JS. And then as far as the setup in the routes, we need to look for the express router. So say const express, and that is equal to require. And then again, we'll look for express. And this should be a refresher because we did cover that at the end of the express tutorial. So just to jog your memory, if we go back to express tutorial, and then more specifically, we'll look for the final one, the file 13, the router people shows a basic router example. And essentially, we have two options. We can either go with a router get and then add all the controllers one by one, or we can actually chain them together where we go with a router and then use a route. So this is going to be the main route, in our case, API version one, and then tasks. And then we chain get and post. And I think I'm going to go with this setup. So first, let's start by setting up the router. And that is equal to express and then a router, we invoke it. And then eventually we'll import controllers. But for now, of course, we don't have any. So let's just leave that one blank. And we'll go with router, router, then route, like I said, then forward slash. And then I want to go with get method. And for time being, I'll just hard code the response over here. So say rec and res and res dot and send. And like I said, we'll just start simply. So say all items. Now let's save that one. And then all the way in the bottom, we want to go with module exports, and that is equal to our router. So now back in the app.js, 
we want to import the router. We want to import our tasks and we want to set up the middleware. So in here, let's just go with const and then routes. And that is equal to require. And then, like I said, we're going to be looking in the routes folder. And then more specifically, we're looking for the tasks. And then right after this, hello, and don't worry, we'll change that one a little bit later for time being. It can just stay the way it is. We'll go with app dot use. And then, of course, what route are we looking for? Well, we want to go with API, then version one, and then tasks. So that's going to be that root route for the tasks router. And then we just want to go with our routes. And you know what? Let's just change it around. My bad. For some reason, I went with the routes. Let's just call it tasks. I believe it's going to make a bit more sense. And since we'll be sending JSON from our application, for example, when we're creating a new task, and since I want to access that data in my routes, what do we need to do, of course, is get middleware that is built into Express. And that middleware is Express JSON. So above the routes, we'll go here and I'll try to spell this correctly since that is always an issue. Hopefully this is correct, middleware. And then we'll just go with app.use and eventually we'll set up the static one as well. But since at the moment we have barely any routes, I'm just going to go with express and JSON. If you remember, if we don't use this, then we won't have that data in rec.body. So I'll save it here and I'll leave the comments just so we all are on the same page. And before I test it out in the browser, let me just double check. So I'm using the middleware where I'm saying that I'm looking for API version one and then tasks. And then I pass in my router, my tasks router. And then in the router, effectively, I have this root path, which just matches whatever I pass over here. So again, I go with API version one and then tasks. And then I set up a get route where I manually pass in my controller. And in here, I just say res.send and I pass in a string of all items. And it looks about right. So let me go here and we're going to go with localhost 3000 since it's a get request. Of course, we can access it again, API version one and then tasks. And we should see a string of all items. And if we do, then of course, we're heading in the right direction. So the last thing that I want to do in this video is to first close my express tutorial one. And then in the controllers, we want to create a new file. And we'll call this tasks JS. And again, just to jog your memory, the whole deal, why we're setting up separate routes and separate controllers, because if I'll try to jam everything in app JS, it's going to get messy pretty fast. So what I want to do right now is take this logic and place it in a separate file because eventually, of course, there will be way more logic than just res.send. So I'm going to go to my controllers and effectively I want to create my function, the controller function, and I'm just going to go with const get all and then tasks and I'll set it up as an R function. I'm looking for a rec and res and functionality will be exactly the same res.send. And we're just going to go with all and then items. And then we're going to go with module exports. And since I'm going to add more functions in here, I'll right away export it as an object. So I'll say get all tasks. That's when I'm exporting. And then back in the routes, of course, I want to access it. So I'll say here that I wanted the structure get all tasks from. And of course, we need to require it. And in this case, we're looking in the controllers. So I'm going to go two levels up. I'm looking for controllers and then a more specifically task. So instead of hard coding this value, of course, I'll just pass it in and I'll say get all tasks. And if I go back to my URL and if I can still see all items, then of course, we are in good shape. And let me just test it out where I'll change this around and I'll say all items from from the file. And then if we go back, yep, we still have the correct result. 
And with this in place, now we can set up the same basic structure for the rest of the routes as well. Beautiful. And in the same fashion, let's set up the rest of the controllers. So we have the get one. Now I want to create one for the post, one for get, but that's going to be a single item. Then we also have one for patch and one for delete. And pretty much in all of them, the setup is going to be exactly the same as far as functionality. I'll just send back and I'll say what the controller is doing. Since, of course, we haven't connected to the database or anything like that. And I just need to come up with a name. In my case, I'm going to go with create task. And again, we have rec and res. And then we want to copy and paste since I want to speed this up. And I'll just say create task, create task. And why don't we change this one around? And we'll say get all tasks. Now we want to copy and paste. And we'll have three more. We'll have one for getting the task. So get task. And here we'll say get single task. Then we'll have one for updating. And that's exactly how we'll call it. We'll say update task. And the same is going to be over here. And then the last one, of course, will be delete and then task. And you guessed it. We also need to change the text. And now, of course, we want to place that in the same object. So let's go with create task, then get task. Then we have update task. And last one is delete task. And then back in the routes, of course, we want to import them. So I'll say here, create task, get task, then update task and delete one. And now we just need to set up the routes. If we take a look at the app JS, these two, the get and post are going to go to API version one and then tasks. And then the rest of them are going to be with the ID params. So same initial path, but then we'll just add the forward slash and then the ID. And that's, of course, is where we're going to pass the ID of the task. So where I have the get request to get all the tasks, I'll chain dot post. And of course, which controller are we going to use? Of course, the create task one. And then we can simply go to the next line and we'll go with router, then route. And like I said, we'll go with forward slash and then ID. And then we're looking for get route. And that will be equal to get the single task. Then we'll set up our patch and that will be equal to update task. And then lastly, we have delete one and that will be equal to a delete task. Now, since we know that we can only really test the single task and get all tasks because that's the default method the browser performs, we'll stop over here. And in the next video, we'll spin up the postman to quickly test all of our routes. Because trust me, you don't want to go any further without knowing that at least the basic setup works because you can set up whatever logic you have over here. If there's a small bug and you cannot access these strings, then you'll spend way more time later searching for that bug. Nice job. And once we have the basic structure for all of our routes, now let's test them out in the postman. So I'm going to head back to my desktop. I'm looking for the postman. And since in this case, we'll spend way more time over here, I also want to cover some configuration options. So for starters, I want to switch to a dark mode because I think you'll appreciate that more. So if you want to do that as well, just go to the cog and then you're looking for the settings here. And then in the settings, just look for the themes. And of course, we have a dark theme as well. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do. Then we want to create a collection. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, since we'll be setting up multiple routes and they will reference the same application, which is going to be easier as we create more and more applications. And in order to create that collection, we go here and click on creating the collection. And for starters, I just want to change the name. So I'll click on these three dots over here. And of course, we're looking for rename. And then I'm just going to go with zero three. And we'll call this task manager. 
Now, if you're not happy with this name, of course, pick your own one. And once I have the task manager, then we want to start by creating a request. So we create a new request. It's going to be a get request. And instead of typing all the time manually here, local and then host, and we're going to go with 3000. And then, of course, API version one and then tasks. What we want to do is set up a global variable. Now, there's multiple ways how we can do that. You can actually set up the environment. So think of this as a dev environment, and then you can have production environment. But in our case, we'll just set up this local host and then 3000 and then API and version one simply as a variable. And you can do it from here. As you can see, they even give you suggestion and all that. But I'm just going to go the long route where we click here on that I. And then notice I have already one for the URL. I have localhost 3000. And then I actually change it later to forward slash API. So now what I want to do, I want to showcase how we can remove it. So if I go over here and if I remove it and I set up a new one, in this case, again, I'll call this URL. And then as far as this value, well, I'm just going to take this whole thing. So I'm going to go with localhost and then 3000. And of course, we're looking for API. And if you want, you can also include the tasks. But in my case, I'll stop right after the version one. So let's copy that one. Again, I'm setting this up as a global, but you can set it up in the environment as well. And then once we add that, we should be able to right away access it. So now, of course, we just need to save it. And then in order to use it, we need to go back. And you know what? I'll remove everything for now. And if we go with these double curlies, this is going to give us access to those variables. And all the way in the bottom, we have the URL. And of course, as you can see, it is global. So in here, I'm going to go with URL. I'll close it. And then I'll go with forward slash and then tasks. And once I save, I should get back get all tasks. And of course, that means that our basic setup works. And before we continue and do the same thing with the rest of the tasks, now, of course, we want to save it. And not only we want to save it, we want to save it in our collection. So let's click over here, save as, and let's give it a more meaningful name. And in this case, again, I'll say get all tasks. And of course, we're looking for task manager. So this is going to be saved in this collection. And we simply click on save. So if I take a look at my task manager, now, of course, I have get all tasks where we use the global variable and we can successfully see our string. And I'll close a few of these tabs because it's getting quite busy. And let's do the same thing for the rest of them. So in this case, I'm going to be testing the create one, the one for the post. That's why we need to change the method. That's the first thing you want to do. Then we'll go with our URL. Again, we'll close it out forward slash and then tasks. And remember, now we want to send some data, correct? Now, we're not doing anything with that data on a server, but just for the kicks, why don't we send it? I'm going to go here with body. Then we're looking for the raw. And of course, we're not looking for text. We're looking for the JSON. We just need to make sure that we use the correct syntax. And in this case, I'll say name. And that will be equal to testing. And we just click on send. And if we can see create task, we are in good shape. Now, since I also want to test out whether my middleware is working, I'm going to go back to my controllers. I'm looking for create task. And in here, instead of just going with send, we're going to go with JSON. So now I'll be sending back the JSON and I'll pass in reg.body. So if you want, of course, you can console log it on a server. But in my case, I think it's going to be faster if I just send back whatever I'm getting from the client. So if we go back and if we change this around and we'll say here, shake and bake. And if we add a comma and then completed, we set to true. Once we send, that should be our response. And of course, the only thing that's left to do as far as the create route is go to save as 
and then we'll say create task, save it. And now let's continue again. I'll close these ones just so it's not that busy. And in this case, I want to go with get route. Then we want to go here with the URL again. And of course, we haven't set up the database, so there's no real ID, but we can definitely test it out if we just go with tasks and then whatever gibberish. So in this case, I'm going to go with hello. So that's going to be my ID. So we're not sending anything as far as data, but we are using the params. Again, if we take a look at the routes, we can clearly see that we have forward slash and then ID. That is going to be our param. And if we want to test it out, where we have get task, of course, we have the request and the ID is sitting in the params. So in here, I'll do the same thing. I'll say JSON and we'll just say ID. And that one is equal to rec params and the ID. So if we save here and then go back and just use the get route and click send, we have the key with the name of ID. And then the value is hello. So if we'll change it around and if we'll say Peter, of course, the value will be Peter. Again, same spiel. We go with save as and we'll name this update task or I'm sorry, get single task. My apologies, get single task. We'll save it. And then we have two more. We have one for update and one for remove. And in order to speed this up, I don't think I'm going to do any testing anymore. We simply want to open up a new route. We want to go with patch in this case. And again, we're going with URL and then forward slash tasks, whatever value you want to pass in over here. So I'm going to go with one, two, three, send. And of course, I have update task. Beautiful. Let's save that one. And we'll write here update and task. And the last one, of course, is delete. So let's close these two. And again, your request, we're looking for delete method. The URL is going to be exactly the same. And then we want to go with forward slash tasks and then any of the IDs that we have already used, since we'll change that later anyway. And once we send the response should be delete the task. Now, if you don't want to go with save as you can simply click on command S, that's going to be a shortcut. And we go here with delete and then task. And of course, we save it in the same task manager. And once we can clearly see that we can access all our routes correctly, then we can move on to our next topic. Okay. And once we're done with the postman, before we start setting up our database, let's quickly talk about our routes. More specifically, why we use such structure. Long story short, it's because we're building a REST API. And since these days, the term API is used pretty much for everything. Let's just all agree that in our case, since we're building a server, essentially, we want to create a HTTP interface. So the other apps, most likely front end ones, can interact with our data. That's how we view API in this scenario. And when it comes to REST, it stands for representational state transfer, and arguably it's the most popular API design pattern. And essentially, it's a pattern that combines HTTP verbs, route paths, and our resources, aka data. So effectively, REST determines how the API looks like. Now, let me emphasize something. It's a pattern, not a strictly enforced set of rules. So nothing stops you from setting your own API in totally different manner. In fact, if you have used APIs on your front end apps, you know that some of them have totally different structure. I guess the best advice I can give you is this, whatever pattern you decide on, stick with it. Or in other words, be consistent. Otherwise, it's just going to be very confusing for your users. And this is a common approach where you have the main list. So that could be orders, that could be customers, that could be items, whatever. And of course, in our case, it is tasks. And in order to get all the items, we go with get method. And then if we want to create one, it's going to be the same endpoint, but we just go with different method. And of course, in this case, it is post. And not to be redundant, we already discussed this before. 
but just because they have the same URL, the same endpoint, since the methods are different, in this case, we have get. And of course, in the second scenario, we have post. These are two totally different requests. Please keep that in mind. And then for individual item, you have the same path pretty much. So you have API and then tasks, orders, customers, or whatever. And then you just use the params to point to that one specific item. And then if you want to get the item, then of course, it is a get method. For update, you'll use put or patch. And then to delete one, you'll use the delete method instead. And since JSON is a common format for receiving and sending data in REST API, we'll use that approach as well. So even though at the moment we use send method in our routes, eventually we'll switch to JSON method instead. Also, I would like to point out that REST in general is somewhat fuzzy. In fact, oftentimes you'll deviate away from straight up REST since that's what the setup will require. One more thing, you can probably notice something. Essentially, our API allows our user to perform a CRUD operations on our data. And CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Destroy. And it's a common approach where the API interface is built around CRUD. Since those are usually or typically operations that users or apps want to perform on a given data, whether it is, again, users, orders, customers, or in our case, of course, it is going to be a task. And we'll return to CRUD a little later when I can actually show you how it relates to our data. Lastly, there's obviously more to REST, and some of that we will discuss in later projects. But since I'm not a big fan of long slide videos, and I believe we covered all the major points, we'll stop right here and move on to our database setup. If you remember in Express Tutorial, the route setup was extremely similar to that we have right now with one big caveat. We used basic array to store some list of items on our server. And based on the request, we performed some kind of operation on the list and then send back the response. And of course, that is not very serious approach to store our data. And therefore, starting with this project, we'll set up and connect to a proper database. And pretty much for the remainder of the course, we'll use NoSQL or non-relational database by the name of MongoDB. Now, I'm not going to dwell on differences between non-relational and relational databases, as well as pros and cons for each of them. But the major difference is that unlike traditional database, where we have rows and columns in MongoDB, we can simply store everything as JSON. And basically, it doesn't care how the data relates to each other. Instead of tables, we have collections, which represent group of items. And instead of rows, we have documents, which represent single item. And a document is a set of key value pairs. And as far as data types, we can use strings, numbers, arrays, objects, and many more. It's very easy to get started. And even though you can set it up on your local machine as well, we'll right away go for cloud option, since that's something you'll probably end up doing anyway. We'll use MongoDB Atlas, which is a official option. Basically, it's created by the same people who created MongoDB. And since they offer generous free tier, you'll just have to create an account and you'll be good to go. And once we're familiar with MongoDB, let's set up and configure MongoDB Atlas so we can host and manage our data in the cloud. I have the account already, but since I want to cover all the steps in detail, I'll set up another dummy account together. And remember, we can set up the entire thing for free. So don't worry, your credit card can stay nicely tucked away in your wallet. If you get stuck or confused in any of the steps we're about to take, here's an awesome resource you can use. Just Google create MongoDB Atlas and follow this link, which actually brings us to official docs. And here you'll find a checklist, which we're going to use as our roadmap for the following few videos. And what is the first thing they want us to do? Create a new account. So let's do this, people. I'm going to open this up in new tab. And then, of course, you can find a bunch of useful info in here. Yada, yada, yada. You keep on scrolling. And I actually want to navigate to a login page. And I'm just going to pretend that I don't have the account. And we're going to go for sign up. 
And in here, of course, you just need to provide all the necessary info. And once you have filled everything out, and as a side note, don't worry, this is not my real phone number. Then, of course, just click on sign up. And up next, they're going to ask for organization and project name. And in my case, I'm going to go with node and express course. Then I'll pick JavaScript. We'll click on continue. And we probably can actually skip this, but let's just leave it there. And up next, they want us to set up the cluster. Now, if you take a look at the checklist, actually cluster is already second step. So let's go back here. And pretty much you always want to shoot for a free one, unless of course you want to start paying them. So in here, we'll just go with create cluster. That's going to be the free one. Then it's using AWS. Okay, awesome. As far as region, I'm going to go with this one. Then we have cluster tier and additional settings. And we'll leave them both as default. And lastly, I just want to change the name. And I think I'm going to go with node express and project. And once we're done, we just need to click on create cluster. And we'll get ourselves a new cluster. Now, as you can see over here, they say that it's going to take a little bit of time, which is usually the case. So I'll stop the video here. And I'll see you next one where we'll continue with our steps. And once our cluster is ready to go, before we start messing around with data, so with collections and documents and all that, there's a few things that I want to do first. And I'm going to start by setting up the database access. So effectively in here, we'll set who can access our database. Now, I'm not talking about the Atlas account. No, I'm talking about the database and collections we're about to set up. And we simply need to click on add new database user. And we're going to go with password. And if you get some default values, just wipe them clean. And I'll simply go with john. And as far as the password, I'm just going to go with 1234. Please, please, please do not do that in your own setup. The only reason why I'm doing that because you'll be able to see my password anyway. And don't worry, once I'm done setting up this project, of course, I will change my password. So it's not going to be 1234. And once you're done with the user and password notice, we have database user privileges. And this user can read and write to any database. So I'll leave it the way it is. And we'll add a new user. That's good. I'll close this one. And then we want to set up the network access. So we want to set up from where we can access our database. And you can already imagine that, of course, once we deploy the project, then of course, we'll set up that IP address. But for the time being, while we work locally, we might as well set up access from anywhere. Now, if you want, you can set up your own IP address here. So you can just add the current one. But in my case, I'm going to go with allow access from anywhere. And I'll just click on confirm. And lastly, I want to get the connection string that we're going to use once we connect our database to our application. And in here, what you're looking for is connect. So you want to go back to the cluster, then connect. And then you want to go with connect your application. So not the compass one, not the Mongo shell, actually the second one here, connect your application. And then I'm going to go with 3.6 or later. That's about right. And then you just want to copy this one and then navigate back to our project. Now, eventually we'll set it up as the environment variable. Yes, that's going to be the case. But for the time being, I'll simply create a new folder in the starter and I'll call this DB. And then inside of the DB, there's going to be a new file and I'll call this connect.js. And then I want to create a new variable and I'll call this connection string and I'll set it equal to that value. Now we'll have to add some values over here, but we'll do that later once we're actually ready to connect our application to the database. So just take the string, copy and paste, set it up in the DB and then connect JS. And now we can start exploring the Atlas setup. As a quick side note, while working in local setup, essentially while working on your computer, 
you can use any of these two options. So either access from anywhere or our actual IP address. But once we go to production, more specifically, once we deploy our project to Heroku, you will need to use access from anywhere option. Otherwise, you'll get an error and you won't be able to connect your app to MongoDB. Now, this is specific to Heroku. For example, when it comes to DigitalOcean, another popular option for hosting your node apps, if you're using your local address while developing, once the project is hosted, you just swap the IP address from local to production. But the way Heroku setup works, you'll need to go with allow from anywhere option. Otherwise, you'll get an error. And once we have set up database access, network access, as well as the connection string, now let's actually explore the data part. And we want to click on collections. Then we're going to go with our own data. And then we need to come up with a database name. Now, the first one will be a dummy one. And of course, once we connect to our application, then we'll create a task manager one. So the first one I'll just call store. And then they ask us to create a collection. And don't worry, I'll cover what actually are collections and all that. But for time being, I'm just going to go with product. And then we'll create one. And once we have everything in place, we are ready to start creating documents. So whenever we talk about MongoDB, we'll have the database. So that essentially is going to be that application. Again, in our case, eventually, this will be the task manager one. And then inside of that database, we'll have collections. Now, if you're familiar with regular databases, you can think of them as tables. And in our collections, we'll have group of MongoDB documents. So if I name my one products, you can probably already guess that here I'll have list of products. And if I'll decide that my store will also have users, of course, I can go here and create a new collection. And as a quick side note, we won't have to do this manually. I'm just showing you the general setup manually. Of course, eventually, all of this is going to happen automatically once we connect from our task manager. So I have a list of products. And then of course, I can also create list of users or list of orders. And hopefully you get the gist. And once we have our list, now let's talk about the individual items. So I can go to any of my collections. And then once I'm here, I can insert a document. And document in MongoDB effectively represents that one single item. And what's really cool that just like JavaScript object, effectively, it's a set of key value pairs. Now, by default, the moment we create a new document, we'll get this underscore ID, which is going to be that unique ID. So we don't need to worry about the IDs. And then, of course, we need to set up a type. So what is going to be the type for our document? What is going to be the type for the item? And if you click over here, as you can see, these are our options. We can set it up as an array, binary, boolean, and yada, yada, yada. And I'm purposely not going to spend too much time on types, since eventually we'll set it up from our server anyway. And at that point, the setup is going to be a bit different, since we'll use tool called mongoose. Now, in our case, what are we looking for? Well, we're just looking for the string. I'm just going to go here with name. And then I'll set it equal as first and product. So here, of course, I can insert. And now not only I have the product collection, but I also have my first item, my first document. And here comes the biggest gotcha. In MongoDB documents have a dynamic schema. And what that means in plain English is the simple fact that documents in the same collection don't need to have the same set of fields or the structure. So if I were to go to insert document, and instead of string, I'm going to go with array, and I'm going to call this colors. And then I'll set my first one to be red, then second one blue. And if I'll save it, as far as MongoDB is concerned, they're still the same items in this product collection. So nothing stops you from doing that. Now, just because you can does not mean you should. And therefore, we will use additional library by the name of mongoose, 
which will set up that structure for us. But as far as straight up MongoDB, yes, both of these documents are still part of this product collection, even though their structure might be totally different. A few videos ago, while discussing REST, I mentioned CRUD. Create, read, update, and destroy or delete. And now I want to quickly show you how is that going to look like with our current manual setup. I fully understand that some parts might look really silly, especially the read one. But in my opinion, it's important that we start with the basics. And hopefully that way we'll have a better understanding of overall principles when we need to implement CRUD in our REST API. So what does CRUD means in our manual setup? Well, first, we want to create an item, correct? So in here, we just find any of the collections. And in this case, I'm going to stick with products since I already have some items over here. And then we simply go with insert document. And again, we just come up with a type and then some kind of value. And in my case, I think I'm going to go with another name and I'll just leave it as a string and I'll say test crud. I'll insert the document and I'm done. So we're done with the first part where we created an item. Now the second one, reading them. Well, we simply stare at the screen and we can see that we have three items. So I can see that I have three products. Again, in our application, that just means that we'll be able to read the documents that we have in our database. When we were working with GUI, it's very straightforward where you're just staring at the screen. Then we want to update them. And then with the manual approach, we just look for this little pencil and we say that we want to change some values around here. So in here, I could go with another item and I'll say green. So now, of course, I have successfully updated the array as well. And you know what? Let's also add one more and I'll call this orange. Then I update. And I'm done with that part as well. So not only we can create read, but we can also update. And then the last one, delete. Well, we simply look for another icon. In this case, we're looking for the trash icon. So we just click here. And now, of course, we remove the item. So that's the basic approach of CRUD in our manual setup. All right. And once our database is ready to go, now we need to connect to it from our server. And we can definitely use the native MongoDB driver. And I believe the package name was just that, MongoDB. But a very popular alternative is to use package by the name of Mongoose instead, which is a object data modeling library. And essentially the reason why it's so popular and why we're going to use it in this and the rest of our projects is because right out of the box, it comes with a bunch of goodies that make our development faster. Now, I'm not going to list them in this video since you'll see them in action in all of our projects. Just let me repeat that. Yes, you can set up your apps with just native MongoDB package. But the reason Mongoose is so popular is because it has extremely straightforward API and it basically does all the heavy lifting for us. When it comes to our project, I already installed Mongoose. So we can start using it right away. But if you want to use Mongoose in your own future projects, the command is npm install and Mongoose. And one last thing in this project, we're going to be using Mongoose version five something. So if by the time you're watching this, and uh, if they have a higher version, pretty much everything starting from six. So if you have five point, I don't know, 14, 15 or whatever, you'll be still in good shape. But if by the time you're watching this, they already have version six, their API might also be different. And at that point, you have two options. Install this particular Mongoose version or just use the latest one and utilize their docs. As a quick side note, since I recorded the course, Mongoose did come out with new version, version number six. Now, the good news is that as far as I checked, the only change that affects our project is the lack of deprecation warnings, which we're going to cover in the next video. Rest of them don't really affect us. Now, I still suggest using Mongoose version that's already installed in the star while working on these projects. But as far as I've tested and the current student feedback, you'll have no problem implementing the knowledge in your own projects 
with version 6 instead. All right. And once we're familiar with Mongoose, let's kick it up a notch and finally start using our database on our server. And the first thing we need to do is to set up a connection. And at least a basic setup is going to look something like this, where we're going to import Mongoose. And of course, we're going to do that in ConnectJS. So I'm looking for DB folder, and then more specifically for ConnectJS. And then here at the top, above the connection string, I'm going to go with const Mongoose. That's the name of my instance. And then that one is equal to require. And of course, I'm looking for the Mongoose. And once I have the instance, then the method name is connect. So we go here with mongoose.connect. And the first thing we want to pass in is the connection string. But if you remember, I said that we'll have to make some changes. Take a look. So this is going to be my username, correct? But then what is the value for the password? Of course, that is some dummy value. So in here, we need to pass in our actual password. So in my case, of course, that is one, two, three, four. But I strongly suggest using more secure one for your application. And then here at the very end, we have my first database. So this is what they set up by default. And that's going to be the name for the database if I don't change it. And you're probably wondering, well, wait a minute. I mean, we didn't set this up on the Atlas. So why it's here? You see, if it's not going to be there, it's going to be created for you. So here you have two options. Either you can just go with this one, or in my case, I'm going to remove it. And again, just make sure that you don't remove more than you should. So you want to remove everything starting with a forward slash all the way to the question mark. And in here, of course, you need to come up with a name. And in my case, I'm going to go with the same name as my application. So since I have 0.1 for no tutorial and then task manager is 0.3, that's exactly what I'm going to set up over here. So I'm going to go with 0.3, then hyphen. And I think I'm going to go uppercase. So I'm going to go with 0.3 task and manager. Again, this is going to be the database name. And if you haven't created that database already, they will create for you. And once we add these changes, our connection string is ready to go. So now we simply need to pass in as a first argument. Now, the second argument is going to be options. And effectively, this is where we'll pass in some values just to avoid some deprecation warnings. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. But for the time being, we'll just leave it empty. And then this returns a promise. So we simply can go with dot then. And since I want to see whether I'm successful, uh, as far as the connection, I'll just pass in a callback function. And I'll say log. And of course, I'll remove the semicolon. And I'll say connected connected to the DB dot dot dot. And then since there might be an error as well, we also want to go with catch. And of course, we'll just be looking for the error. So we have our callback function. And I'll say error. And we'll simply console log the error. So we'll say here, console log, and I'm going to be looking for the error. And once we save, nothing happens. And the reason why nothing happens is because we're not executing this function yet. But if you remember, during tutorial, one of the first things that I covered is the fact that if we have a function in a module where the function is effectively executed there and then, we only need to import, meaning require the module, and we'll right away execute the function. So I simply want to navigate to app.js, and then this is just temporary because we will change the setup around this one. We won't leave it this way. I just want to get the connection up and running. And therefore, I'm just going to go to app.js. And then we go with require. And notice I'm not assigning this to any kind of variable. Simply go with require. Then we look in the DB. And then more specifically, we're looking for the connect. And once you save, you'll have tons of deprecation warnings. And don't worry, we'll fix them in a second. But all the way in the bottom, if everything is correct over here, if you passed in the correct password and you grab the correct connection string, then you should see connected to the database. And if I want to test out the error, I'll simply remove the four since I know that that is going to be a wrong password. So once I save now, of course, 
I'll have this error. So I'm just going to keep on scrolling and notice here it's going to say Atlas error. And of course, I already know why, because my password is correct. And if we'll take a look at our graphical interface in the Atlas, once we refresh, we're not going to see any changes because again, we haven't set up any kind of logic. So you're looking at it, you're like, okay, I still have one database. What's happening? Don't worry. Once we start adding the items, that database will be created for us. In my case, 0 0.3 task manager. And even though I will refactor this in the next video, because there's some gotchas that I want to talk about. Before we do that, I'll show you how we can remove those deprecation warnings in a console. And if you remember, we just need to pass in a second argument, which is going to be an object. And in here, we just need to pass in following key value pairs. And we'll start with use new URL parser, and we'll set it equal to true. And then we'll look for use create index. We'll set that one equal to true. And then we'll go with use find and modify. That one will be false. And then lastly, we want to go with use unified topology. And that one will set equal to true. So once I save, now I don't have any of those warnings. I simply see servers listening on port 3000. And then I have connected to the database. And if that is also something that you see in a console, you are in good shape. And we're ready to move on to the next step. Nice. We have successfully connected to the database and life is great. But before we start messing around with the data, there's something that's bugging me. And it's simply the fact that our server and database connection don't work in sync. Now, what do I mean? Well, let's take a look at the console. So first, I have console log that our server is listening on port 3000. And only then we're connecting to the database. But if we think about it, what is really a use for our server if we are not connected to the database? Whatever we're about to do is going to fail anyway. So what I'm trying to say is, wouldn't it make more sense if we try to connect to the database and only if we're successful, then we spin up the server? If not, well, then we'll just kill the application. And in order to do that, we need to restructure our code a bit where I'm not going to invoke mongoose connect in the connect JS, I'll refactor the code and I'll set it up as a function. And instead we will invoke it in the app JS. And in order to do that, we'll just remove this dot then and catch. Now options, of course, stay. We're not doing anything with that. And here let's create a function. We'll say connect and DB and that is equal to our function. So essentially we're setting up the arrow function and eventually we'll set up the env variable and effectively we'll pass it from the app js and therefore i'll add the parameter here the url for the time being we won't use it we'll do the same thing what we did before where we just pass in the connection string that's coming up in next video and then i want to grab this mongoose connect cut it out and then from this connect db i just want to return that result so effectively what we're returning, we're returning a promise, correct? And then all the way in the bottom, we're going to go with module and export. So now, of course, we want to export it. And what we want to export, of course, connect and DB. So once we have this set up, then we'll just have server is listening on port 3000, because now, of course, we want to assign it to some kind of variable. And again, the order is really up to you but I'm just going to put it below the tasks. So I'll just move it over here below the tasks. And I'll say that that is equal to connect DB. So effectively, I'm just getting that function over here and I'll set it equal to the required one. And then once I have access to the function, then all the way in the bottom, I want to set up one more function by the name of start. And in this function, we will invoke connect DB. And then only if we're successful, then we'll spin up the server. So let's go somewhere here in the bottom and we'll say const start again. We'll use the arrow function. And since I know that my connect DB returns a promise, correct? I can set this function as a sync. And that way, of course, we can use the await keyword. 
And every time we have a synchronous operation, it's very useful to set it in the try catch block. So that way, if there is an error, we can handle it as well. And in the try block, we'll pass in await. So since I know that it returns a promise, I'll use my await keyword. Then I'm going to go with connect DB again, eventually we'll pass in the string coming from the env file. For time being, we just have hard coded in the connect JS. And then only if we're successful, then we'll spin up the server. So I'll move this line of code right below the connect DB. And again, we'll just spin up the server if the connection is successful. If not, we're going to go with console log and then we'll just look for the error. So once we save, nothing happens. We don't spin up the server because, of course, now we have a function. So all the way in the bottom, I'm just going to go with start. And then you'll notice that there's a console log for the server. Now, of course, we don't have the console log for the connection because we removed that in ConnectJS. But if you really want to test it out, again, go back over here and just mess with your password. And you'll right away see that we'll get that error in a console. And in here it says bad auth, authentication fail. So we know that our setup works. So if, of course, we will have a wrong password, then we won't be successful. However, if everything goes smoothly, then we should see that our server is listening on port 3000. Not bad, not bad. We have set up the connection. We have refactored the code. And we're almost, almost, almost ready to start tinkering with the data. But there's one last thing that I want to do first. And that is simply setting up the .env file. Now, why we would want to do that? Well, let's think about it. Eventually, we might push this up to the GitHub, correct? And what do you think is going to happen the moment I push this up to the GitHub? Of course, everyone who takes a look at my repo can nicely grab the string and then tamper with my data. And how we can avoid that? Well, the solution is to set up .env file where we can keep our secrets. And then in our application, we'll have to use a package by the name of .env. And of course, I already installed it for you. And then we'll be able to access those secret variables anywhere in our application. And once we push this up to the GitHub, if we add git ignore, so dot git ignore file, and then in here we specifically say which files we want to ignore and make sure that you add dot env. Now I also added node modules because that is a common practice since that folder is so big. But as far as keeping secret secrets, make sure that not only you set up dot env, and of course, use the package because otherwise you won't be able to access the variables. But always, always, always the moment you set up dot env, also set up dot git ignore. And that way, we'll just push this up to the GitHub and then dot env will be ignored. So when people come and see your repo, they won't see this secret connection string. So let's start here by creating dot env. And in my case, I'm going to do that in the root. So I also suggest you do the same. So I'm going to go to the starter. I'm looking for a new file and I'm going to go with dot and then env. And in here we have again key value pairs. However, we don't need to use the quotation marks. And I think I'm going to go with Mongo and then URI in this case. So I'm not going to go with long name, the connection string. And then you simply want to take this value. So I'll cut it out from the connect JS. Go back to dot env, set it equal to my Mongo URI, and then where I have connect JS, I can simply remove it. And then remember, when we were setting up the function, I said that I'm going to be looking for the parameter, but of course, initially we were not using it. Now, of course, I want to use it. So I'll remove the hard coded connection string and I'll say URL and I'll just save. Now, there's going to be an error. Don't worry, because of course, we're not passing that connection string. Notice over here, we have the parameter, blah, 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 is undefined. Okay, that was expected. Now what we want to do is go to the app JS, since over here, we invoke start. 
and then we want to pass in that value from the dot env into the connect db and in order for us to access those secret variables we simply need to require that package so i'm going to go below connect db and we'll just say require and notice how we don't have to assign it to any kind of variable we just go with dot env and that's the package name and as a side note if you want to install you just go with npm install and then the package name dot env pretty self-explanatory and then you want to use process dot env and then whatever is the variable name so let me save my dot env and then back in the app.js once we require we just want to go with dot and config so essentially we just want to invoke the config so now if we keep on scrolling where we have the connect db we want to go with process dot env and remember that was one of those global variables we go with dot env and then we go with mongo or whatever the name for your variable is in my case that is mongo uri and we'll save it and of course we're back in business because i have server is listening on port 3000 again very very important if you want to keep your secret variables actually secret set up the dot env get the package and you'll be able to access them anywhere in your application by using process.env and then whatever is the name of the variable beautiful and once our connection string is a env variable now let's set up the structure for our future documents and assign them to the collection and we're going to do that using schema and model from the mongoose and the way it's going to look like we're going to go to our starter and we'll create yet another folder and in this case we'll call this models and then inside of the models we'll create a new file and we'll call this task.js so i'm going to go here with task.js and then the setup is going to be following where again we import mongoose and we set it equal to require and then mongoose of course and then we're looking for mongoose.schema so we set up a new variable and i'll call this task schema schema and that is equal to new so we're using the constructor and we go with new mongoose and schema and you're probably wondering okay what on earth is happening well if you remember when we were setting up the atlas manually one of the first things that i mentioned is the fact that for our document there is no set structure but that's exactly what i want where for my tasks i only want the name which is going to be a string and a completed property which is going to be a boolean because you would have to agree that it's not going to make much sense if somewhere in my tasks i'll have an array with the color values correct so therefore we go here we go with mongo schema and using schema we'll set up the structure for all the documents that eventually we'll have in our collection and the syntax is following where again we use key value pairs and eventually we'll set them equal to an object and we'll pass in more options but since i just want to get something quickly in our database we'll just start quick and dirty where essentially i want to come up with a key in my case again that is going to be name and completed so those are going to be the two keys and i'll just set up the types so that is a bare minimum where you go with the key name and then the actual schema type so what type of data this is going to be and if you're interested on what options we have just navigate to mongoose official docs and then look for schema types keep on scrolling and then of course you can see string number and yada 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 so i'm going to navigate back and i'll say name so that's going to be my first key and i'll just set it equal to string then comma and of course i'm looking for completed completed that is going to be my second key and that will be set equal to boolean again bare bones setup will do more complicated a little bit later and then once we have the schema so essentially once we have the structure for the data now we want to set up that model and think of model as a representation for the collection 
So these guys I was sticking in a product. So now, of course, we'll create tasks collection and then all the tasks that we're about to push into our database, of course, will be added to that specific collection. And what's even more cool in Mongoose, a model is a wrapper for the schema. So if the schema defines the structure for the document, like the type, validations, and etc., a Mongoose model provides an interface to the database. So using the model, we'll be able to create, update, query, and delete our documents with great ease, since the API is extremely, extremely straightforward. And you'll see what I mean in the upcoming videos. And we do that by creating a model and we right away export. So I'll go with module dot exports, and that is equal to mongoose, then model. And then model is looking for two things. It is looking for the name, and then we want to pass in the schema. So in here, I'm going to go with task and then comma. And of course, this is the schema that I want to pass in. So I'll say here, task schema. And once we're done with this, the only thing we need to do is go to our controllers and start using our model. Beautiful. We have set up our first schema as well as the model. And of course, we want to start using it. And yes, we will use it in controllers. Therefore, we'll navigate there. And I'm going to be looking for my model. And I'll assign it to the task variable. I'll say require. I'm looking in the models folder. And then more specifically, task. And then before we continue, let me just give you a brief overview of what we're about to do. So if we navigate back to Mongoose Docs, and more specifically, if you're looking for the models, we can find here more info. You can see that models are fancy constructors compiled from Skeevan definitions. An instance of a model is called a document. And then they give you this example, pretty much everything that we did in the last video, apart from the fact that, of course, they have different values. And here we have nice explanation that the first argument is singular name of the collection your model is for, since Mongoose automatically looks for the plural, lowercase version of your model name. So effectively, eventually, we'll have the tasks. Then I mentioned one more time that the instance of the model is called document. And there are a few ways how we can create one. We can go this route, or we can use dot create. And in here, they showcase the callback function approach, but we can also use await. And essentially what create is looking for, well, it's looking for the object with those properties. So in our case, we have name as well as the completed, correct? And of course, we can pass this manually, but wouldn't it make more sense if we just go to create task route? And since we know that in there, we can access the task data in the request.body, why don't we just pipe it through and pass it along to our model create method? And it's going to work something like this, where I'll grab the body. Of course, it's going to be coming from my postman here, shake and bake, and the value will be true. And then instead of sending it back, we'll pass it into task.create. Now, since I'm going to be using a wait on a task.create, of course, I want to refactor this. And I'll say that this function, the create task, actually is going to be async. So my controller will be async. And then inside of the function body, I'm going to go with task and I'll set it equal to await. Like I said, I'm not going to use the callback function approach. I'll use await instead. And we'll await for task dot create. And like I said, if you want, you can hard code this here. You can say name and then first task. And of course, we can do the same thing for completed. But I already covered why it's going to make way more sense if we just take this rec dot body. So whatever we're getting from the postman, and then let's just pass that object into task dot create. And let's see what happens. So I'll remove it here. And I'll just say rec dot body over here. And as far as the response, well, now I'm just waiting for that task. So instead of rec dot body in the response, I'll place my task. And I also want to add the status. 
And if you remember, the correct status was 201. Effectively, that is if you have a successful post request. And then instead of JSON being equal to reg.body, we'll pass in the object. And in here, we'll pass in our task. And then once we save, again, nothing happens because we haven't triggered the post request. But if we go back to the postman, and if I click here, send, what I should see is this. I should see the task. So that's my object. And now check it out. We have this underscore ID. And what that means, well, that means that we created a new document with the following properties. We have name, we have completed. We, of course, have the ID, like I just mentioned. And we also have this underscore underscore V. So, of course, these two are created by default every time we create the document. And then these ones we provide. So if you want to keep on testing, we're going to go with second task. And we'll set maybe the completed to false. Again, this is all quick and dirty, just because I want to have some data in my database, there will be still some modifications to the code. But if we can see these successful responses, where we have tasks with underscore ID, what that also means, my friends, is that when we go to our database, and if I refresh, check it out. Now, of course, I have the task manager, like I said, that's my database. And what do you know? Of course, I have the tasks collection. Now, what do I have in task collection? I have documents. What documents? Shake and bake and second task. And if you have the same result, congrats, we're off to the great start. Nice. At this point, we can successfully create new tasks and persist them in our cloud database. So now it's really just about applying the same concepts to the rest of our routes. But before we set up the rest of the four controllers in a similar fashion, there are a few important things that I want to cover first. For starters, I just want to showcase that since we set up our schema, only the properties that we specified in our schema will be passed on to the database. And everything else is going to be ignored. Don't believe me? Let's try it out. First, I just want to showcase that in our schema, we specified two properties, name and completed. So now if I go back to the postman, and I'll just set up testing schema, that's going to be my name, testing schema, I'll leave completed as false. But if I try to add some properties that are not on my schema. Effectively, they will be just ignored. So in my guess, I'm just going to say random is equal to random. Now I do still need to use the proper JSON syntax. And then I'll just add the amount and I'll set it equal to five. Now you can add 10,000 properties. And again, the result is going to be exactly the same. So I'll just leave these two and we'll try to send it. So here I send and then check it out. Now what I get back is only the name and only the completed. Again, let me repeat, only the properties that you set in your schema will be passed on to the database. Everything else will be ignored, which of course is really, really cool. Because that way, we can avoid this mess. Where if you remember back in the store, when I was setting up the products, one has name, the other one has the colors, because there is no structure for these documents. When we use schema, there is a structure. So whatever we set up in the schema is going to be passed on to the database. And whatever comes as an extra is just going to be ignored. All right. And once we've got that out of the way, next, I want to talk about validation. You see, even though we only accept the properties that are specified in the schema, our current setup has one big doozy. There is no validation. So essentially, we can pass in empty values. How is that going to look like? Well, again, we can go back to the postman. And in the first example, I'll just remove completed. And I'll pass in the name as an empty string. Now I do need to fix this comma here. But you'll see that actually we're successful. So I can create item this way. And what's even more interesting 
is that I can send an empty object and I'll still be successful. And you have to agree that actually this is not the best setup, correct? So that way we can just set up a bunch of empty items. Now, what can we do about it? Well, we can add the validation to our schema. Now, before we continue, though, let me just say that when it comes to validation, since it's a pretty big topic, we'll just be scratching the surface. The plan is to show you more features as we progress with the upcoming projects, since I have a feeling that if we'll spend the next hour or two on just validation, understandably, a lot of you will lose interest and attention. Don't worry, though, At the end of the video, I will show you where you can get more info. So at the moment, we have a very minimal setup where we have properties and we just specify the type. However, we can set up our properties as objects, and then we can also set up built in validators. How is that going to look like? Well, I'll remove the string part from the name and then I'll set it equal to an object. I'll add a comma, of course, since I need to keep the proper syntax. And in here, the first property we want to set up is type. Now it's still going to be a string, but now, of course, we can add more validators. Now, what validators can we use? For starters, we can go with required. So what this is going to do is if I pass in the value, the object without my name property, then it's going to spit back big fat error. Now, at the very basic level, you can set up equal to true or false. Either it is required or not. But if you want a custom message, you can actually set it equal to an array where you go with the first value again, true or false. And then you add a comma and then you pass in that custom message. And in my case, I'm going to go with must provide a name. Now, what else I can do? Well, I can trim. So imagine the scenario in a postman. If I go here with name and if I pass in here spaces and then John effectively with our current setup, that's exactly how we'll save it in our database. And if I don't want that, I can simply go back where we have the object. And then the property that you're looking for is trim and we'll set it equal to true. And what's also really nifty that for strings, we can get min values or max values. And in my case, since I don't want my value to be bigger than 20 characters for the name one, I can go with max. And the property that we're looking for is length. Make sure that you spelled correctly. This is always a doozy for me when it comes to length. And again, we'll set it equal to an array. And I'll say that the value for my string is going to be 20. And then in here, we'll just go with name. Cannot be more than. And of course, we'll set it equal to 20 and then characters. And essentially, we're done with basic validators for the name, because like I already mentioned, I really just want to scratch the surface. So you get the main idea. And then as we're progressing with the project, then of course, we'll implement more features. And I want to do the same thing for completed, where I'm not going to go with required. Hopefully this is clear. And you'll see in a second what kind of error we have if we don't pass the name. But for the completed, I just want to show you that we can also set some default values. And again, we want to remove this Boolean and we're going to go with type. We'll set it equal to Boolean. And then as far as the default value, the property is simply default. And as far as default in this case for the task property completed, I think it's going to make most sense if we'll set it equal to false. Again, just to showcase how is that going to look like in a real project. So as I'm adding the task, new task, by default, it's not going to be completed. And only when we navigate to a specific task page, and I say, yep, it's completed. Now we can add it. And then, of course, we can navigate back to all the tasks. This was just my setup. Of course, there's a million different ways how you can do that. But that's why in here, when I'm setting up my validators, I set my completed one to be equal to false. So now, of course, we can save it and we can test it out. So I'm going to navigate back to my setup here in a postman. And as you can see, completed is still not required. And that is done on purpose. So essentially, I already set this up as default false. So I don't want to set it up as required. 
Therefore, we don't need to pass it here, but I just want to see how it nicely is going to trim and how we also will get errors if we don't pass in any values. So in here, let me just try with the John and notice once we send, we actually get trimmed value back and completed is set to false right away. Okay, that's an awesome start. But notice what happens if we send an empty string. So let me remove all the values. Let me click on send and now check it out. So we have here this sending request. And the reason why we're not getting anything back because we have big fat error in our console. We have validation error. And there's a few things that we need to understand about this error. First, it is caused in a task schema because we finally set up the val there and we set it equal to true. And of course, we're sending empty string. So that's the same thing as if I were to send completely empty object over here. So if I cancel it and if I send it again, notice again, we're not getting the response. That's point number one. Number two, if you take a look at the console, you see that we have this unhandled promise rejection and this error is originated, blah, 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 blah. And long story short, it is caused in our create task because we have a wait keyword. However, we're not handling this gracefully. We don't have the try catch block where we set up the await in the try. And if there is an error, then of course we do something about it. And since this video is already getting quite long, I'll actually do that in the next one. So just put this one on ice and then in next video, we'll set up a proper response. And just to recap, as far as basic validation, we just need to set our property equal to an object. Then we need to set up still the type. And in our case, that was the string. And then we can go with the required. If we want to have a custom message, then we just set it equal to an array. And the first item is going to be the value, whether that's true or false for required. And then the second one will be the custom message. Then for the string, we can also use trim. And that's just going to make sure that we don't have any white space. And you can probably already guess that there's one for the min length as well. And in a completed one, we covered how we can add a default value as well. So for this one, we set it equal to false. And if one of our validations is going to fail, then of course, we won't be successful of adding that item. And like promised, if you want to learn more about validation, just head on over to Mongoose Docs. So navigate here, and then you're looking for the validation. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of info here. So if your idea of good time is scouring through the docs, you won't be disappointed. Not bad, not bad. I think we have good general understanding of the basic validation in Mongoose. So now let's switch gears and talk about how we can handle it more gracefully. Because at the moment, well, we're just leaving our user hanging, correct? So if the user sends some kind of request with incorrect data, then of course, we have the error here on the server. But as you can see, the user is just hanging. And probably it's not the best approach. And again, the whole reason for that is because we have a synchronous operation. However, we're not handling if there is an error. And the fix is following where we want to go with try catch. And then we want to place our await in the try block. And I'll also right away set up my response. So if we are successful, I still want to send back the response with our task document, the one that we're getting back from the model. And then the second thing, if there is an error, what do we do? Well, we could also send back the response. And in this case, the status is going to be 500. And effectively, that is just a general server error. And as I said, I'm purposely using just a general server error status code, the 500 one, since we'll discuss errors in greater detail later in the project. And then we can go with a JSON and I'll set up the message property and I'll set it equal to my error. So now if we save and if I go back and if I send one more time, you'll notice that instead of hanging, 
we actually get a response. And in here, I can see that the status is 500. So it's definitely our response. And at this point in time, you probably have two questions. First, do we really need to wrap all our logic in every controller in try and catch? Since I can give you a hint that in the remaining controllers, we'll also use the functions and we'll stick a weight in front of them. And the short answer is yes, for the time being, we'll have to do that. But then eventually, by the end of the project, I'll show you multiple ways how we can simplify that and how we can omit this boilerplate code for try and catch. Then your next question probably is, okay, we get the response, but this error seems a bit lengthy. Can we make it shorter? And my answer again is yes, we can. And the most basic approach is going to look something like this. Instead of setting message property equal to an error parameter, just simply set it equal to generic there was an error string value. As far as more complex setup, I'll discuss it at the end of the project since I want to keep moving along with the rest of the functionality. As far as my setup, I will keep sending this giant object since that way I can show exact error messages we're getting. And as far as our API, I think we're actually in pretty good shape where we can create a task. We do have some basic validations. And if there is any kind of error, well, we simply send back 500 that there is a server error and we send back error message. Yes, quite a long one, but at least it's better than leaving the user hanging. And if we want to try out the max length can simply go here with name and then I'll just add some gibberish just so it's more than 20 characters. So let me tap it out here. And then once I save again, we get the error message where we have name cannot be more than 20 characters. So that should do it for this video. And now we're ready to move on to our next topic. And once we're done discussing the validation, as well as the need for try and catch, since we have a synchronous operation, why don't we continue with our controllers? And up next, I want to work on get all tasks. So we know already how we can create a task. We know that we have a model in the model we pass in the schema. And then in order to get the instance, we go with the name of the model. And of course, the method name is dot create. Now, what about the rest of the CRUD operations? And again, we'll use our best helper, the mongoose docs. And if we navigate there, and then if we look for queries, then we can have this nice text where it says mongoose models provide several static helper functions for, and this should be already familiar, CRUD, CRUD operations. And each of these functions returns a mongoose query object. Now, we'll work with query object way more in the next project. But for the time being, we just need to understand that on every model, we have these methods that we can use, starting with delete many, all the way to update one. And the one that we want to use right now is this one, the find one. And I'll just open this up in a separate tab. And then we can see that as far as the parameter, we want to pass in the filter object. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if I leave this filter object empty, this is just going to get me all the documents. So in our case, this is just going to get us all the tasks. Now, if we start supplying the values, for example, in our case, we could say complete it equal to true. Of course, that is going to get us what? That is going to get us only the documents that are completed. Again, the way I've set up the projects of the next project, the second project is the one where we'll take a deep dive into the filtering, sorting, and all that. For the time being, we just need to understand that if we want to get all the documents, which is going to be in our case for the get all tasks controller, we simply need to use find. Now, what's also really interesting is the fact that if we go back and if we keep on scrolling, we can read that a query also has dot then function and thus can be used a promise. Now, there is a caveat where technically it's not returning a promise. That's why I say here used as a promise. And essentially what that means for us is that, yes, we can use await. 
So for simplicity, we can stick a weight in front of it and we'll be in good shape. However, if you keep on scrolling, you'll read that queries are not promises and there are situations where it's really important. But if we keep on reading here, they have that then function for a sync await as a convenience. So long story short, similarly to how we created the task with await and we set up try and catch block, we'll do it here as well. And the way we'll do that, we'll go with try catch. So in here, of course, there's going to be an error. But if we're successful, then of course, we'll just send back all the tasks. So let's start here with const and I'll set it equal to the tasks and the value will be equal to await. So we'll use await keyword. Therefore, in front of the function, I want to set up my sync and then I want to go with task. So that's going to be the name of the model and then the static function name is fine. And since I want to get all the documents in the task collection, therefore, I'll just stick here a empty object. And then as far as the error, well, in order to speed this up, I'll just copy the error from the create task and pass it here as well. And now the only thing is missing is our response if we're successful. What do we want to do? Well, we want to go with res dot and then we're looking for the status. In this case, the status is going to be 200 and then JSON. And in here, I'll just say tasks. So I'll be sending back the object. And then inside of that object, there's a property by the name of tasks. And as far as the value, it's going to be equal to whatever I'm getting back from the find. And I'm just using the S6 shorthand where if the property name is exactly the same as the variable for the value, well, we can omit the second part. And effectively, it's the same as if I were to write like this. So we have tasks equal to tasks. And then with ES6, we can just shorten this up. And once we save, and if we go back to the postman, and you know what? Let me fix this one. I'll say here properly, I'll say testing, testing task, because I want to save that create one. So I'll save it here. So it stays as our request and I'll close it. And then if we go to all the tasks and we simply hit send, now what we should see is of course our object and check it out. Now we have all the tasks. So we have our array and then inside of that array, we have items. Of course, each item is represented as an object. So successfully, we have set up the second route as well for all the tasks. And here we use the find static function and we pass in the empty object, which just gets us all the documents in the collection. And in our case, of course, those are our tasks. And then if we're successful, if there was no error, we just go with res.status. So we set up the status for a response and we send back a JSON and I just jam all my tasks inside of the object and set it equal to the tasks property. Awesome. And once we have set up the controllers for create task and get all tasks, next, I want to work on get task. And effectively in our application, that route provides info about specific tasks. So in here, I can see all the tasks. I can create one, of course. But if I want to edit it, I'm going to click on edit button and then notice how I'm getting the info about this specific task. Now, of course, normally you wouldn't share the ID, but in this case, I just wanted to provide more info. So not just the name, but also an ID. So that way you can clearly see that this info is just about this task. And similarly, I can go to the next one and again, I'll get the ID, I'll get the name and whether it's completed or not. Now, in this video, of course, we won't set up the edit, but at least we'll get that specific info. And in general, the setup is going to be pretty similar to the one we have with get all tasks. However, we'll also have to implement a specific response if the ID that we pass in doesn't match any of the tasks that we currently have. And in order to get up and running, we'll navigate back to the docs, to the mongoose docs. And in this case, we're looking for the find one static helper function, just like we used find. In this case, we're looking for find one. 
open up a new browser window and then notice as far as the parameters we go with conditions so we pass in conditions object and they're very helpful here where they say find one adventure whose country is croatia otherwise no so essentially we use await just for convenience we have our model then we have find one and then we pass in the object and in that object we set up what well we set up the condition and in this case they look for the country in our case of course we will look for a task and we'll use the id so i'll say get me the task whose id is equal to whatever i'm getting from the params otherwise we'll get back now so let's now get back i'm looking for get task and remember in here of course i'm getting that params id and before we type anything here in the controller i just want to set it correctly my id because of course initially well i was just passing here to peter but of course that's not the case anymore and since i want to use the id that i'm getting back from the mongo i'm going to go to all the tasks i'll run it of course i get my list awesome and then pick any of the tasks doesn't really matter which one just look for the id copy this one and then go back to the single task and then of course instead of peter pass in the id and send and if you get back the id key with this value with that long string value which is an id then of course we're in good shape and i'm doing this just so we don't have to console log here on the server you can definitely do so but i just think that it's more convenient for us to see those logs here in a postman and then once we have everything in a place i want to go with my get task and in here what's the logic well we could start by setting up i think of course because we'll use the await then we'll go with our try catch block and then i'll move this sucker up and then first we just want to get that id out of the params so of course you can write it the long way but i always like to do the destructuring first so we'll go here with const id and then i always prefer giving it somewhat useful alias otherwise you just end up with a bunch of ids and then once in a while it's just confusing which id is for what so i'll say grab me the id which is coming from the params but use the alias of task id from now on and then i set it equal of course to rec dot params so it's the same object that i'm getting and then of course we want to use that find one correct so we're going to go with const this is going to be our document that we're getting back if we're successful and we'll go with await and then task and then find find one and then like i said we pass in the object and in this case i'm going to be looking for underscore id so not the name but underscore id which matches to that in the params so i'll use here task and then id and if i'm successful beautiful we'll send back the task if not then we'll have to send back the 404 response so in here we'll go with res dot and we're looking for status so I'll say that everything is correct we were successful and therefore we'll go with res dot status 200 then dot json and then i just want to pass in a task i'll say yep that's the task you're looking for now there also might be a case where there's something wrong with an id where essentially yes we're getting the value from the params but it doesn't match any of the tasks and if you remember the documentation then we get null so what is the case then well then i want to check if the task actually is null and then of course i want to send back different response now make sure make sure make sure that you always 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 set up here return otherwise what's going to happen well, JavaScript is going to be reading the code. And if you don't have the return, even though there might be no task, well, you'll send one response and then you'll send the next one right after that. So always, always make sure that you have return. So that way JavaScript knows, okay, so now I just need to return from the function. And in here we go with res.status. Now in this case though, of course, task that we're looking for doesn't exist. And the status code for that is 404. And then again, we go with JSON here and we'll pass in the message in the object and the message will be following. We'll say no task with ID and then colon 
and then we'll just look for task and then ID. And eventually, of course, we also might have the error. And I'll talk about these two errors in the next video, because that's going to be a common theme that will set up for the upcoming routes. And I kind of want to give it a separate video. So in here, let's just scroll up. And let's just look for that generic one, the res.status500. And then we'll just pass in the error. Copy this one. And then scroll down. And below where we have the catch, of course, pass it in. So if I go back right now to my postman, and if I click on send, I should get shake and bake, because of course, that is the ID. Now, if you don't believe me, we can go back to all the tasks. Let's keep on scrolling. And then I think I'm going to be looking for this testing schema because some of them are actually empty. When we were testing out, that's when we were sending them up. So now grab this ID instead, go back to single task, and then copy and paste. And of course, now the value is going to be testing schema. And like I mentioned previously, I'll talk about errors, why we have two of them, essentially why we have two responses for the errors in the next video. But that's how we can set up a route to get a single item. So we go again with try catch, we set up async, and then we use the static function, find one. And then of course, in this case, we're looking for the ID that has the value the same as in our params. If we can find one, awesome. We send back that specific task. If not, then we send back 404. And then all the way in a catch block, we have our generic error. Okay, so why do we have these two responses? Well, we have 404 with no task with this ID, and then we still have the generic one. Well, it's simply because we can have two types of errors. And in order to show you that, we just need to navigate back to the postman. And then notice where we have the params, where I set up this long ID. Why don't we try changing the last value? So instead of B that I have here, I'm going to go with zero. And once we send, well, we should get the message, no task with blah, blah, blah ID. Why? Well, because of course, in our database, we don't have any item whose ID is matching. And I can clearly see the 404. That means, of course, that that is our response. But if we change this around, and then instead of keeping the same amount of characters, we start removing or adding, you'll see this error. And the name of this error is cast error. So effectively, what's happening, if we have the correct syntax for the ID, but we cannot find the item, then of course, we'll have to deal with it ourselves, because essentially, there is no task with this ID. But if the ID is actually going to have the wrong syntax, meaning it's not going to match the amount of characters that mongoose is looking for, then of course, we'll get the error from the mongoose. And like I already mentioned, this is going to be somewhat common setup for us for the upcoming controllers as well. Because for both of them, for update task, as well as delete task, at the end of the day, we'll still have to find that one specific item. And if we're not successful, then we'll send back the 404. But we'll always have this generic one as well, just in case the actual syntax for the ID is totally off. Awesome. I think we're moving in nice pace. And up next, I'll actually work on the lead task. Why? Well, because with update task, it's a bit more complicated. And I kind of want to leave it as the last one, because I promised you that I'll show you the differences between put and patch as well. So therefore, let's work on delete. Now, most of the stuff is going to be exactly the same. So once you're comfortable with delete, I think you'll have no problem setting up update task as well. And just to showcase in our application, if we go back to all the tasks, if you click on removing the task, there you go. And of course, we just remove the task. And the setup is going to be very, very similar to getting the task. Of course, the biggest difference is going to be the method or the function that we're going to use. And in this case, we're looking for find one and delete. But everything else pretty much is going to be the same. So if you want, you can just copy and paste and change the values. But in my case, 
since it's going to be a bit more productive, why don't we type it out together? So I'll go with my async. We go with try catch block. Now I have simple res.send, so I'll just remove it all together. Then we want to look for that ID in the params because again, setup isn't going to be exactly the same where we pass in the ID with our params and we'll call this task ID. And that one is equal to rec dot params. Then once we have access to the params, we just want to go with const task is equal to await again task and then find one and remove or I'm sorry, delete. So find one and delete. And in here we want to pass in the ID again. So underscore ID and that one is equal to our task and then ID. And then once we have the setup, of course, then we have two options. If such task exists, then we send back our 200. If the task doesn't exist, so essentially, if this is equal to null, then of course, we go with our 404. And in this case, I will speed this up a little bit where I'll grab the if condition, like so. And then as far as the response, initially, I'm going to go with a JSON object, and I'll set task equal to task. But at the very end of the video, I'll discuss multiple options that we have. So this is the 404. If we're not successful, again, if that item doesn't exist with that particular ID, if we are successful, we go with res dot and then status, and we pass in 200. And then we just go with JSON. And then we pass in the task. So essentially, that way in the postman, we'll be able to see which task we removed. And then just like the previous controllers, we'll grab our generic one as well, and set it up in the catch one. So if there is an error, there's going to be a message property with that particular error. So we navigate back to the postman. And we're looking for delete task. Again, we have this dummy value. In my case, that is Peter, but in your case, it might be something else. So again, we need to go to get all tasks run it. So now, of course, we can see all our tasks and then just pick whichever you want to remove. And you know what? In my case, I'm going to go for those empty ones first because I don't want them in my database anyway. So I'll go over here, I'll grab the ID, and then I'm looking for delete task, copy and paste. And then once I save, check it out. Now, of course, I can see that I removed this task. And I'll remove another dummy one as well. So let me run it one more time. Now I can clearly see that I have only one without a name since I removed the previous one. So let me just grab it over here and then back to delete task, copy and paste, and then send. And of course, I can clearly see that I removed this one as well. And just to showcase again why we have those two errors, let's go back to all the tasks. Let's send and I'll grab the first one for shake and bake. And what you'll notice is that if I pass in the ID and if I just change the last value, so I still keep the same structure, then of course we'll get our 404. So no task with ID. And of course, I have 404. Now, if I'll start adding or removing the items. And of course, what you'll see is this error. So of course, this is coming from our catch block. Hopefully that makes sense. And then lastly, I just want to mention that as far as this response, I purposely set it up here as a task, just so we can see in the postman, because I think it's a bit useful when we are setting up our first API. But by any means, you're not limited to sending this type of response. Why? Well, because usually when it comes to deleting a task, you're really not looking for the data here. Take a look at our front end. It really doesn't care what task we're actually removing. Because the way the functionality works is I click on a button, then I'm looking for the response. And if the server sends back this 200, then right away on my front end, I go like, okay, awesome. I was successful. So let me fetch the entire list one more time. So it's not like I take that item and then I do something about it. No, I just say, I want to remove the item. If I'm successful, awesome. I'll do one thing. If I'm not successful, then of course, I want to display some error message or something along those lines. Therefore, 
if you go back and if you change this around to, for example, and I'll just show you some common ones that you might see in the other APIs. So let me comment this one out. I'll copy and paste. And then as long as you go with 200, you can simply even go like this. You can say send. That's it. That's all you have to do. And the functionality will still work. Or you might see something like this where again, copy and paste. And then if we go with JSON and some people just go with task and then set it equal to null. And you might add a status property here with success. And as you can see, sky is the limit. I'm just showing you what type of responses you might get back. Because again, the main idea is that if you're successful, if you're getting D200 already on a front end, you know what's happening. So most likely you're not going to be looking for that one specific item that you're deleting. But again, in my case, I just set up this task so we can nicely see in a postman what we're removing. So I'll remove these two lines of code here. And then I'll just set it back to my JSON where I have task is equal to task. And as a quick sign out, once we're done setting up the update task route, I'll spend an entire video on various options that you have for your responses. So just put the pin on that and we'll come back to it a bit later. All right, and we have successfully arrived at our last controller, the update task one. And if we are comfortable with getting the single task and setting up the delete task, we should be in good shape because yes, there's gonna be a bit more functionality because in this case, not only are we looking for the ID, but we'll also need the body, since of course, we'll be updating something, correct? And then the second thing, we have to pass in some options, since by default, we won't get right away the validators working, and also we won't get the item that we just updated. And don't worry, of course, I'll talk about all of that in detail. So for now, just to stay consistent, I'll move this sucker down. I'll move it below the delete task. And let's just start simply by accessing both of the things. Let's get the params one and then the body one. So we just want to see that we are successful on acquiring both of those things. So I'll set this up as a sync. It's just a simple send. So I'll just remove it. And we're going to go with try catch. And for now, let's just go with res dot and then status. We'll set it equal to 200 and then the JSON one. And here I want to grab two things. I want to grab my ID, just double check that I'm getting it properly from the params and also the body. So for now, above the res.status, let's set up the ID one more time. We'll say ID. So we're destructuring from the rec.params, rec.params. And second one is going to be rec.body. And if you want, you can assign it to a data or whatever. But in my case, I'm just going to set up the property here and set it equal to directly. So let's just say ID is equal to a task ID. And then data is going to be equal to rec dot body. Again, why are we going to be passing data? Well, because if we're updating something, of course, you need that new info, correct? So if I go back to my application, and if I say that, Instead of walking the dog, I want to walk the cat. Of course, I need to supply this name. Otherwise, it's not going to make any sense. The same goes for completed. I need to pass in that key with a new value. And in this case, of course, it's going to be false. So once I click edit, notice I'm successful. Awesome. So if I go back to all the tasks, now I have walk the cat. And in order to test this out, again, we need to go back to the postman. We're looking for getting all the tasks since. I want those correct IDs and you can pick any of them. doesn't really matter. I think I like the shake and bake the most. So take this one. Then we need to go to patch the update task one, copy and paste. And then in response, we should see the ID, correct? We're not going to see the data since we haven't set up anything here in our body, at least not right now, but we'll do it in a second. But of course, now we're just getting update task. So let's see, let me go back here, update task. Probably I didn't save the file. My apologies, let me run one more time. 
And now I should see the ID that matches, of course, my shake and bake. But as far as data, there's nothing there. Why? Well, because I haven't sent anything from my front end, right? So now let's go to the raw and then we'll set it equal to the JSON. And then we set up our object. And remember, we're looking for the name. And I'll just say testing, edit func, so functionality, I guess. And then we're going to be looking for completed. And we'll set it equal to, let's just double check in here. It's true. So let's go with false. And let's set it here. Of course, now, not only I'm getting the ID, just coming from the params, but I also have the data property. And in there, of course, I can clearly see those values. Again, the whole deal why I'm doing this is just so we don't have to console log on the server. And once we have all of this in place, now let's roll up our sleeves and actually set up our functionality. So I'll remove this one. We don't care about this one right now. And again, we want to go with the task, meaning I'll sign up a variable with the name of task. And I'll set it equal to await. And of course, now we're looking for task, the model name, and then find one. And if this one was find one and delete, what do you think is going to be this one? Well, it is find one and update. And in here, we need to pass in a few things. First, we need to pass in the object where, again, we set up our condition. So in this case, again, I'm going to go with ID matches to that one in the params. So underscore ID equal to task ID. That's step number one. Then, of course, we need to pass in that new data since we're updating something, correct? So let's go here with comma, and that's going to be the second value. So essentially, you need to set up the object and set up which properties you're updating. But remember, we are already getting that as far as reg.body. So reg.body is right away this object. So I can simply set up my next parameter like so where I go with reg.body. And then we have options object. But I first want to show you what happens if we don't use it. And then we'll add both of the values in there as well. So let's start here again by checking the task because again, we might have a situation where there is no task with that specific ID. And again, just to speed this up, I'll copy and paste. And then if we are successful, then of course, I want to send back the task. I'll say task is equal to task. And don't forget the generic error where we go with the rest dot status. And then you already know the rest. Copy and paste. And you'll notice something interesting since we don't have the options. You'll notice the following thing where I go with testing edit function. Okay, that's awesome. I completed false. But essentially, what we're going to get back is the original value. So remember the shake and bake? Effectively, this is what we'll get back. So once I send, notice, yeah, I get 200. So I was successful. But notice the value here. It's shake and bake. And what's more interesting, that once I click on getting all the tasks, it's actually changed. So I was successful. So here's the gotcha. The reason why is that happening is because we're not passing in the options. And as far as the options, we want to do two things. We want to get the new one back because by default, we're getting the old one. That's why we were successful. But in our update response, we got the old value. And the second thing what you'll notice is the fact that we're not running the validators. So if you remember when we were setting up the model, one of the things that I set up for the name was required equal to true. Now, if I try to update item with name equal to an empty string, I'm actually going to be successful. Now, again, we're getting back the old value. And in order to check the new one, we just need to run get all tasks. Notice. And I promise you, I'll say this for the last time in this video. The reason for that is because we don't have the options object. And in order to set it up, we just need to go back to all the controllers. And like I said, third parameter is going to be our options. And then we simply go with new true. So this will always, always, always return that new item, the one that is already updated. And then the another property we can run is run validators, and we'll set it equal to true. So once we do that, of course, we fixed both bugs. 
So if I for the final time, I guess in this video, go back to my postman, and in here, I'm gonna go back to shake and bake, and we'll set the value equal to true. We should see that right away. So I can see shake and bake. And if I try to do that without passing anything in the name, then of course I'll get my big fat error because when I was setting up the model. I said that name is actually required. Awesome. And believe it or not, we're actually done with our basic setup as far as the API. And in order to showcase that, I'll simply go back to app.js and then I want to serve my static files because this is where my app is sitting. And of course, since our API is up and running, we can simply set up those static files, the app and the functionality should work. And if you remember, in order to serve static files, we need to use another middleware. And we're going to go with app dot use will pass in express. And the name is static. And then in here, we just simply need to say where the static files are located. And in our case, of course, that is in the public folder. And let me just say that if your code is exactly like mine, everything is going to work. Now, back in the app.js, I don't think we need that hello one anymore. So let me remove this one for the routes. I'll just leave the version one and then tasks. And then if I go to localhost 3000 and I remove that hello, I should see my app. And I can clearly see that these are all the tasks that I currently have. And if I want to add a new one, I'm just going to say testing app. And once I add, of course, I have all the way in the bottom a testing app. Well, effectively, I have two, but we right away can also practice on deleting. So there it is. Now we can delete the items all the way to second task. Then if I want to see the single task, just click over here. Notice now I have the task ID as well as second task. And then eventually, if I want to edit, well, I just click here on completed and I'll say third task third task. And if everything is correct, we should see task edited. Now I still need to fix the CSS. But as long as you see the correct text, you should be in good shape. Now, of course, by the time you're watching this, I'll fix this. But the idea is following if I try to edit the item without providing the name. Now, of course, I'll get error, please try again, I just need to fix the CSS, where essentially, if I'm successful, I still get this red color. And then once I navigate back, now these are going to be my tasks. If you're interested in the actual app, just navigate to the public one, you'll see that I used vanilla JS, just so everyone can be on the same page. And essentially, as far as the logic you're looking for browser app JS, and I'm not going to show you the entire thing. But as far as submitting the new task, I'm just listening for submit event, then I prevent the default. I'm looking for the value in the input. And notice that I'm using the Axios library. And check out the method. What is the method name? That is post. Why? Well, because that's how we can pass data onto the server, correct? Now, what is the URL? That should be familiar. We have API version one. And then of course, I'm looking for the tasks. And in here, I pass in the data. So unlike the postman, where we were doing that manually. Now, of course, I just grab the input, and I'll pass it in. And if you remember, the completed was set to false right from the get go. So I don't need to worry about that. I just need to pass in the name. And again, everything is in try catch. So if I'm successful, then of course, what happens? Well, then I add the correct alerts and all that. And then I just refetch one more time the tasks. Now, if I'm getting the error, then of course, I'll add different alerts. And hopefully you get the gist. And just to lastly showcase the delete one. If we scroll up a little bit, notice the method here. And like I previously mentioned, the only thing I'm looking for here is the response. If everything is correct, if I have 200, awesome, I just refetch all the tasks. If not, then there's an error. And essentially, I don't remove it from my DOM. That's why I said that technically, 
when you're set up for the delete, in most cases, you're not going to have to send back that item that you're removing. And now it's simply about making this app better. Because yes, we have the core functionality in place. We can definitely test it out on a front end and everything is awesome. But there's some things that we would want to fix. For example, I want to remove all these try catch blocks. I don't want to repeat myself in such a way. I also want to set up one place where we're dealing with errors and other improvements. So in the following videos, we'll make our app better. So we have the core functionality in place. Now we just want to make it better. All right. And up next, I want to finally discuss put method versus patch method. So why in this API, in our routes, we used patch and during tutorial, we used put. So here's the deal. Yes, put and patch are both are both for updating the resource. But the assumption is that when you use put, you're trying to replace the existing resource. And patch is for partial update. And since I'm fully aware that this might sound like mumbo jumbo to you, let me give you an example. So if we go to our postman, and then more specifically, update task, if the ID is correct, then only the properties that I'll pass in will be updated. So in this case, if I'm going to go with shake and bake number two, and I'll actually remove completed, only the property that is passed in will be updated. So if I send, check it out. Now I get the task and I can clearly see that completed is there, even though I didn't pass it. Why? Well, because that's how our functionality is set up in the controller. So if I'll pass completed and I'll set it equal to false, of course, it will be updated as well. So if I go here completed and I'll set it to false, yes. In this case, since I'm passing the property, of course, now I'm going to get the new result. Now, what is the difference with put? Well, let me go the long route and actually set up one more controller. But keep in mind that this is going to be just temporary controller. So if you don't want, you can just sit back and relax. And we'll start in our routes, where essentially, I want to go with my route. And in this case, I'm still looking for this forward slash and then colon ID. Because again, the functionality is going to be almost the same. But I'm looking for a different method. And I'm looking for put. And of course, now we just need to create the controller. And in my case, eventually, I'll call this update, or I'm sorry, edit task, just so it's a little bit different. So of course, I'm not exporting that yet. But I'll right away, set it here in my structure, I'll say, edit task, and then back in the controllers, I just want to go below the update task. Again, this is just going to be temporary, but I'll go with const edit, and then task and that one is going to be equal to whatever I have over here, we simply need to add one more option in the find one and update. So let me select this whole thing, just so we don't have to type it from scratch. And all the way in the bottom, we're going to go with edit task. And like I said, it's going to be temporary. So in here, I'm not going to save it with all my routes. But let me just save my current ones. And I'll close all of these windows. And let's set up a new route. So in this case, it's going to be a put route. And remember, we have our variable. So I'm looking for URL. And then I'm looking for the tasks. And of course, I want to grab some kind of ID. So let me get again, all the tasks here. And I'm going to stick with shake and bake. Because I like that name so much. So let me grab this ID here then back in tasks, I uh, will pass it in. And then let's try to recreate the same functionality that we have for now in the patch. And essentially, what I really want is just to pass in some data in my body. So I'm going to go here with raw. Again, we're looking for JSON. And we'll set it up name equal to john, nothing particularly original. And once I save, of course, now, shake and bake has the name of John. But here comes the biggest difference between put method that we're using over here, and the patch method. So idea with put is that if I send only the name, my expectation 
is that all the rest of the properties, which of course, in our case is just completed, will be removed from that item. So we will replace that item. And how is that going to look like in our controller? Well, here, everything is going to be exactly the same. But by default, Mongoose doesn't do that. So by default, Mongoose is going to be like, okay, so you want to get the item, you want to update it, awesome. Just get me the properties you want to update, and the rest of them will stay the same. And if I actually want to remove those properties, the ones that I'm not passing in with my request, I need to add another option here. And the option name is Overwrite. And we need to set it equal to true. So now you'll notice that back in my postman, if I send here with name, and let's just keep it interesting, and pass in Peter, check it out, we have name, and the completed is still there. Now why it's still there? Well, because in our model, we have default set to false. So there is some default one. If I remove it, you'll notice that with our put method, the way the controller works right now, if I send it right now, then of course, I'll just get the name. So completed is not there anymore. So if I take a look at all the tasks now, in the first one, actually completed is missing. So that is going to be the difference where when we work with put, the expectation is that we'll replace the item. So we'll just pass in the properties that we want to set up in item, and then the rest of them effectively will be removed. But when we're working with patch, we're just updating the properties that we're passing in. Just remember that in real life, you will see the APIs where the put method is used with the same functionality as the patch. Now, in our case, for the remainder of the project, we'll use the patch one instead. So therefore, I'll remove this edit one and here as well. And the same I want to do in routes, like I said. This is just for demonstration purposes. So save it here. And I also want to remove this route from my postman, just so it's not in a way. So say don't save. And I'm back to my five routes. And of course, for the update, I'm using the patch one. And before we start refactoring our code, and adding some extra middleware, let's just spend a few minutes on our responses. And more specifically on the other options you have when setting them up. And I'll use get all tasks route as my example. Just keep in mind that the same goes for the rest of them. And essentially, when I was setting up the route, I said that you have tons of options here as far as the response. So in my case, I'm just setting up push the JSON object. And then I set the property tasks equal to tasks. But you can also do something like this where I'll copy and paste, and I'm going to go with arrest.status. So this won't change. We're just talking about the object that we're sending back. And instead of simply just sending tasks, you could also add the amount of tasks. And for this property name, of course, sky is the limit. Whatever you want to come up with. In my case, I'm going to go with amount, but you can also call it maybe value, maybe the number of hits or something along those lines. And here you're just looking for tasks and, of course, the length, like so. And also what we could do, and I'll just comment these options out just so they can stay for your reference. And let me copy and paste so I don't have to type arrest.status. Also, what we could do, well, I could set up a flag here where I say success is equal to true. And then, of course, we need to keep in mind if that is the case, then you also need to add something here where you have the error, whether that is 404 error or it's the general 501. So effectively, here I just add this extra bit of data where I say, yeah, the success was true. And then you can even place it in the data property and then say tasks is equal to tasks and also maybe add the amount. So that's also something that you might see around. For example, the Hacker News API uses the number of hits like so. so. Essentially, you just get that value. And again, that is going to be equal to the array that you're getting back equal to a length. And once I say, of course, my response is going to look like this. Now, if you don't like the success one, 
and go maybe with status. That's also something that you might see around where we set up status is equal to success for the successful responses. And then for the errors, of course, we're going to go with status and then fail or error or whatever string value you might want to set up. And if you're wondering why am I showing you this is because I want you to be aware of your options. So just because I'm setting it this way, where I just pass in the tasks, of course, that's not a rule. That's pretty much my preference. And why I don't prefer setting up the statuses or successes or the data here, that is simply because of the front end. So in my experience, when we use front end, there's two things that are going on. Effectively, when we have asynchronous responses, we already have try and catch. And because of that, I find the status or success to be a bit redundant. Because effectively, just like I showed you with delete, if I'm successful, then of course, this code will run regardless. And then if there's some kind of error, then of course, I'm going to have my code in the catch block. And why I don't like setting up the data? Well, because on my front end, usually I use Axios. And if you're familiar with Axios, it right away returns a data property. So it right away has that data object. So if you set this response in such a manner where you have data returned in the object, then on the front end, you'll have data. And then in that data object, you have another data. So essentially on the front end, you would need to do something like this where there is a data object inside of that data object, there's another data object, and then you only get the tasks, which is, of course, not the end of the world. But in my case, again, I find it a bit redundant. And lastly, when it comes to tutorials and courses, I also enjoy the fact that there's less typing in the setup where I just pass in the tasks. So be aware of your options. My suggestion is whichever route you pick, just stick throughout the API. So there's no confusion. Don't set up one type of response for one route, and then go totally different in a different route. That's going to be very confusing to whomever is using your API. And lastly, let me just say this. Yes, you can set up your own API responses, however you like. But if you want our front end app, the one that's sitting in the public to work properly, the responses have to be exactly the same as mine, because that's what the app is expecting. If you'll set it up willy nilly, then you might get some bugs. Not bad, not bad. Once we have discussed our response options, next, I want to work on a route not found. So at the moment, life is awesome. We have our application everything works. If I go to index.html, of course, I can see the application. If I go to API, then version one, and then tasks, of course, I can see all the tasks. But what happens if I go with API version one, and then hollow? So I have cannot get API, blah, blah, blah. And I can clearly see in my browser, that of course, we get 404 error. But essentially, this is going to be the default one. And instead, I want to set up the custom one, just like they have in Algolia one, or again, if you're looking for some kind of resource, and the server can find the resource, then essentially, we still get the 404. But of course, the value here is unknown. Now, it doesn't really matter what you set up as far as the value, just want to showcase how we can set up a custom 404 response. And the way we do that, we go back to our application here. And then in the app.js, I want to remove these comments, because I think we're clear on the rest API. And location here is very important. So we have the middleware for public and JSON that still stays the same. Then we have all our routes for the tasks. And then right after that, we want to go with app.use. And then we'll pass in our middleware function, the one that will handle the 404 and send some kind of custom response. Now we haven't created it yet. So let's go back to our starter. We'll create a new folder because there's going to be a few middlewares that we'll set up in the upcoming videos. So we'll say middleware. And then inside of the middleware, we want to go with new file. And I'll call this one, not surprisingly, 
not found an JS. And as far as the logic, well, we'll still have access to rec and res. So we just need to come up with function name. In my case, it's going to be not found, and I'll set it equal to rec and res. And then as far as the response, I'm just going to go with res dot then status. And of course, in this case, it's 404. So the server is letting the user know that it cannot find the resource. And then as far as the message, I'll just use a simple send. And I'll say route does not and exist. So now, of course, we just need to export this. And we do that with module then exports, of course, and we'll set it equal to our not found. And then back in the app JS above the app dot use, I guess, we're going to go with const not found is equal to require. Then we're looking, of course, in our middleware. So let me say dot middleware. And then more specifically, we're looking in the not found. And then in the app dot use, we'll just stick not found one. And once we save, and in this case, I'll just use the postman, just so you can see that it's going to work exactly the same. And if we're looking for the URL, and then we'll go with hello. Now, of course, we have our custom one, we have route does not exist, which is pretty awesome. And just to showcase that it's going to be the same scenario in the browser as well. Notice, once we refresh, we have route does not exist. So we set up the middleware folder. In there, we have not found JS. And then back in the app JS, we import the function, we set some kind of name, in my case, it's not found. And then all the way in the bottom, we go with app dot use, and we pass in the function. And in that function, we'll have access to rec and res. And in our case, we're just interested in the response. And we'll set up a 404 with whatever message we want to send back. Awesome. And up next, I want to work on asynchronous wrappers for all our controllers. Why? Well, because we have asynchronous operations. And yes, it's very useful to use these try catch blocks. But you'll have to agree with me that it becomes somewhat redundant, pretty much for every controller setting up try and then catch. And as you can see, essentially, I'm just copying pasting the code around. So there has to be a better solution. And that better solution is to create a middleware function that essentially will wrap our controllers. And in there, we'll just set up the functionality where we don't have to repeat ourselves. And before we continue, let me just say that there are some NPM packages that do that for us. And most likely in the upcoming projects, we'll use them instead, since that way we can save some time on the setup. But I think it's very important to have at least a general idea of what the package is doing, instead of blindly installing it. And therefore, in our first project, we'll set up the basic logic ourselves. And we'll start over here with new file. And I'll call this async JS. And then inside of it, I'm just going to go with const async wrapper. So I simply create a function. At the moment, nothing's happening here. And then I want to export it. So module exports, and then async wrapper. And once we set up the export, now, of course, I just want to go to my controllers and import that middleware. So I'm looking in the middleware, and I'm looking for a sync. So in here, let's just call this a sync wrapper again, and that is equal to require, then we navigate to our middleware folder. And of course, we're looking for the async. And now what we want to do is wrap all of our controllers. Now I'm not going to wrap all of them right away. I'll just start with get all tasks, just so you understand how it is going to work. So what we want to do here is just to take this async wrapper, this function, and just wrap our current controller. And essentially, it's going to look like this, where we go with async wrapper, and we pass in the controller, the current controller as an argument. And since we know that we can do that in JavaScript, we are in good shape. So we pass it in. And then back in the async, of course, I need to set up the parameter. So since I'm passing in already in the controllers, my function, my controller as an argument back in my sync.js, my middleware, 
I just need to go with some kind of parameter. Now you can call this callback, you can call this function, doesn't really matter. In my case, I'm just going to go with fn. And what am I trying to do here? Well, I'm trying to avoid this try catch. So essentially, I want to have my cake and eat it too, where I can still use this nice await syntax, but I don't have to set up these try catch blocks. How can we do that? Well, we set up the try catch blocks inside of the wrapper. And the first thing that I want to do from this function is to return another one. So in here, I'll say return async. And then if you remember in the express, by default, we right away got request response as well as the next. So that's what I'm trying to do over here. Since I wrapped my controller in my middleware, and if you pay close attention, we're actually invoking the async wrapper right away. Now, of course, I want to pass in those requests, response, and next down to my function, down to this controller, correct? Because now, of course, I wrap my controller in my middleware. And the way we do that, we return another function since I'll use a wait inside of the function body. That's why I set it up here as a sync. And please, please, please keep something in mind where these ones, the rec, res, and next will have access to right away because at the end of the day, we return another function from a sync wrapper. And then inside of the function body, one of the things that I want to do is pass these rec, res, and next from express down to this function. So hopefully that is clear. Again, we get these ones by default. The reason why we have access to them, because from our async wrapper, we actually return another function. So that's how we will have right away access to them. And then in the function body, we'll decide what to do with our parameter, with our argument, which is our current controller. And as far as logic, I want to go with try catch block. And then inside of the try block, I'm going to go with await and function. And here we'll pass in rec, res, and next. And then once we have passed all of these things down to our controller, of course, now we'll have access to them in here as well. And then also, since there might be a case for an error, we'll go with next, and then we'll pass in the error. And if you're wondering what's happening over here, essentially, we're passing this to a next middleware, which we haven't set up yet in our app.js. So that's what's coming up in the following videos, we'll set up another set of middleware. And in this case, we will deal with errors. So once we save over here, we can go back to the controllers. And now I can remove the try catch block. So remove the try catch block completely. And at this point, you should only have these two lines of code, where we're waiting to find all the tasks. And if we're successful, we send back those tasks. And as far as the async wrapper, we take our controller as a argument. And then since we return a function, we have access to rec, res, and next that are coming from the express. And we set up the try catch block. And in here we have a wait because our controller is still async. And we know that by default, a sync function will always, always return a promise. So in here, I just have a wait, and I'm waiting for that promise to be settled, either resolved or rejected. And since my controller will still need to access a rec res and possibly next, since I get them from express, I pass it down to my controller. And then if there is an error, so in here, if we trigger some kind of error, whether in get all tasks or any of the controllers, then of course, we'll catch it over here and we'll pass it to a next set of middleware, which we haven't set up yet. And now, of course, once we have everything in place, now we just want to apply these changes to all the routes. Now, I fully understand that some people are very negative about refactoring the code. And to some degree, I sympathize with that because I also hold the opinion where it's not very useful if we're all the time refactoring the application. But it was important for me to show you the long way first, because that way you have a good understanding of how everything works. And now we just set up the middleware 
that actually handles that. So let's go back to the controllers and slowly but surely let's add this async wrapper to all the routes. And the setup is going to be following for all of them where we start with a sync wrapper. So we set up our two parentheses here, and we need to make sure that the second parenthesis, the closing one, is right after the curly brace. Correct? Then we want to remove the try block as well as the catch block. And again, we'll be just left with await task.create. If we're successful, we send back the task. And effectively, we want to do that for all our controllers. So let me go here with a sync wrapper. Same deal. Wrap this guy here. And then we have try and we remove the catch, but we are leaving this one. So we'll work with this one a little bit later. For time being, we'll leave it as it is with this response. And once we set up our custom error, there's going to be some changes here as well. Let's keep on scrolling. We're looking for the async wrapper. And again, we want to add the closing one right after the curly brace. We still pass in the function. I'll remove my try. I'll remove my catch here. And we'll save it. And the same goes for updating the task as well. So we go here with a sync wrapper. And we'll close it. Then we want to remove try. And we want to remove catch. And just to try it out, why don't we go to create task? And then I'm just going to go with creating task, creating task. Let's try it out. Everything still works. I can create my task. But if I'll try to add a task with an empty string value, I should get the error. And I do. But of course, this is not the error that we're sending. So that's something that we're going to work on in the upcoming videos. And once we have set up the async wrapper, next, I want to work on catching the errors. And we're going to start our journey actually in the express documentation. So go to expressjs.com. And then in search box, just type error. And first, let's take a look at the default one. And if you take a look at the first sentence, express comes with built in error handler that takes care of any errors that might be encountered in the app. This default error handling middleware function is added at the end of the middleware function stack. And if we pass in error to the next and you do not handle it in a custom error handler, it will be handled by the built in one. Why am I telling you this? Well, because that answers this question. Where is this response coming from? Well, that is coming from the default built in error handler. That's point number one I want to make. Otherwise, you might be wondering, well, where are we getting this info? Second, next, correct? That's why in the async wrapper, we set up this next and error. So we passed it to the next middleware. But in our case, of course, we haven't set up that handler yet. So therefore, it was just eventually passed down to the built in one. And lastly, if we go back and if we say here error, so I'll search one more time. And in this case, we're looking for writing error handlers. So this is what we're about to do. We'll set up another set of middleware. However, in this case, the middleware will handle errors. And you can see that if we want to handle errors, we just pass in four arguments. And then the first one will be that error. And then we want to place that at the very end of our routes. So let's just navigate back. And of course, in the example, they showcase how they right away set up the middleware in the app JS. In our case, since we'll have more code, essentially, I want to create another file in the middleware. So in here, I'm just looking for new file. And I'll call this error, and then handler. And inside of the file, I just need to come up with a function. And I'm going to go the long route where I'll say error, handler, middleware, and that is equal to error. Again, in this case, we need to have four parameters, request, response, and we also have next. And as far as the logic, we'll add more code once we set up our own custom error class. But for time being, we just want to go with return and res that status. And if you remember, that's exactly what we had previously in the try catch block. And I'm just going to go 500. 
and we'll say JSON error and error is equal to error. Now, if you want, you can console log it, of course, but the result is going to be exactly the same where in here we'll have access to that error. The one that is going to be coming in our case from this async wrapper. And then we just need to decide what we want to do. And I'll just start by setting error equal to error. And you know, what? actually, I want to go with message is equal to error. And now we simply want to go back to app JS, where we have not found, let's just copy and paste. And now we just need to come up with a name. And as you know, naming is probably the hardest thing in programming. So in my case, I'm just going to call this error handler, and then middleware. And of course, that one is coming from the file that we just set up the error handler. And then we want to scroll all the way down. And right after not found, we're going to go with app dot use. And of course, we'll pass in the error handler middleware. And once we save and we go back to the postman and try to send the same request, meaning the request with a incomplete data, then we should get a different response, but we don't. Effectively, it looks like I have a bug. So let me check the error handler. And yes, of course, I didn't export the function. So let me go with module exports. And that one is equal to a error handler one. And of course, if I test it out right now, I should see the custom response. And we can clearly see that because we have the message. Now, like I already mentioned previously, if you don't like these big, massive error messages, you can simply go back over here. And instead of setting the message equal to an error, you can just hard code some kind of message. So you can go something along the lines of something, something went wrong, comma, try again later. This is what we'll see in Postman. Again, we send, and now, of course, our message is shorter. So essentially, this is how we can set up a custom error handler in Express where we add another piece of middleware. And then in there, we have four arguments. And the first one is going to be the error. And of course, in our case, the way we pass the errors down to this custom error handler is by using the async wrapper. And in there we have the next. So as you remember from tutorial, with next, we pass it to the next middleware. And previously, we used the built in default one. And now, of course, we have our own, where effectively, you can set up whatever logic you want. If you want to send this as 200, nothing stops you from doing that. But of course, a more meaningful response would be with some kind of error code and with some kind of meaningful message, whether that is hard coded string, or you can pass in the entire error object. And right after we set up our custom error handler, let's work on our 404 responses too. And essentially, I want to set up a custom error class which extends from the general JavaScript error class. And that way we can handle all of our 404 responses in our newly created error handler as well. And we're going to start by navigating back to the controllers and the routes or controllers that I'm looking for are following. I want to work on update task. Here we send the 404. Then the same is for deleting the task and of course, getting the task. And let's just start over here with getting the task. And simply, I want to showcase that we can create a new error object if we run the built in JavaScript error constructor. And we go here with const, and no surprise, I'm going to call this error, and that is equal to new. And then we just go with error. And here we pass in the message. So I can say not found. And then in the next line, I'm just going to go with error. So now I'm dealing with the object that I just created and I'll set another property on it and I'll say status. So that's the name of the property. And of course, the value will be 404. So now, if you want, you can console log it here. Or what we can simply do is use next and pass this guy down to our custom error handler. Because Remember, that's how it works. We call next. And then we pass in the error. And of course, in this case, we are creating that error ourselves instead of getting it from the mongoose. And the only thing that's missing right now is in our controller because we don't have the next. So I want to go here with next. 
and then we need to go with return again. I already mentioned why we want to do that because we don't want JavaScript to keep reading the code. Now, of course, we have this one right now, but hopefully you get the gist where we need to go with a return and then next. And now, of course, I want to pass in my newly created error object. And once I do that, if we go back over here in the error handler, and if we simply console log, we should see our newly created error object. So I'm going to go here with console log and I'll look for my error. And now let me go back to the postman. And essentially what I want to do, I want to get all the tasks. And then I'll look for one of the IDs. But again, I don't want to get that cast error. So I still want to keep the same structure. I just want to pass in the wrong value. So I'll look for single task. I'll copy and paste. And then instead of three, I'm going to go with four. So once we send, of course, we get our custom error message as vague as it currently is. And then, of course, in the console, I can clearly see that I have not found. So, of course, that is going to be my message. And I understand that might be a bit confusing, but effectively, the idea is following where once we create this new error object, that property is going to be on there. So in order to access the string value, we'll have to go over here and simply go with error and then dot message. And as far as the status, well, we can clearly see it here. We can have 404. So now, just for kicks, what we can do is set up message is equal to error message. Like I said, there's the property on that object. And then as far as the status, well, I can simply change this one around, where instead of 500, I'll pass in error and then status. And don't worry, of course, there's more code coming. And once I have applied these changes, of course, we can swing back to our postman and check it out. Now, of course, we have 404. And then the message is not found. So that's pretty cool. Now, of course, we just need to go back to the tasks and set it up in a such a way where we don't have to do this all the time manually. And the idea is following where again, we'll create a new class, a new custom error class, and we'll extend it from the JavaScript error. And then we'll create a new instance and yada, yada, yada. And effectively, the way we want to do that, we want to create a new folder, and I'll call this errors, pretty self explanatory. So we're going to go here with new folders, and we're going to go with errors. And inside of it, I'm going to create another new file. And in this case, I'm going to call this custom and hyphen error. And of course, I'm going to add the JS extension. And then inside of my custom error, now I want to extend from the error class. Now, here's the deal. In this case, I'll just write out the code and then I'll go line by line of what's happening because I think that's going to be a bit more productive. So let's go here with class and then we just need to come up with a name. In my case, I am going to go with the long one. I'm going to say custom API and then error. Now we need to use the extends keyword. And since I want to extend from the error class, I'm going to go here with error. And as far as the functionality, we want to go with constructor. And in here, we'll pass in message and status code. And then inside of the constructor, we want to call super, then pass in the message. And right after I call super, I'm going to go with this dot status code. And I'll set that one equal to whatever I'm passing in the constructor. So in here, I'll pass in the status code. And as far as these few lines of code, a constructor method is a special method we invoke when we create a new instance of a class. And in our case, we'll pass in two arguments, an error message and a status code. Then, since we're extending, basically, we're setting up a child class, we need to call super method, which in turn invokes a constructor of a parent class. And in our case, we pass in our message value. As a result, we'll have access to all the methods and properties of the parent, so in our instance, we'll have the message property. And with this dot status code, we create a status code property as well. And that's how we can create our new custom error class. And essentially, if you want to create new instances, you can simply go with custom and then API error, and then pass in those two values, the message and the status code. 
but I actually like to set up a new function that does that for me. And here I'm going to go with const create custom and error. And this function is going to be looking for two parameters, a message, and then a status code. And what I'm going to do is from this function, I'm going to return that new instance. So I'm going to go with return new. And then we're looking for custom API error. And then of course, we'll pass in the message here, as well as the status code. Now, of course, if you want to keep the same parameter names, you can definitely do so. But in my case, I'm purposely setting this up. So you can see that this is coming from the function as far as the message. And of course, I pass into my custom API error, more specifically in the constructor as a message. And then of course, we just need to export this. And we'll have to export both of them. And you'll see in a second why. So we're going to go with module exports is equal to an object. And then we're looking for create custom error, and then custom API error. And once we have both once we have the class, as well as the function, and we're exporting both. Now, of course, we want to go to the tasks, we just need to remember that, of course, we're exporting object. So therefore, we'll have to provide a specific name. In our case, I'm looking here for the function. So I'm going to go to const, I'll set up my curlies, and I'll say create, and then custom and error. So of course, that is my function, set it equal to require, I do need to go two levels up. So in here, we're looking for the errors. And then more specifically, I'm looking for the custom one. And then I want to replace all of these three instances. And of course, I want to remove this manual code as well. So I'll start over here. And then I'll keep this one for the second, just because I want to reuse the same message. And the idea is following where we go with a return, then a next. And then instead of the next, we pass in create custom error. And of course, we want to pass in the message. So that's why I'll just copy this one, just because I want to speed this up. And then the second thing is going to be my status code, which of course, is going to be 404. And now we can remove the second line. And we just want to copy and paste. So it's the same deal over here. And the same in the update task as well. And once we have all of this in place, now we just want to go to error handler. So our custom error handler. And instead of looking for the function, we're looking for the class. Because in here, I want to check if the instance is equal to our custom error one, then of course, I'll pass in the status code and the error message. However, if there is any other error, then of course, we'll just go with res.status 500. And whatever we had before. So let me go at the top. And I'm going to go with const again, it is named the import. So we're looking for custom API, and then error, and that is equal to require. And same deal, we go two levels up, we're looking for errors, and more specifically custom error. And let's right away set up the default one. And this one, I'll set it back to 500 here. And then as far as the JSON, let's go with the same message, I'm just gonna say something went wrong, please try again. And above this return, we're going to go with if, and then we'll check if the error is the instance of our custom API error. Then of course, I want to go with return. And I want to pass in the res dot status. And then that will be equal to a error dot status code, because of course, that's where the value is sitting in that property. And then when it comes to the actual message, same deal, I'm going to go with message, and this will be equal to error. And then we're looking for the message property. And once we save, let's go and test it out. Or essentially, if I send it here from the postman, of course, I'll have no task with this ID. And if I'm going to mess with the syntax, I should get the cast error, which of course I do, because I can clearly see that something went wrong. Please try again. Lastly, let me just repeat one more time that error handling and validation is something we're going to return to later, most likely in a separate project. This is just a general setup, just to get you comfortable with overall ideas. And later, we'll work on more complex validation and error handling approach.
Nice. I think we're done with error handling, at least for now. And now let's talk about deployment. And right off the bat, I want to say that we're not going to deploy this project simply because we have not covered authentication yet, as well as extra packages for security and deploying the project where anyone can tinker with all the data is somewhat irresponsible. And it actually can lead to a lot of headaches. But with that said, there is something deployment related I want to cover. And that is our port variable. You see, hard coded value like port 3000 or 6000 or 7000 is decent solution in our local environment. But when it comes to deployment in many environments, the host, so the platform where the project is hosted on, may want to independently set the port value to whatever makes sense to the platform. Because as you can imagine, it needs to handle more than just one application at a time. And in order to make that possible, when it comes to port value, instead of hard coding to 3000, 6000, or whatever, we'll have to use the port variable that is available in process.env instead. And set up or operator just in case it's undefined. And in order to set that up, we need to go to our port variable. That's why in this case, we set it up as a variable. And then before the 3000, we actually want to go with process and then dot env. And then we're looking for the port variable. So we go here with port. And then if it is set, then of course, we'll use that value. If not, then we'll use the or operator. And then of course, we're going to go with 3000. Now, of course, in a local environment, by default, it's not going to be set. So we'll always go back to the 3000. However, once we deploy, it's going to be a different scenario. Now, if you want to test it out in local environment, you can actually do so. And we do that by stopping the server. And then we want to go with a port. And we set it equal to whatever value you want. Now, in my case, I'm going to go with 5000 because I believe my final one is using that. So I'm going to go with 6000. And then you want to go with a node. And then what is the name of the file you want to run? Of course, it is app.js. And now check it out. In a console, we should see 6000. Now, of course, I still see 3000 because I didn't save the file. My apologies. Let me stop the server just so you don't think that I'm messing with you. And let me run the command one more time. And now, of course, in the console, I can see server is listening on port 6000. And one more time, as far as our logic, we just say set port to whatever is the environment variable by the name of port or 3000 if there's nothing there. Awesome. Congrats on completing the project. And I'll see you in the next one. All right. And welcome to our next project, the store API where we'll learn the advanced filtering, sorting, and dynamically populating our database, as well as a bunch of other cool stuff. While I did not create the front end for this project, just because it seemed like an overkill, the idea is following. Imagine we're in charge of store API, and we want to provide a bunch of search options for our users. Everything starting with search by name to filtering based on price amount. Since we'll cover all the options in great detail during the project, I won't do it right now, but I do want to showcase where I got the idea from and how that would look like in real life. And it's probably not going to be surprised if I tell you that I got this idea from the Hacker News API. And if you remember, they offer quite a few search options for their user. Now, we're not going to implement all of them, but we will mimic the major ones. And as far as how it's going to look like in real life, if you took my React course, you probably worked on a store project. And during that project, we built the entire search functionality on a front end. Now, imagine once we're done building our API, the front end only needs to make HTTP calls and we send back the data. So the same result, user can still search for products, but only this time, the back end does all the heavy lifting. And front end is only responsible for HTTP calls. So the user can still search for products, whether that's based on name or category or company. And of course, you can read the rest. But the difference is, of course, that now the front end only makes the HTTP call and then the back end does all the heavy lifting. And as far as the project setup, again, we've got two folders, final one, 
and a star one. And of course, the final one is for your reference. And the star one is where we'll do all of our work. And just like in the previous project, when it comes to final, in order to run it, you'll need to complete some extra steps first, not just npm install. And of course, I'll cover all of that during the project. As far as the star, most of the things should look very familiar since we covered them in the tutorial as well as the previous project. And you'll also notice that in order to save some time on a boilerplate, I already prepared a folder structure for you. Now, when it comes to files, most of them are empty since that's going to be our job during the project, but the folders are already there. Well, I understand that some people like creating everything from scratch since we're going to be building quite a few projects. In my opinion, there's very little benefit to repeat all the steps every single time. All right. And once we're familiar with the setup, now let's kick things into gear. And of course, let's start working on a project. And the first thing we need to do is install all the dependencies. And we do that by navigating to the starter. So again, big picture, we're looking for fourth project. So 04 store API, and then more specifically, the starter. And I think the fastest way is just typing CD, and then take the folder, drag and drop. And of course, we're sitting in the folder. And then we run npm install. And while the project dependencies are being installed, let me just mention that in this project, we will set up everything from the scratch, just like we did in the previous project, just so we can keep on practicing on getting our project off the ground. But starting with the next project, some of the boilerplate code, the one that we'll type in this and few of the following videos will be already prepared for you. Since that way, we can right away cut to the chase and don't waste our time on stuff we already covered. And once the dependencies are there, then of course, I just need to check the package JSON. And I can clearly see that the command is npm start. And of course, we just spin up the node man. So we go here with npm start. And we are in good place. Now, of course, let me navigate to the app JS. And here, let's start adding the code. And the first thing that I want to do is get that package, the dot env. So I have access to environment variables, because of course, Again, we'll connect to our database. And we simply do that by typing require. Then we're looking for dot env. That's the package name. And if you remember, we invoke config. Now, of course, we haven't set up the dot env yet, the file in the root of our project, but we definitely need to use the dot env if we want to access the variables. And of course, we'll work on dot env once we actually start connecting to the database. Then I'll add a comment of async errors, and you'll see why I do that in a few videos. And then, of course, we want to spin up the express. So we go here with const, and express is equal to express, of course. So I go here with require, and then express. And then once I have the package, then, of course, we want to spin up the app. So we go with const app is equal to express. And then, of course, we invoke it. Now I'll start listening for the server a little later. Now I just want to import two middleware functions that we set up in the previous project. And those are error handler. So this one over here, where essentially we just catch all the errors and then we decide what is going to be our response. And then the second one is not found because this is going to be the case where I don't want to repeat the same stuff we already covered in the previous project. So that's the code that I already prepared for you. And now we simply need to import both of them and come up with some meaningful names. In this case, I'm going to go with not found and then middleware. And that is equal to require. And of course, I'm looking in the middleware folder. And then more specifically, we're looking for that not found one. Then we'll copy and paste and then just change the name where instead of not found, we're going to go with error. And of course, the file that we're looking for is also different. And I called it error handler. And once we have both of these imports in place, now, of course, we can set up the express JSON middleware as well. While we're at it, and you know what, in here, let me just add middleware comment. And then, like I said, we're going to go with app.use, and then we'll pass in the express, and we're invoking JSON. Then we'll set up our one lonely route 
for time being. And essentially, this is just for testing. So let me add here routes. Eventually, of course, we'll set up the router and all that. But for time being, we're just going to go with app dot get, we're going to be looking for the homepage, meaning the forward slash, and then we'll set up rec and res. So of course, our callback function, and here, let's say rec and res. And as far as the response, I'm actually going to be cheating a little bit, where I'm going to go with res dot send. And then since I can pass in some HTML, I'll say heading one, and name of the project store API. And of course, now I want to close my heading one. And then also I want to set up a link that will navigate to the products page, the one that we haven't set up yet. And in here, let's just go with href. And I guess more correctly, the product route, because technically we'll be sending JSON. It's not going to be a page. And in here we go with forward slash API and then version one products. And I'm purposely keeping this API in version one, just because we already have the global variable in a postman. And then as far as the text, let me just close it here and then close the actual tags. And then we'll say products route. So that way, if we ever need to, we can just quickly navigate from the browser as well. So let's save this one and let's keep it going. And in here, I'll add the comment for products route that we'll set up in the upcoming videos. And then I want to use both of these middlewares. So we have not found an error middleware. And I simply want to use app.use, but make sure you do that right after the app.get. So we'll say here app.use. And first, let's just look for not found one. And then we'll do the same thing with the other one as well. So pass here error middleware. And then I want to set up my start function. But initially, I'm not going to use that connect DB. So we'll simply just go with app.listen, but we'll place it in the start because, of course, eventually we will connect to the database. So let's just start over here, start. And it's going to be a sync. And then as far as the function body, let's just go with try catch. And then eventually we'll connect to DB connect db. But for time being, we just simply want to go with app dot listen. And then what is the port? Well, we need to create that port variable. And if you remember the end of the previous project, effectively, we'll set this up dynamic, where we'll go with const port is equal to process dot env, and then port, if it is undefined, then of course, we can hard code this value. And I believe that in my final one, I have 5000. So I'll keep this one as 3000. And then we'll pass in that variable here, the port one. And then of course, let's set up the console log just so we can see that everything works. And here we'll just say server is listening to the port and then whatever is the port variable. So let's say over here, port, and then I'll add those three dots. And then if there is an error, of course, we go with console log and the error. And now finally, we can just invoke start. And if you can see in a console server is listening on port 3000, then of course, we are in good shape. And if you want to test it out in the browser, just navigate there, look for localhost 3000. And of course, this is what you should see me hitting one as well as the link. Now, we don't have the route for API version one product, but we can nicely test our 404. Since we can see the route does not exist text. And if we have all of this in place, now, of course, we can move on to our next topic. And once our basic express server is up and running, next, I want to connect to our database. And if you remember, we just need to navigate to the Atlas. And then we're looking for connect. So that is going to give us that connection string. And of course, we'll have to supply here the proper values. So let me just grab this one. Then we're going to navigate back to our project. And of course, I'll right away set it up in dot env. So in the starter, make sure it's in root, we're going to go with new file. And then we go with dot env here. And then once we have the file, then of course, we want to create a new variable. And since it is a common practice to call this Mongo URI, we'll do the same where we'll say Mongo underscore URI is equal. And now, of course, we copy and paste. Now, as far as the database, I'm going to call my one 
zero for and then store API. Essentially the same as the project name, but sky's the limit. You can choose a different name, of course, as well. And then as far as the password, since I changed from my silly one, two, three, four. Now, of course, I'll freeze the video so you don't see what is my real password. And then once you add your own password, then make sure that you save dot env. That's a must. Then we want to restart the server. So in my case, I'll stop the server with control C. And then again, we go with npm start. And then once everything is in place now, of course, we just need to go back to app JS. And I just want to showcase that, of course, the function is already there. So the only thing you'll need to do is just to invoke it in app JS. Of course, you need to require it and then pass in the connection string with proper values. And since we already covered all of this setup in the previous project, essentially, there's really nothing new that we can learn over here. I already prepared all the code. So we simply need to grab this function and then pass in the correct connection string. So let's go back to app.js. And I guess we'll do that somewhere at the top. So right after app and before the middleware, we're just going to go with const. And again, I'll name it exactly the same, connect DB. And that one is equal to require. We're looking in the database folder. And then more specifically, we're looking for connect. Now, this function, of course, returns a promise. So that's why we set up start with our sync. And then right above the app that listen, I'm just going to go with await, connect DB. And then, of course, I'm looking for my variable, the one that's coming from the dot env. And I simply go here with process and then dot env. And then, of course, the variable name was Mongo URI. And if you see in a console server is listening on port 3000, then of course we are in good shape and we can move on to our next task. And once we have successfully connected to the database, next I want to set up two routes for the product. And you'll see why we have two routes. Essentially, the idea is that one of them, the first one, is just going to be for manual testing. And then since I want to keep on practicing on setting up the router, We'll do just that. And up here, I can notice that I actually have a spelling bug, or this should be routes. And then right after the home route, I'll set up my router and I'll do that using app.use. And then I just need to come up with that base path or root path for the router. And in my case, like I already mentioned, I'm going to go with API version one, and this is going to be looking for the product. And like I mentioned, when we were setting up this route, I simply add this API in version one because that way it's easier in Postman since we already have that global variable. And effectively in here, we want to pass in the router, but in order for the router to work, of course, we'll have to set up the controllers as well. And therefore, we'll start in the controllers. The file is already created for you and the name is product. And for time being, we'll simply set up two functions and we'll just send some dummy data back and two functions are going to be following we're going to go with const get all products and the first one i'll call static now this is going to be a sync since of course we will use the methods that we have on the mongoose and in here let's look for rec and res of course and then as far as the function body for the time being simply want to go with res.status and i'll set it equal to 200 and then as far as the response, I'm going to go JSON. And then instead of the JSON, I'll pass in the object. And in here, there's going to be a message property. And then we'll just write product testing route. Now, let me copy and paste this. And then we just want to remove that static part. And we also want to remove the testing one. So this is going to be actual route. And then, of course, we can export this. So let's go with module exports. And this is going to be my object. And here I simply want to pass in both functions. So get all products and get all product static. So we set this up. Then, of course, we need to navigate to our routes. So in here, this is where we'll set up our router. And then we'll start by getting the express. So const express is equal to require. And then we want to pass in the express, of course, again. 
And then once we have that, let's set up the router. And if you remember the syntax is following where we go with router and then we go with express dot. And then with the capital case, we go with the router. And then, of course, we invoke it. Then I want to import both of these functions from my controllers. And I'll right away use the structuring. So we'll go with const. And then the name is get all products, of course, and then get all products. And we'll add the static one. And that is equal to require. Then we're looking in the controllers. And then, of course, the file we're looking for is the product. And then if you remember, we have multiple options. And in this case, I'm going to go with router route. And then I'll go with forward slash. So essentially, this is going to be for that main route here, the API version one and product. And as far as which controller I want to use, I'll use this get all products. And please don't mix them up. Again, the controller you want to pass in is get all products. And as far as the static one, let's copy and paste. And then we'll just add that here at the end. So this is going to be our main path or root path. And then we're going to go with forward slash static. And this is where we want to pass in that get all product static. And then once we have this set up in place, now, of course, we just need to export this. So look for module exports. And of course, we'll export our router. And once we have set up the routes, then of course, let's just finally navigate back to the app JS. Of course, we do want to import that and come up with some kind of name. And in my case, I'm going to do that right after the connect DB. And we'll just say const and I'll name this product router. And that is equal to require. And then I'm looking in the routes folder. And then more specifically, we want to get the product. And then let's keep on scrolling and where we have app dot use for our middleware. Now, of course, we'll pass in our router. So let's just say here products and router. And once we save, I'll spin up the server one more time. And if you want to test this out, let's just navigate back to the browser. So I think I can close this one. And then at the moment it says route does not exist. But once we refresh, check it out. Of course, now we have message product route. Beautiful. And then if we want to test out the static one, well, we have product testing route. And once we have all of this in place, now, of course, we can move on to our next task. And since we have both of our routes in place, I think it's an awesome time to actually set up a new collection in a postman. And of course, set up those routes as well. So in here, I'm just going to save pretty much everything from the previous project. I'll close all the tabs here. I'll say, yep, save changes. And what I'm looking for, of course, is the new collection. So I'll say here, new collection. Then I'll right away rename it. And I guess I went for edit. Should have went for rename. And then we're going to go with, or at least I'm going to go with 04 and then store and then API. And then in here, we'll set up two routes, basically one for the product, the API version one and then product and the second one for the static one. So at this point, I think I can close these tabs here and we're looking for new request. Now, both of them are going to be get requests. So let's go over here, URL. And then we want to go with double curlies. And then we're looking for the product. Let's send and check it out. And of course, we have product route beautiful again save as or you can simply click on command s and this is going to be get all products okay awesome we're looking for store api let's save it over here and now let's just add that static one as well and i'll do that by opening up a new tab again same thing get route and then we're looking for the url one and then once we have the url we'll add the products and then, of course, the static one as well. So static here, let's send, because now we have product testing route. And as far as the name, I'll just call it that. I'll say get all products, but I'll say testing. And once we have both routes in a place, now, of course, we can move on to our next topic. And once the postman is ready to go, and before we deep dive into the mongoose, now, let me showcase something 
in our application where if you take a look at the middleware you'll notice that there is no async wrapper and if you remember we needed to use something either we set up try catch pretty much in every route correct or of course the other option was using that async wrapper but when we were setting it up i also mentioned that there are packages that do that for us and that's why if you take a look at the package json you'll notice package the express async errors and essentially the only thing we need to do is just go back to app js and then where we have a comment for async errors just import the package that's it that's all we have to do so let's go over here acquire and then of course we're looking for the package name of express async errors and just to stay on the safe side i'll stop the server and i'll spin it up one more time and now you'll notice that if i go back to the products one and or i'm sorry the products in the controller i'm actually going to close the routes i don't think we'll need that anymore as well as the app js we're pretty much done over here and then if in any of the controllers you'll go here and throw the error which you'll notice that will actually be able to access that error in our custom error handler and essentially what that means is that whenever mongoose is going to spit back that error unlike the previous time where initially we set up try and catch and then we built our own async wrapper in this case the package takes care of that so in here let me just go with throw and i'll call this new error and i'll say testing package or testing async errors whatever you want testing async errors and just to showcase that in the error handler i have the console log for the error and of course in here i'm sending back some kind of hard-coded message so first what i want to do is from the postman navigate to my static one just to showcase that of course we are catching those errors nicely with our package and then i'll cover the package in more detail so let me go back to the postman and unfortunately it's all the way on the left hand side so there's a little bit of jumping here and i'm looking for the static one i simply want to invoke the route and now check it out something went wrong please try again and if i navigate back all the way here in the bottom i should see error testing async errors and if you're interested in finding out more about the package just go to google and type express async errors and of course one of the links is going to lead back to their docs and effectively if you want to use it in your own project just go with npm install express async errors then we keep on scrolling and notice how the only thing we need to do is to require it and then we're good to go now one thing you probably noticed that i did not use next and essentially the reason why i didn't do that is because if you read their docs they say that instead of using next we simply need to throw a error and of course since i can see the error in the console that means that i am getting that error in my custom error handler so the functionality still works so long story short instead of setting up try catch instead of setting up our own middleware we effectively just used a package that does all the work for us and as a result we can eat and have our cake too meaning we get the benefits of just using asynchronous code and we don't need to worry about setting up try catches or our own middleware and the package name that does that for us is async express errors and we simply need to require it in the app js and once we have discussed async errors next let's set up the model and before we go anywhere let me just mention that i will keep this console log just because i want to showcase some stuff here and there but of course if you don't want it you can just remove it or you can maybe pass in the error over here where you have the message like we did in a previous project that is totally up to you now let me just navigate to complete project and you know what i'll make this one all the way on the left and what i want to showcase is that of course we have the products and what do the products have well they have some kind of properties correct they have featured rating created that and of course you can read the rest 
And in order to set it up, what are we going to need? We'll need a schema, correct? And using schema, we'll set up a nice structure for our data. And we already know how to do that. So of course, we just need to create a model. And therefore, we'll right away have a models folder. And in there, we just have the empty product JS. And in here, we need to start by getting the mongoose. And of course, I'm looking for my mongoose package. So we go here with the require. And we're looking for the mongoose. Then we want to go with our schema. And I'm going to call this product schema. So that's going to be the structure for my product. And I'll set it equal to new mongoose. And then, of course, I'm looking for the schema. And then in here, we want to pass in the object. And this is where we'll set up the properties. So this is going to be a good refresher on how we can set up the properties as well as the validations. And the properties I want to set up are following. I want to first go with name. And now we'll have a type of string. Then we want to go with required. And remember, we had multiple options. And one of them was setting this up as an array. And the first value, of course, is going to be true or false. And then the second one will be that custom error message. And here we go with product name must must be provided. And then in order to save a little bit of time, I'll just grab this whole thing, copy and paste at least once. And then the second property I want to set up is the price. And of course, this will be a number. So let's go over here, say number. And then as far as the error message, let's just say product price must be provided. After that, we want to set up a feature property. And we simply do that by going with featured. That's the name of the property. Again, we'll set it up as an object. And then type is going to be equal to our Boolean. And then by default, we'll just say that all the products are not featured. So that way, of course, we don't need to worry about whether the product is featured or not. We simply set all of them as false. Then we want to go with rating. Now, of course, if you do provide featured as true, then of course, it will be featured. But by default, all of them will be false. Hopefully that is clear. Then we want to go with rating. And that one will be equal to a number. So we're going to go here with type number. And let's just say that as far as default value, it's going to be 4.5. Again, if the number is provided, of course, that value will be set up as far as the rating. But if there is no number, then there is a default value. And then we want to go with created at. So essentially, this is just going to be a date when this product was created. And what's really cool that in Mongoose, we can use date type, and we can actually set the current time. And we do that by creating the property created at, we set it as an object. And then inside of the object, let's go with type, and then date. And then if we want to set up the current time, we simply go with default. And then we go with date dot and then we invoke now. So now, of course, every time we'll create that new product, if we don't supply the created that by default is just going to be a current time. And then we have company and company is a little bit interesting, where essentially, if you take a look, of course, we have the name for the company. But when you're adding the products, what we want to do is set up some kind of guardrails where we can only provide specific companies. And if you're interested how that would look like in a real project, so imagine the scenario, you have the products. And then as far as the companies, these are your possible values. That's it. It's not like I'm just going to randomly add here Trader Joe's or Lucky Donuts or something along those lines. And the way we can set that up in Mongoose is following where we need to go with company here. And of course, I'll set it up as an object. Then as far as the type, yes, it's going to be a string. But if I want to limit the possible options for this property, then we go with enum property. And then in this array, we provide those options. And in here, of course, you can provide whatever values you want. Now, I strongly suggest adding the same values as me, because in the next video, we'll dynamically populate our database. And if your values will differ, then of course, you might get the bugs and companies that I chose are following. So I went with Ikea, or in some places of the world, they're also called Ikea. 
which is very, very weird. And then let me check the other ones. So I have this one. Then let's keep scrolling. I have this one. And you know what? In order to avoid confusion, I'm just going to avoid actually pronouncing them. Then we have this one. And then let's add a comma again, copy and paste. And of course, in here, I added those double quotation marks, which is probably not something I want. And then I have the last one. Let's keep on scrolling this one over here. So those are the four values that I chose. And again, for your own projects, you can set it up however you would like. But since we'll be adding those products dynamically in the next video, so we don't need to add them one by one, I strongly suggest using the same values. Now, what's also really, really cool is the fact that we can set up a custom error message if the value doesn't match any of these items in the list. And the way we do that is actually following where I'll comment this out just so it stays for your reference. And we actually set it up as an object here. And then as far as the possible values, we go with values property. And of course, we still use the same values. And when it comes to custom error message, we go with message. And then in order to access the value that the user is providing, meaning the one that it's coming in with our request, the syntax is following where we go with curlies and then value. So essentially, that will access whatever the user is providing. And then we want to go with some kind of message. And in my case, I'm just going to say he is not supported. And once we save, we have our scheme ready to go. So now, of course, we just want to set up our model. So we're going to go here, module exports, and we'll set it equal to mongoose model. And then as far as the name, I'm going to go with product. And then I want to pass in my schema, which of course is the product schema. So product schema over here. And once we save, we're ready to move on to our next task. And once we have our schema and model in place, before we can start setting up any kind of functionality, of course, we need to have data. Otherwise, how are you going to set up any kind of filtering if you have no product in a database. And effectively, we have two choices. You either can set up a post route and then just manually add them, or a better approach is just to automate this and essentially just have some kind of list and pass it on to the database. Now, lucky for you, if you take a look at our project, you'll notice the product JSON. And essentially, this is just a list of product just so we can start working on the filter functionality. And the only thing we need to do is set up populate JS, where we'll dynamically add all of these values to our database. So instead of going the manual route, where one by one, we add them, we'll right away, just add them to our database by actually invoking the populate JS. And the way it's going to look like we're going to go over here, We'll first grab our dot env. So let's say over here dot env. Then we want to go with config. And then what's really interesting that we need to have another connection. So yes, we have one for app.js. Of course, that still stays the same. But since we want to connect to the database one more time, we'll have to grab that connect function as well. And here I'm just going to go with const connect db. Of course, that is coming from where that is coming from our DB holder, correct? So we go here with DB, and then more specifically connect. And that's the first thing we want to grab. Then we want to grab the model. And you'll see why. And we just need to come up with a name. And in my case, I'm going to go with product. And then of course, we're requiring that it is coming from the models, and then more specifically product. And then lastly, I want those JSON products because that's the data that I'm going to be passing on to the database. So here we need to come up with a name. In this case, I think I'm going to go with JSON products and we'll set it equal to require. And where's the file is actually sitting right next to us. So we'll just go with forward slash and then we're looking for product JSON. And once we have all of this in place, we want to set up that start function one more time. Or in this case, of course, we're not going to be setting up app.listen. We simply want to connect to the database 
and then use the model to automatically add those JSON products, the one that we have in the file to our database. And the way it's going to look like we're going to go here with const and start and we'll set it equal to a sync. And in here, we'll set up another try catch like so. So let's go try catch. And of course, eventually we'll invoke it here as well. And then I want to go with my await. Then we want to pass in the connect DB. And of course, inside of the connect DB, we'll pass in the process dot env and of course our variable. So Mongo and then underscore URI. And just because I want to see whether we're going to get some weird bugs, I'm also going to type in the catch a log. So we'll go over here with log and then we're going to be looking for the error. And once we have all of this in place, we can at least try the connection. Now there's still some code that's missing, but we'll get to it in no time. So first, what I want to do is stop the server over here. And then we just want to go with the start, invoke it. And then in this case, I'm not looking for the node man. I'll simply go with node. And then of course, I'm looking for the file name. So since I'm already in a starter, I just need to write populate. And then once we run it, if our connection again is successful, we shouldn't see any errors in the console. Now, if you want to help yourself out, of course, you can just type here log and let's just say success or something along those lines. So let's say here success and then exclamation point. Let's save it one more time. Again, let's stop it. And if you remember from tutorial, in order to go back to the last command, we simply press arrow key up or down. In my case, I'm going to press it down and check it out. Now, of course, we have the success. So we successfully connected to the database. Now, if I want to check out the error, I'll comment out the dot env. Stop the server one more time. Sorry about the detour, but these things are important. And then once we run it, of course, we're not successful connecting to the database because the URI parameter is not provided. Awesome. So let me uncomment the dot env, then clear everything. And once we have successfully connected to our database, there's two things that I want to do. First, I want to remove all the products that are currently there. And then I want to use the create and just pass in the JSON product. So if you remember in a previous setup, and I think I'm just going to go for final and let me look for controllers and tasks. Notice here, this create, we passed here a object, correct? When we were creating that task. Now, what we can also do is pass in the array. So if you take a look at the product, and I'm sorry, not this one, products JSON, you'll notice that this is an array at the end of the day. And then since this is an array, what I can do, I can just pass this in into the dot create. And then by doing so, of course, I'll add all of these products to our database. So let's try it out. Let me navigate to the populate one. I have the JSON product. I'm in good shape. So now let me go below the await, but before the success, and in here, I want to go with await. Now I'm not waiting for the actual response. And I want to go with my model because model has all those functions. And then we want to go with delete many. So now I just want to remove all the products that are currently there. Of course, in our case, there are no products, but I'm just making sure that later, if you want to reuse it, then whatever gibberish you added or whatever data you currently have, you just remove it and then you start from the scratch. This is technically optional. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But in my case, I always like to start with the scratch. And then we want to go with await and then product, product, and then remember the function create. So now we're just dynamically creating a bunch of products by passing in JSON products. That's all we have to do here. We go with JSON product. And now let's try it one more time. And then of course, we'll double check in our application. So in here, I'm going to go back to my console. And then I want to go with node and populate. And if I'll see the success, then I know that I'm heading in the right direction. So now let me just go back to my Atlas one. Let me refresh. And now where I have my collections, I should have more values. And effectively, I have the store API. Awesome. 
and in here i have of course all the products now i'm not sure how many i set up it really doesn't matter if you see these products added to your database now of course we can start finally setting up our filter functionality and while we're still on topic actually know there is a method by the name of exit now why that would be useful in our case because well let's think about it so we have our populate js if we're successful then we might as well just terminate the whole process correct i mean we don't need this file to be running and if there is an error then again we'll exit but maybe with a error code and the way we set up the process.exit is simply by navigating to the start here and then probably right after the success we'll set up a process again that is that global variable that we have access to then we go with exit and that's the method name and then if we pass in zero that just means that everything went well and we just exiting the process however if i take the exit method and pass it in and of course in this case since i'm running it in the catch i want to pass in error code i'll pass in one and then let's do it one more time i'll clear everything and i'll not test it out with an error but let's just go here with node populate and now you'll notice that once we're successful we actually exit the process why well because we have process.exit and of course the code in this case that we passed in is zero and if you want to double check your data just navigate back to the atlas and you'll see that all your product data is still there and once we have dynamically added products to our database i think i can just close the popular js at least in my case i'm not going to use it anymore the same goes for product js and then rest of the work will pretty much do over here in the controllers and the first thing that i want to showcase actually this is a refresher where essentially if we want to search for a product in a mongoose meaning for some kind of items in our case of course that is product well we need to go with find method correct so let's just go over here i'm in the mongoose docs and i'm looking for the queries and then we keep on scrolling keep on scrolling in this case they show the find one example but the idea effectively is the same that if you go with find and of course if you pass in the mp object then you'll get all the documents and of course in the object you can also pass in some options and if you go with property then you just need to provide what value you are looking for so in our case if we take a look at our model over here in the product js well these are all our properties correct whether that's name price featured and yada 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 so in here let me start up my server and then back in the product js i want to get the model because of course we'll go over the basics first where i'll start by just getting the product and that is equal to require and i'm looking for my model again so i'll go two levels up and then i'm looking for the models and then the product and then let's start in the static one so i'll do a little bit of work here i'll show you the manual approach and then in get all products well this is where we'll set up the real functionality the one that we'll use in our project and then we already know the async errors so that's good and now let's just start by saying const product and simply let's take a look if we pass in the empty object so in here let's go with await and then product that's the name of the model and then find and like i said let's just pass in the empty object and then instead of the message i'm just going to go here with product and then let's test it out in a postman so i'll go back to my testing one i'll send it and i should see my array of products and if that is the case then of course we're heading in the right direction now if i want to be more specific if i want to say hey get me the product where the company is equal to this one or get me the product where the name is equal to this one or maybe get me only the featured one then of course we simply need to go back here and where we have the object well i can say featured featured and then this is going to be equal to what true or false so let's just pass in true and then let's run it one more time 
And what you'll notice in your static route, only the products that are featured are going to be displayed. And you know what? I think in this case, it is going to be very helpful if I'm just going to go with those number of hits and I'll set it equal to my array because that way you can right away see if you're getting the correct set of data. So let's go over here. And in this case, it says something went wrong. And of course, because for some reason, I decided to add number of hits in the find. And this is actually something that I'll cover later, why we get those errors and how to avoid them. So let me remove it. This was pretty much an early taste, what kind of errors we're going to have. So let me run it over here where I have the JSON response. So don't be like me, be better than me. And don't pass it into the find, pass it actually where you're sending the response. And let's go back over here. Let's send. And of course, I have the products and all the way in the bottom I'll have number of hits is equal to seven. And if you'll take a look, you'll see that all the products have featured set to true. And you can probably already imagine that if I'm just going to go here with name, and of course, we can combine them. And again, this is something that we'll cover in more detail in next video. So therefore, I'll remove it. And I'll just start with the scratch, I'll say name is equal to whatever I have here. My apologies, I copied the wrong thing. If I have multiple tables, and for some reason, I just want to look for this one, I can just pass in the value where I say, yeah, get me the product, but the name property needs to have this value. And now, of course, once we send, I should get only one. because That's the only one that has the matching name. Hopefully we're clear on a basic setup. So now, of course, we can start implementing the get all products where the setup is going to be more complex than just hard coding the name or any of the other property values. All right, I think we're solid on filter functionality. So now let's spice things up and implement the dynamic approach, since it's highly unlikely that we'll send our responses based on hard coded filter values. And first, let's start with our requests, more specifically query params, because that's how we will get our data. And in order to jog your memory on query string params, let's go back to my favorite API, at least for this course. Uh, of course, the API is Hacker News by Algolia API. And once we navigate here, once we start scrolling and everything, and looks like I'll have to refresh, you can see that, of course, we can get the items, we can provide the route params, that's clear. But if we keep on scrolling, notice, of course, now we can start searching for some data. And how do they set up the search? Well, they have the domain, then of course, they have some kind of endpoint that ends with search. And then they have a question mark. And after the question mark, we have key value pairs, which essentially are query string parameters. And then of course, based on what you're looking for, whether you want to set the query, or you want to look for a different page, then you pass in the value and hopefully you get the correct result. And as far as our setup, we first need to understand how we can send those query string parameters from the postman, correct? So let me open up the postman. And then of course, I'm going to be looking for get all products. So I'll just leave the testing one as it is. So essentially, in there, we'll just hard code all the time. But back in get all products, not only I'm going to be looking for the product, but I can go with question mark. And then of course, I can add key value pairs. Now we have two options. Either you can type it here. For example, you could say name is equal to john. And notice how right away, they're being added in this table as well. So that's the second option, where if you don't want to do it in the URL, you can just set it up over here. And what's really cool, you can actually check and uncheck them. And what that means is that if I go here with john, and then of course, I send again the name, and if I don't want to send it, then I can just remove it. And if I want to take a look at the featured ones, and of course, this is going to be featured. And as far as featured, I want to start with true. And then once we send, of course, now we just get back the message. But if we take a look at our controller, we should have access to those key value pairs in rec.query. So let's test it out. I'm going to go with simple console log, just so we can see that we're getting the data. And it is sitting in rec and query. And let's do it one more time from the postman. So let's send it again. We get back the hard coded result. But 
take a look at our console. Of course, I can see that I have the object. And then in there, I have key value pairs with whatever I'm setting up in a postman. And once we have jogged our memory on query string parameters, now we simply want to go back to the postman. And I'll just use the featured. And I'll show you in a second why I want to do that. And then I'll send it, of course. And if I take a look at my app, of course, now I only have featured. So now let's set up the logic where I'll remove the console log. And then we'll still be looking for the product. And we'll use the find, of course. But in this case, instead of hard coding, instead of setting up the object and then passing in whatever key and then the value, of course, we'll pass in directly reg.query. Now we will refactor the code because there are some gotchas we need to be aware of. But with the most basic setup, we'll pass the query directly into the find. And let's hope that we'll get some results. So let's start the same way. We'll go with const products. And that is equal to await and then product, then dot find. And like I said, we'll directly pass in rec and query. And of course, once I get back the results, I want to also send them. And then in this case, I'm going to remove the message. And I'll just say the same thing where I'll pass in the product as well as the length of my array. So that way I know how much I'm sending. So let me go back and then one more time from the postman. And again, the route is forward slash product, not the testing one. And now I just pass in featured because that is one of the keys that I have. And as far as the value, I go with true. And then once we send, check it out. Now, of course, we have the product and the amount of items is equal to seven. So if I'll change this to false, now, of course, I'll get a different set of values. Again, let's just quickly cover the logic where we have access to query string parameters in reg.query. And since we get back the object, we can directly pass it into the find one. And then since in this case, I'm looking for featured and I'm setting it equal to true, that of course returns only the products that are featured. And then if we pass in a false, then of course we'll get only the products where featured is set to false. Not bad, not bad. I think our basic setup works pretty nice. However, there are some gotchas we need to be aware of. What do you think is going to happen if in a query string params, we're going to pass in some kind of value that doesn't match any of the values that we have currently in the model. So remember, when we're setting up the model, we have name, price, featured, and yada, yada, yada. But what happens if I send with my request a page, which essentially we will do, because that's one of the functionalities we want to add. And I guess the best way to showcase that is just by going back to the postman. And here, of course, I still have featured set to false. Now you can leave it, you can remove it, that's really up to you. What I want you to do is go below featured, and then just add another key value pair. And then in this case, go for something that is not in our data. So in my case, I'm going to go with page because like I said, we we'll use that later anyway. And then you can come up with whatever value you want. And of course, I want to check it here. And also, as a side note, just notice the syntax. So if you're going to be setting this up manually in the URL, just remember that in between them, you need to add this ampersand. Of course, Postman is already doing that for us. But if you're setting this manually, just don't forget. So now once I send, check it out. Of course, I have no values. Why? Well, if I navigate back and take a look at my products, what happens over here? Well, I pass in rec.query directly, correct? And without even console logging, we already know that we have a object with featured set to true or false. That is really irrelevant. And then we're looking for a page with some kind of value. Now, Mongoose, of course, is like, well, listen, I don't have any products where there is a page property, and that is actually set to two, one, or whatever. So therefore, if I go back and if I do the same thing with the testing one, again, I'll have zero values back. So hopefully that is clear. So yes, this probably is going to work with the most basic setup. But then as you're filtering 
get more complex, there has to be a better approach. And that better approach is for starters, pulling out only the properties you want to apply to define. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to go to const, then I'll do structure from reg.query. And in my case, I'm just going to be looking for a feature. Of course, eventually we'll add more values, but for the time being, I'm only looking for featured. So I can add 10,000 more items in here in the query. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to be looking for featured. And if feature is set to true, then I'll add it to define. And once we have successfully pulled out the feature out of the query, so now, of course, we're only going to be looking for this value. Instead of passing this directly into a find, a better approach is actually to set up a new object. So in here, I'm going to go with const and I'll call this query object. And that is equal to a new object. And now I'll use the if and I'll say if featured is true, then what I want to do is to set up a new property in this query object. So in my new object, I want to set up a new property by the name of featured. So let's go over here. Let's say query object featured. That's the property name. And in here, I'm going to use the ternary operator where I'll say if the featured is set to true, then of course, I'll set this property equal to true. If not, then of course, it's going to be false. So let's go with featured. And then we're checking for true. So let's say over here, true. Now, of course, we use ternary operator. And then if this is true, then we set it equal to true. If not, then of course, we go with false. And once I have this logic, I'll save. And then instead of passing reg dot query, what we'll do, we'll pass in the query object. And then since I want us to be on the same page, I'm just going to go with console log. And you'll notice that first, we only set featured. So we're not going to be setting the page. And we'll only do that if it is actually passed into the query. So if it doesn't exist, so if the user doesn't send featured, then of course, this logic won't be applied. And of course, this is just going to be an empty object. And then we get all the items. So let's test out one more time. So now, of course, I'm going to go back to all the products and let's send. And now, of course, I get back the value of 16 because I'm looking for all the products that are not featured. But notice how the page is not messing everything up. So in here, I can clearly see, yep, featured is there. The value is equal to false. And this is the object that I'm passing into define. But if we have a different request, for example, if there is no feature and the user is only looking for the page, of course, we're not handling the page functionality. We'll work on that later. But for time being, what happens? We get all the products. Why? Well, because we have empty object. So hopefully this makes sense. Instead of passing directly reg.query, we set up a new object. And first, we just pull out the properties we're interested. So in my case, I'm going to be looking for featured, I'm going to be looking for name later on. And hopefully you get the gist. And then we'll check if the property is actually coming in with a request. Awesome. We'll set up a new property on our query object. And then of course, there's also going to be some kind of functionality. In this case, it was just straight up turning operator. And then instead of passing that property directly, we'll pass in the entire query object. And that way, of course, we can avoid that bug that I showed you in the beginning of the video. Wonderful. Once we have the general structure in place, so effectively, once we have the empty object, and then we check for the properties that correspond to whatever we have in the model, now, of course, we can continue and add more functionality to our API. Correct. So we want our user to search based on name, maybe also based on price, as well as rating and company and all that. Now I can tell you right away that we will purposely work on the number values. So the price and rating and all that a little later, because probably that's going to be the most complex logic of this project. For now, I want to work on name and company. Now, company should be somewhat straightforward, where we're going to check for the company. So say, hey, is the company property on my reg.query? And of course, then 
we'll set up the value in the object. And if, of course, we can find something, then we're in good shape. If not, then of course, we return nothing. So let's go back. And the first thing that I want to do is, of course, pass it from my postman. So in here, I'll remove the page. Hopefully, it is clear what happens with the properties that are actually not on our model. And then let's set up a new one. And here I'll say company, company. And as far as the values, well, let me check since it's going to be faster. So let's say I'm going to go with this one, copy and paste. And now I'm going to look for both. I'll say, hey, get me where the featured is false and company is this one. So let me send it here. And now what you should see is only the product that matches company. Now, of course, not yet, but that is the eventual goal. So let me navigate back and notice again, we only get the featured. Why? Because that's my logic. So let's go back over here. And let's say that we're also going to be looking for the company. Again, not to be redundant, because this company corresponds to something we have already in the model. Otherwise, we'll have that mess where Mongoose is going to be like, hey, listen, what's happening? I cannot find anything. But then, of course, we want to set up the logic. And this is going to be as straightforward as it gets, where essentially, I'm going to say, if the company exists, then of course, I just want to set up my property on a query object. And the name, of course, will be company. And I'll set it equal to my company, the one that I'm pulling out of here. So once I save, and once we try one more time, we should get different amount of values. And of course, in this case, we get only six. So now we get featured false and company is equal to Ikea. Now, if I'm going to pass in some kind of gibberish, if I'm going to say that I'm looking for a company BBB, of course, I'm going to get zero results. But that's what we expected. So if we're looking for something that doesn't make sense, yes, of course, the user is not going to be successful. But if the user provides correct company value, then of course, we send back the list of products that correspond to that value. And if you're wondering, well, where the user is going to know that info. Well, that's why we have documentation. So if you go back to this API, you can see how they clearly explain what are our options, and essentially how we can work with the API. So now, of course, in our API, we handle two things, we handle featured, and we also handle the company. And once we have the first two down, I think we already understand the pattern. So let's try to do the same thing with the name. And we'll start with the most basic setup, where essentially, I'm going to go with a name, and then whatever value I'm passing in, meaning in the query, and then eventually, we'll come up with more complex setup, where we have the rejects, because at the moment, we need to understand that, of course, with our most basic setup, we're only going to be looking for the products whose name matches exactly. Now, what am I talking about? Well, let me go back to the static one. Let me send it from here. And I just essentially want to get one of the names. And I'll look for this one. And what you'll notice that with the most basic setup, effectively, we'll get only the product whose name matches exactly. So if I go here, and if I send, of course, now I get only one product. But if I mess it up here, meaning if I just pass in the first value, you'll notice that actually we get nothing. So yes, it's a good starting point where the value needs to match exactly. But then, of course, we'll make it more complex and add rejects to the mix, because that way we'll be able to just pass in some kind of text values and we'll get the product where that value is somewhere in a name. So after my long rambling, let me just go back over here where we have get all products. And what is the property that we're going to be looking for? Of course, that is the name. And there's also something that I want to mention where nothing stops you from setting up your own API and saying here that you're going to be looking for the search, for example, like they have in the hackers news API. Nothing stops you. It doesn't mean that these properties need to match exactly. Now, of course, I'm setting it up this way because it's much more easier later when I'm setting up the object properties. So these ones definitely need to match whatever we have in a database. But as far as what values we're looking from the query, this is really up to you. And again, just to showcase that notice, 
how they in here use query. So we can definitely set up our own API with a query or search or whatever. The only reason why I'm using the name is because it's just going to be easier when I'm setting up here in the object. Hopefully that is clear. And then let's keep scrolling and we'll start, like I said, with the most basic setup where I'll say if the name exists, then I want to go with my query object, of course, name property, and that one will be equal to the name. So let me swing back to the postman. And again, now we'll switch to get all products. And since I'm just going to get one value, since at the moment, my name is going to match exactly, I'll remove these ones, I'll remove featured and company. And you know what, let me go to complete project. And that way I can get the name right away. And once I have the name, now, of course, I'm going to be looking for the product. And we want to add a new key. And in here, I'll call this a name. And then I'm going to be looking for this value. And then once I send, of course, now I'll get that one product. And if we take a look at our query object, of course, this is what we have. So we have a name. And of course, whatever value I passed in. And since I have one product that matches that, that's exactly what we get. But if you take a look at the Mongo's documentation, you'll notice that they have these query operators. Now, this one we'll use a little later when we set up our numeric filters. But with a name, I actually want to set it up as rejects. And since Mongo's is sitting on top of MongoDB, we can get those query operators from the Mongo documentation. So let's search for MongoDB query operators. Then let's navigate here. And as you can see, we have a long list of the operators. Now the one that we're looking for is this one, the rejects one. And essentially, the setup is following where we go with rejects. And then we have a bunch of options. Now the one that we'll use is just case insensitive. And then of course, we just need to pass in the pattern. So let me try it out back in our application. And I think I'm going to start with a static one, just so I can show you the setup. And then of course, we'll set up the more complex one as well. So let me go here. And I'll scroll above where I have the static product. And I'll just set up some kind of value. Now, since I'm not going to be passing this with the query, just understand that eventually, of course, the value will be coming from the query. So in here, I'm just going to say const. And let's call this search. And I'll just type a a a. Now, where I'm looking for the name, instead of just passing in the value directly, we'll set it equal to an object. And then the setup is following where we go with dollar sign. And then I'm looking for that rejects query operator. And then as far as the value, I'll pass in the search again, eventually, it's going to be coming from our query here. And then I also want to set up the options. And therefore, I'm going to go with dollar sign. And then I'll pass in the options. And I'll set options equal to I. And you know, what? instead of three A's, why don't we go with just one? So let's save it over here. Again, the way it works, we're looking for name property. But instead of looking for entire name, instead, we go with rejects, where essentially, we're just looking for the pattern. And the way we set it up, we go with rejects operator, then we pass in the variable, which of course, again, is going to be coming from our query. And then we have the options. And in this case, I pass in I, which just means for case insensitive. And once we navigate back to the postman and run it, you'll notice that, of course, I'll get all the items where there is at least a A. And then if we're going to go with a B, now, of course, we're going to be getting a different value. So now, of course, I only have five. Now, in order to set it up in get all products, what do we need to do? We need to look for name. We are already doing that. And then where we have here, if name exists, and then query object name, we simply need to change this around, where again, you want to go with this one instead. And in order to speed this up, I'm just going to copy and paste. Let's scroll down. And let's just say that if name exists, then of course, we'll use the rejects instead. Now, in this case, of course, the search doesn't exist, correct? So we need to go with name. So if you need to pause it here, and write it from the scratch, please do so. Because in my case, of course, I saved a little bit of time and just use the one from the static. So once we save, again, 
I'm purposely leaving this one just so you can see what is coming in. And if we hop back to all the products, and of course, now I'm just going to go with some kind of text value that is less than the entire name. In this case, I'm going to go with E. Then I will look for the company. And why don't we keep the same one over here? And then I'll also look for featured and false. And notice how slowly but surely now we can search for more options. So in this case, I'm looking for featured set to false company equal to Ikea. And then of course, E in the name, I'm looking for E. So I'm looking for the product where E is in the name. And then once I send, check it out. Now, of course, I have six of them. And if you'll double check, you'll notice that definitely E is in the name. The featured is set to false. And of course, company matches to the one that we have in a query string parameters. Beautiful. At this point, our users have three options for filtering, featured, company, and of course, the name. Eventually, we'll set up numeric filters as well. But like I mentioned previously, since it's probably going to be the most complex thing in this project, at least in my opinion, we'll implement that last. For now, I want to switch gears and show you how we can sort our data first in a final project, then the general mongoose setup. And then of course, we'll implement it in our get products as well. And something to keep in mind, sorting does not affect the amount of items we're returning, just the order in which they are displayed. So let me navigate to my final project. And then as far as the sorting, notice right now, I'm just getting them based on a date when they were created. And of course, since we added them dynamically, meaning we pass in the entire batch, that's why, of course, pretty much all of them are with the same date. But if I want to sort them based on a name, what do I need to do? Well, I need to go to the URL bar because, of course, I'm not in the postman. And then I go with question mark. And then I just need to decide which property I want to use. And first, I want to go with sort. And then let me zoom out a little bit. And of course, we either can go with name, we can go with company, we can go with also price and all that. So let's just start here with the name. And then once I pass it in, again, I'm going to get 10 values because I already have the limit there. But you'll notice that the companies or I'm sorry, the products are going to be in the alphabetical order. So this is going to be my first one, then I have the second one, and on and on and on. Now, if you want to sort them the opposite way, meaning, of course, now we go from A to Z, but if you want to sort them Z to A, let me zoom in here. And then you just want to pass in the negative sign here. So where you have the name, so that's going to be that parameter that you're using. And then if you pass in the negative, now you'll notice that the first value is the wooden table instead. Hopefully that is clear. Now what we can also do is chain them together. So for example, not only I want to look at the name, but I want to also look at the price. Why would I want to do that? Well, if I take a look at these ones, where I have wooden desk, notice how the name is exactly the same. Correct. And the only difference between them is the price. So if I add here a comma, and then I say that I'm also going to be sorting based on a price. And since I don't add the negative, I'm just going to be looking for the smallest value first. Notice now I have the wooden desk with $15 first, and then I have one for 40. And you can probably already guess, and I'm sorry for all this zooming in and zooming out, but I just think that it's important that you see everything that I type here. If we go with negative, then of course, what is going to happen? Well, we'll have wooden desk, but the largest value is first. Now, of course, I can just sort based on price, then I just remove the name. And then if I go with price, notice again, we start with the smallest value. And then you already know what happens if we pass in the negative. Now, as far as the setup, let's just go to the mongoose. And I'm actually here where we have the queries. And I'm looking for, I believe it was over here. Yeah. So general queries, not find or find by the or any of these functions, just general queries, keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. And then in here, they'll showcase two options 
that you can use now not for sorting but in general for filtering we have two options and we are using this one where essentially we set up the entire json but you also have this approach available as well and this is again just for your knowledge now what we're interested in is this notice after defined what do we see over here we see a limit sort and select and notice how they're chained after defined so first we set up our filter object correct and we passed into define but when it comes to limit sort and select we actually need to chain them after define and this is going to become really important a little later on when we work with get all products so first i just want to show you the manual approach where we just go with sort but then when we set up all the products the fact that we need to chain them is going to be very very important so let me navigate back to our project and let's just start with the static approach so I'll remove the search one not going to be looking for name and in order to make it interesting essentially i'm just going to pass in the empty object just so i can get all the product and then remember inside of the method i want to go with string and i want to pass in the name so i'll start simply with the name so if we navigate to the postman again the static now and if we send a request notice of course our response is going to be in the alphabetical order meaning we'll start with a and all the way to w at the very very end and as you can see i have 23 products now if i'll change this around and if i'll say negative here then of course once we send check it out now of course we start with the wooden table and the same goes if i want to go with price and the syntax is following where we want to create a space and then we type in whatever property we're looking for so in this case again we go with a name but it's going to be z to a and then we'll set up the price and of course that is going to be from the smallest to the biggest value let me go back to the postman let me send and of course i start with a w correct but my price for the ones that actually match is going to be the smallest one first so the smallest price first and then the largest one hopefully that is clear hopefully we understand how we can set up a basic sort so now of course we just need to implement that in get all products nice and once we're familiar with general info now of course let's implement that in get all products and we'll start the same way we'll have to pull this out out of the query since i'm interested in that particular property and of course the property that i'm going to be looking for is the sort one so if the sort is in the query then of course we're good to go but here comes the biggest gotcha where if we take a look at our code right now we are awaiting for this one to complete correct and essentially when we go with this fine one we get back a query object but remember in order to sort we need to chain this correct we first go with find and then if we want to implement sort we need to chain it right after find now here's the problem though in my current setup yeah technically i can go here with sort but again remember there might be a scenario where user is not passing in the sort so we want to do that conditionally and the issue here is following where you can say all right so i'm just going to go with let products and then i'll remove the sort from here and then i'm just going to go with if and then sort exists then of course i'll set products product equal to products and then of course sort and then pass in the value but the problem is following where since we have this await actually here in the product we don't have any more that query object that is going to be returned from the fine one we actually already get that list of products so what i'm trying to say that in order for this functionality to work where we actually are chaining the sort if of course it is passed in by the user we need to remove this await and the way it's going to look like instead of setting up the products here we'll go with let result and then of course we'll have multiple conditions 
in this case, of course, we'll start with sword, but then there's also going to be one for fields, and we'll also set up the pagination. Hopefully, that is clear, and only then at the very end we'll get the product. So we're going to go below the conditions at the moment we have only sword, but make sure that it is always sitting at the very, very end. And of course, in here, I'm just going to go const product is equal to my result. And of course, I want to await for it. So I'm going to say here, await, and then I'll remove this one. So hopefully this is clear, where instead of sticking the await over here, since we'll chain the sort and fields and limit and all that at the very end of the query object that we're getting back. That's why we need to remove this await because this right away returns those documents and then set up the await when we have the complete result. And I think at this point I can comment out the query object and I think I'll uncomment it once we start working on numeric filters. And now let's just work with this sort one. So for starters, let's just see what we're getting back because that way we'll have a better understanding of what kind of functionality we need to set up. So let me just check it here, a sort, and then we want to go back to the postman. We're not working in a static one. We want to go to all the products. And again, since I want to get more data, I'm just going to remove. Just keep in mind that, of course, you can still keep them. You can still keep these query params as well because you will get the correct data. I mean, we saw that we're getting six hits, but since I want to have more products, I'll just remove them temporarily and we'll come up with a new key. And in this case, I'll say sort. So let's set it up here, sort. And then as far as the values, let's just start simply like we did with name. And once we send, let's just go back. And of course, now I can see that as far as my value, I have my name. Now, technically, we can right away set up the sort and effectively we'll chain this to the result. But there's one gotcha that we need to be aware of. If we're sorting based on multiple parameters, then of course, the value that we can see in a console is going to be different. So if I'm going to go here with comma and then price, and you can keep the minus or you can just set up the price, the result is going to be the same, where essentially now we have two values meaning we have one long string, but inside of the string, of course, I have both. I have name and price. And the idea is that maybe the user decides to chain, I don't know, three more, correct? So how we can split them up so we can get the correct values? Because if you'll try to pass this into a sort, remember the syntax is following, where I want to go with a space in between them instead of the comma. So you're not going to be successful. Now, what can we do? Well, we can use the good old JavaScript, where essentially we'll create a variable. I'll call this sort list, and that is equal to sort, and I'll split it. I'll say that I want to split it on a comma, and then I want to join it back together. So essentially, I split it into an array, and then from the array, I join it back together. In this case, however, just with empty spaces. And now what we want to do is to go with a result. Remember, that is the query object that we're getting back from the find. And we want to set it equal to result and then sort. And now we want to pass in this sort list in there. Now, what's also really cool is that we can set up some kind of default one. So let's imagine the scenario where the user hasn't passed in the sort key. But I actually want to sort it based on the time when those items were created. How we can do that? Well, we can simply go with else, else, and in here we'll go with the result, and that is equal to result, of course, again, and we go with sort, and now we'll just hard code the value, just like we did over here. However, which property I'm looking for? Well, let's take a look at our model. All the way in the bottom, we have what? We have created that. Again, since we created all of our projects pretty much at the same time, Technically, you can argue that in our case, it doesn't make much sense. But normally, of course, that's not going to be the case. That's why this is going to work really nicely. Where we go to a result and then sort, and then we pass in the string. And I'm looking for created at. And then once we save, our functionality should be working. So let me try it out. I'm going to go over here. 
I have the sort one. Okay, awesome. And then once we send, of course, we start with a product that start with a and then of course, as you can see, we get the rest all the way to w. But if I'll change this around, and I'll say that I want to go the opposite direction, of course, we can send the request. Notice again, we have those two that have the same exact name. But since we go here with this minus price, that's why we start with the highest value. So effectively, we have the descending order. But if we'll change this around, of course, we'll have the ascending order instead. So that's how we can add the sort functionality to our API. And once the sort functionality is in place, next, I want to showcase how we can select certain fields. And I think the easiest way for me to show you that is going to the final project. And then I'm just going to go with fields. So that's the key. Please keep in mind that's something that I made up. The actual method name is different. It is select. But in the query variables, we set up fields. So this is just going to showcase which fields we want to see. And as far as the values, the same as with sort, we simply need to pass here the properties that are in our schema. And in my case, since I want to see only the name property and only the price, I'll type name price and hopefully you get the gist. If you want to see some other properties, just add comma and then the actual property. So let's go over here. And now, of course, you can see that in my response, I only have the ID, which is going to be by default, as well as the name and the price. And if we take a look at the docs, we can see that the method name is select. And again, we have these multiple options where if you want to go with just string, you can simply say select and then pass in the properties. So let's try it out in our static one. So let's move up. We have the sort. I think I'm going to remove the sort for now. And we'll just say select. And then in here, I'll do the same thing. I'll say name and price. And once we go back to the postman, which is always tough because it's all the way on the left hand side, then I keep forgetting that. Now, of course, notice our response only has these two properties. It has the two fields of name and price. And if we want to implement that in get all products, what do we need to do? Well, first, we need to come up with a name in a query string. Again, this is what I said before, where when it comes to the query string, you are setting this up because you'll tell the user in docs, hey, if you want to search for certain fields, then you need to add this property in the query string parameter. If you decide that you'll call this shake and bake, you're in charge. You can definitely do so. Now, in my case, I'm not going to be such a rebel. I'm just going to go with fields. Then we're going to keep on scrolling and right after this sort. And you know, what? at this point, I think it's going to be very useful if I add some comments here and then right after sort, but before the product, we'll check for the fields again. We'll say if the fields exist, then we'll do the same thing where we want to split them up and of course, join them back together in the process. We'll remove that comma. And then, of course, we just need to change the select method. So in this case, in order to speed this up, I'm just going to copy and paste. This is now going to be a sort list. We'll call this fields list. And then instead of sort, we're going to be looking for fields. The functionality is going to be exactly the same. We split it up. We join it back together. And then as far as the result, of course, I don't want to sort it anymore. I want to use select and I want to pass in the fields list like so. So we go over here. And then let's navigate to the postman. And of course, in this case, we're not looking for the static one anymore. We want to go with all the products here. And then let's just add both of them together. So I have the sword. I'll keep that one. And then I'll create a new key. I'll call this fields, fields. And then as far as the values, let's just say we're going to be looking for the company. And also, I just want to see the rating over here. So let's pass these two. And of course, we'll notice that we only get the rating as well as the company in our response. All right. And once we have covered how we can select certain fields, next, I want to show you how we can skip and limit. And by using both of those things, you can actually set up a option for the user 
to choose a page. Now, how's that gonna look like? Well, in our final project, you can go here with limit and then just decide how many products you want to get back. And I believe again, we have 23 products, so of course, if you'll go with 30, then we'll just get all of them. So, just to showcase that notice, of course, now we have 23. But if I'm gonna go with less, so if I'm gonna go with limit and then, for example, four, then of course, I'll get only four items. And if I don't pass anything in, then of course, by default, we'll get 10. That's why we have number of hits, and that is equal to 10. So hopefully that is clear. And as far as getting the correct page, just like they have over here, where you pass in the page, and that is going to return that exact page number, we'll have to combine limit with skip, which is another option we have. And before we go any further, let me just showcase how is that going to look like in our manual setup. So in here, I think I'm going to stick with select. I mean, it can stay there, it doesn't really matter. And then as far as limit, we simply need to go with a method. And again, we chain it. And hopefully by now it's clear that in get all products, we'll have to do that before we await for the result. And then in here, we simply need to pass in the value. So if I want to limit my response here to four, then of course I can go back to the postman. Now I'm looking for the static one. I send it. And of course, I'm only going to get four of them. Now, if this value is going to be bigger than all the items I have, of course, I'm just going to get all the items that I have in my list. And essentially, skip works exactly the same way. But the difference is that it just skips the first items in the response. So let me just limit this by 10. And I'll make sure that we actually sort A to Z. So that way, of course, you can see exactly what we're getting back. So let me go here and I'll chain dot sort. And I'm just going to be looking for the name. And of course, now we have a setup where we're alphabetically sorting our responses as well. And in order to show you how sort works, first, let's take a look at our basic response. So if we go here, notice I'm getting 10 items, correct? Because that is my limit. And then I start with this item. And then I have the next one, next one, next one. So if I'm going to go here with skip, and for starters, I'm just going to say skip one. Notice that, of course, now we start with our second item. So the item that was second in a previous response. And if we keep making skip bigger, you can probably already guess that we're just going to be skipping the items in our response. So now, of course, we right away start with a letter B. And once we understand the manual approach, now, of course, we'll have to implement that in get all products. And the goal is to use skip and limit to set up a pagination functionality. Nice. And once we have discussed limit and skip, now let's see how we can implement them to set up the pagination. And in this case, I'm not going to be looking for those values in reg.query, meaning I'm not going to destructure them because we'll set up the variables with the same name. So I think it's just going to be easier if we'll go with rec query and then the page as well as the limit and all that. So let's just scroll down again. We're working right now in get all products. I'll make this one smaller and we keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling. And then right after the fields, we want to set up three values. We want to go here with const and page. So this is what the user is going to pass in. Same as they have here. Notice we go with page and then we just set up the page number. Now, by default, I do want to set up where we get the first page. That's why you go here with page. And then remember, whatever is coming from the reg.query actually is a string. And again, just to save some time. I'm not going to console log because we did the console logs before and notice page is actually two, correct? But it is a string of two. So of course, before we do anything, we need to turn it into a number. So let me scroll back down. And then I'll do the same thing over here where I scroll to the page. And then we'll start with the number. And then I'll say that I'm going to be looking for rec query. And then the page. Now, if the user doesn't pass the value, then I'll simply use the or operator. And I'm just going to say that it is going to be equal to one. And the same is going to be for the limit. 
I'll say that yes, in the query, there might be a limit. Since again, it's going to be a number, I need to use this number, meaning, since I want this to be a number, but it's going to be a string, we need to go with number, and then we pass in a rec, query, and then limit. And if no limit is passed, then we go with 10. That's why in a complete project, you'll see this one, where by default, essentially, we're just getting back 10 products. Hopefully, we are clear on this one. So if the value is passed in, awesome, we'll use this value. If not, then we have some defaults. And now, of course, we just want to set up the logic. And the way we set up the logic, we go here with const skip, and that is equal to page minus one. And then we multiply this by limit. And I'll show you with actual comment example, just so we are on the same page. So I'll set up the skip. And now, of course, I just want to chain the skip and limit to my result. Remember, we're still working on the result. So once I have all of this functionality in place, then we'll simply go with a result is equal to and then we go with a result. And then we chain the skip, we pass in the skip variable. And then we chain limit. And of course, we pass in the limit variable. Now, it's going to be kind of hard to see in our response. So let me just set up some comments, just so you understand how everything works. So at the moment, we have 23 products, correct? So if I decide to limit my response to only seven items, how many pages I have? Well, we need to divide 23 by seven. And effectively, we'll have four pages. So we'll have seven, seven, seven. So that's going to be 21. And then the last page actually is going to have only two items. So we have total four pages. And the way the logic works is following where the user will pass in some kind of value. So maybe for the page is going to go for two, because remember, by default, it's always going to be one. And then we multiply this by the limit. That's the key over here. So if we just have a default page, we'll have one subtracted by one, of course, that is going to be zero, and then multiplied by the limit, it's still going to be zero. So effectively, we'll skip zero items. And then we'll just limit our response to seven. However, if the user is going to be looking for the second page, then of course, we'll have two minus one. So we'll have value of one, and that is multiplied by the limit. So in this case, since I'm looking for page number two, I'll skip seven over here, and then I'll have the limit of seven. So that's how I can see the second page. And in order to showcase that, let me just go to the static one. And I want to get all the items just so you can see over here. And I think I'll keep this as name and price like so. And I'll sort this based on name. And then let's do the same thing here. So let me send it. This is my entire list. And then if I go to all the products, now let me set it up everything correctly, where I do want to still sort. And I actually want to start, I guess, with a name. And then I'm going to remove the price. I don't really care about that. I think so. I mean, let me just double check. So select Yeah, so I'm only sorting by the name. So let's see, let's see. So we have products, I'm only sorting by the name. And then when it comes to fields, I only want to see name, and then price. And by default, of course, we're only going to get 10, because we already have that limit of 10. So therefore, let me add here limit. And I'm just going to go with a limit of 30. Of course, that is way more than we have the product. So now, of course, I'll have all the products. If I check it out here, I have 23. Now, if I'm going to be looking for page number two, and I'll set up the limit where I want to see only the four items or three or two or whatever, then of course, you'll notice that in here, effectively, we'll just skip whatever items we have in a limit. So in this case, if I go with limit, of two, just to make it simpler. And then if I go for page number two, so here we'll pass in the value of two, you'll notice how we'll skip the first two items. And we'll right away go 
for this one, the Albany sectional. So let me send it here and check it out. Now, of course, we have Albany sectional, and I purposely set them up both the same just so you can see how it works. So now, of course, we're looking at this page. And as I'm changing the limit, I'll be changing how many items I'm getting back and how many items I'm skipping. And then when it comes to page, of course, it affects the amount of items we're skipping as well. Because if I go with three, then of course, we will skip two times whatever is the limit. And those are the items we're skipping. And of course, that is going to return us that third page. All right, we're almost done with the project functionality. The only thing left is to set up numeric filters, or in other words, provide a option for the user to search based on the number condition. For example, get only the product where the price is more than 30 or less than 30. And hopefully you get the gist. But since there's going to be quite a bit of logic, I will split this up in multiple videos. And hopefully that way, you won't be overwhelmed. Now just to showcase how is that going to look like, I'm going to go to my final project. And in here, I want to go with numeric filters. And of course, I'll explain why we have this type of key. And then we want to go with whatever property we want. But of course, it will make more sense if we're just going to go with the properties that actually have numbers as values. So in our case, of course, we have price, and then we'll go greater than and then of course, we'll pass in the value. So since I'm not using sort, it's probably harder to see. But it's definitely only the product where the price is more than 30. Now just to showcase that, let's go with ampersand. Let's add sort and let me zoom in. And then we're looking for the actual value. And of course, in here, I want to pass in the price. So let's say here price, and then let's check it out what we have. Of course, we have 31, then 39, and on and on and on. So this is how our API is going to look like. Now, as far as the mongoose, we'll have to use again, those query operators. And in this case, for the greater one, we go with dollar sign, and then greater than, and the same goes for less than, but of course, here we type LT. Now I'll show you all the ones that we're going to use in the next video. Now let's just try it out in our manual setup, where we want to navigate back, we're looking for the product. And at the moment I have find. So let's go with price. So let's go here with price, and we set it equal to an object, then we're going to go with the dollar sign. And then we'll pass in sorry, not get GT. So that's going to be greater than and then of course, as far as the value, well, let's set up the same 30. And once we save, of course, and if we go back to our static one, we should, I mean, we should, let's see. So at the moment, I have find name price, and for some reason, not returning any kind of value. So let me send it one more time. There must have been some kind of bug. And now, of course, I can see only the items where the price is more than 30. And just so we can keep on practicing, I'm going to go with sort and we'll place here price. Let's see. So that should be the ascending order. And you can clearly see that we start with the product where the price is more than 30. So that is the manual setup. And that's the general idea. And now, of course, we can start working on get all products because in here, we'll have way more logic. Nice. And before we start typing away in get all products, let me just showcase where I got the idea from. And what are we actually shooting for? And it's not going to be a surprise where I'm using again, my API. And as you can see here, the key in the query string is numeric filters. That's why we use the same one. And then as far as the options, of course, they provide following. So these are the ones where they have numeric values, correct? And we'll do the same. So therefore, in our case, we'll just have one for the price and one for the rating. And as far as conditions, we'll notice how they use actually more user friendly ones, correct? The ones that we're using in the final one. And if we take a look at the mongoose one, of course, they have this dollar sign greater than and less than. So pretty much that's going to be the biggest deal converting these user friendly ones 
that we can simply pass in the URL to the mongoose ones. And in order to do that, we'll have to do a little bit of regular expression magic. But don't worry, the code is pretty straightforward. And of course, I already got it for you. And the first thing we need to decide what is going to be the name for the key in the query string parameter. And again, I'll copy my favorite API, at least for this course, and I'll name this numeric filters. So I'll say here that I'm going to be looking for numeric and then filters. Now, once I have access to the numeric filters, I just want to scroll down and we'll do the same thing where again, we'll set up a if condition. And in this case, I'll uncomment the query object because there's going to be times where I do want to showcase what we're getting back. And let's just say with numeric filters. And then as far as what I want to pass in, well, first, let's go to get all products. And again, just to kind of keep this nice and sweet, I'll remove the rest of them. And then at the end, if we want, we can add all of them. But I'll just remove these ones. And then we want to go with numeric filters, because that's the name that I came up with, meaning that's the one that you'll showcase in documentation. And then as far as the values, well, let's simply go with price is bigger than, I don't know, 40. And then comma. And what was the other one? I believe that was rating. And then let's set a rating bigger or equals to four. So let's send it to all our products. And of course, I didn't save it. Very, very smart. So let me go back over here. I'm going to go with log. And actually, I didn't console log it either. So let me look for numeric. And we're going to be looking for, of course, the filters. If they exist, we want to console log them. So let's go back over here. And now, of course, I have empty query object because I didn't pass anything in. And here I have one string. I have price is bigger than 40 and rating is bigger or equals to four. And the first thing we want to do is set up the operator map. Now, what does that mean? You'll see in a second. So in here, let's go to const operator and then map. And in here, I want to map the user friendly ones to the ones that are understood by the mongoose. So I'll say bigger than and then as far as the mongoose, it understands the dollar sign. And then we have greater than and once we have the first one, of course, we just want to add the comma and I'll copy and paste this four times. And as far as the second value, I'm going to go with greater than or equal. And when it comes to mongoose, we just need to add this E at the very end. Then as far as the equal, well, we simply go with equal sign. And then here we say equals. And of course, we'll do the same thing with less than and less than equals. So in here, let's go less than less than equals. And as far as the mongoose values, it's LT and then LTE. So once we have the map, then this is where the regular expression magic happens. Where first, I want to set up the regular expression. And then we want to run the replace method where we pass in that regular expression. And if it is a match, then of course, we'll change the value from the user friendly one that we're getting in the numeric filters into the one that is understood by the mongoose. And when it comes to regular expression, we just go with const and I'll call this rejects. And that one is equal to the regular expression. And this one I got from the stack overflow. So please don't overthink it. You can always find those values. You really don't need to come up with them yourself. And inside of the regular expression, we just want to go here with B. And then we'll set up the parentheses. And then you just want to pass in all of these values separated by the vertical bars. So in here, we go with less than, then greater than, and hopefully you get the gist. And once I have all the values, then we want to add one more B. So let's go over here, we add B, and then we're going to go with a G flag. And once I have my regular expression, then I want to go with the replace method, where essentially I call numeric filters, which of course is going to be my string. And then I'll pass the regular expression. And if there is a match, then of course, we'll convert from the user friendly one to the one that is understood by the mongoose. 
So in here, let's call this let filters. And that one is equal to our numeric filters. Then we go with replace method. And then as far as the first argument, we want to pass in our rejects. And the second one will be the callback function if there is a match. So what we could do here, I can access the match if there is one. And as far as the functionality, well, I want to take this match and then I want to get the value that corresponds to something that is understood by the mongoose. So in here, I'll return a string and I'll purposely use the template literal here. And I'll purposely also add these hyphens. And you'll see later why we want to do that. So there's going to be two hyphens, one at the start and then one at the end. And then we want to access the actual value. And now I want to go for my operator map. And then I want to look for the match. And hopefully you understand how this works. So essentially, I have the object. Object has the properties, correct? And then if there is a match over here, then I just say, hey, get me that key. And effectively, I will swap the values. And just so you can see how everything works, instead of numeric filters, why don't we look for the filters over here? And then let's go back to the postman and send a request one more time. And now, of course, you'll see the result. So notice, instead of this one, where we have price is bigger than 40 and rating is bigger or equals to four. Now, of course, we have this. We have price, and then this is going to be that mongoose value. And the same goes for the rating. And since I don't want to overwhelm you, we'll stop over here and we'll continue with the logic in the next video. We have successfully converted our values to the ones that are understood by the mongoose, but we're not done. Because, of course, I cannot pass this one into my query object. We need to do a bit more data massaging. And the way it's going to look like first, I want to come up with an options. Because if you take a look at their API, like I mentioned previously, you can only do that on certain properties. Because these properties, of course, have number values. And essentially, we want to do the same where I'm going to go with options. And that's just going to be an array. And in here, I'll pass in two string values. I'll say price and rating, because of course, those are the two properties that use the number value. And then we want to go with filters and set it equal to the filters. And first, again, we'll use the split method. Remember, that's the method that's splitting string into an array. And I'll say that I want to split it. Where's the comma? So of course, now I'll have two items in my array. I'll have this one and I'll have this one. Hopefully that is clear. And then after that, we want to go with for each. So now I'll iterate over that array. And then in the callback function, I'll have access to that item. Again, it's going to be a string of price and yada, yada, yada. And the same goes for the rating. And then we want to do more splitting over there. And effectively, I'm going to split it into array. And then remember, we also have array destructuring where I can pull out the values. And I'm just going to set it equal to item split. And remember that when we were setting up our regular expression, I purposely added here these hyphens. So now each item, so price and the rating, I actually want to split it on that hyphen. So I'll say here, split it on hyphen. And the way the array destructuring works, instead of object where we say a specific property, whatever I'm going to type here first, is going to match this price because, of course, we're splitting on hyphen. The second one is going to be, of course, my operator. And the third one is going to be the value. So in here, I can just go with field and then operator. And as a side note, if you need to catch up on the array destructuring, I have that video in my JavaScript nugget series. So let's go over here with a value. So this is going to be the actual value. And then only if the field so only if the price and rating is actually in my options, only then I want to add a new property on that query object. So in here, right after that, I'm going to go with if, and then the name is options, and we can use this includes method. And if it includes the actual field, then inside of the block, I want to go with query object, and then I want to set up the field. So now again, I'm dynamically setting up the property on my query object. 
And since we're console logging, of course, you'll be able to see that. And then as far as the value, well, again, we need to go with object, of course. So let's set it here equal to an object. And then we go with operator. Again, this is dynamic, of course, because this operator will change. In one case, we have greater than. In other case, we have greater or equals. So therefore, again, we go with operator that is coming from here. And then as far as the value, well, we're still getting this as a string, correct? So we need to go again with number and then pass in the value. So now, of course, once I save, since we're console logging, you'll be able to see actually what we have in the query object. So let me go back. Let me send it one more time. And what you'll notice is this query object. We have price. And of course, we have greater than. And as far as the rating, we have greater than or equals. So what's really cool, of course, now we get the correct values where we only get the ones that have the price bigger than 40 and rating is bigger or equals to four. So if I'll change this around and if I'll just say that I'm looking for the rating that is bigger or equals to 4.5 and then maybe the price is going to be bigger than 90, then of course, once we save, check it out, we have only how many? Seven products, correct? So that's how we can set up these numeric filters in our API. And once we have the numeric filters in place, we're pretty much done with the project. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it. And I'll see you in the next one. All right. And welcome to our next adventure, the JSON Web Token Basics project. So far in our projects, all the routes were public, meaning anyone can access them and use them however they please. But of course, that's not how we want to set up apps in real world. I don't want random people to access my data. And I bet you probably feel exactly the same way. So how we can restrict the access? Well, I'm glad you asked. A very popular method is using JWT or JSON Web Tokens. And for the sake of simplicity, just think of them as long strings. Now, of course, they are way more complex than that, but let's just not worry about that right now. And the idea is following. Imagine we have two routes, a dashboard and a login or register route. Now, dashboard is protected, so I can click all day long on get data, but I'll have no access to the info. And only if I log in, I get the token. And only once I have the token, I can access the secret info, which in this case is just going to be a random number. So let's try it out. I have the dashboard clearly says here, no token present and check it out. Not authorized to access this route. And again, I can click all day long and I can showcase that in the console where notice we're getting these 401 errors, but I'll have no access to the data. Now, in order to access the data, of course, I need to log in. And of course, this is just going to be a simple version where I just need to provide some kind of values. If I won't provide the values, then I'll get the 401. So this is going to be a bad request. And I still don't get the token. So let's go up. I'll say username. And I'm just going to go with my John. And again, you just need to provide some kind of values. It doesn't really matter in a later project. Of course, it will matter what we provide there. But in this case, we just need to provide something. And only if I do that, then I send it here. Notice user created. So now, of course, I have no errors. And also in the local storage, I'm going to get the token. Now, don't worry about the front end local storage and all that. I'll talk about it in more detail later. Just think that you're getting the token. And once the token is present, and of course, we can clearly see that here with the text of token present, then we can make as many requests as we want in order to get our data. Again, as long as the token is valid, we are good to go. Now, if again, I'll try to submit and then I'll remove the token, then again, we're back to the not authorized this route. Now, the reason why I made this project so simple and straightforward is because it's crucial that you grasp the main concept. If you do, I guarantee you, you'll breeze through the upcoming projects, even though they will be way more complex than this. Just always remember, if a valid token is present in the request, the user can access specific info. Now, not all of the info, of course, you can only access the info that belongs to you. 
So you cannot just randomly come here and get my data. But still, if the token is present, you can get that specific data. But if we have a restricted route, so keep in mind that login is not restricted. Anyone can try to log in. But if we do have the restricted route, like we have with dashboard, if the token is not present or it's not valid, then the server, in this case, that's of course us, will kick back the error response. And that's how essentially we restrict access to certain routes, aka certain resources. And as far as the setup, again, we've got two folders, final, where you'll find the complete code, and a starter where we'll do all of our work. And when it comes to final, you'll be able to spin it up once we cover GWT or JSON Web Token Basics, since you'll need to set up a variable in .env. And when it comes to starter, all of it should look very familiar. And like I promised in a previous video, in order to save some time on a boilerplate, I already set up a basic express server for you. So let me install the dependencies, and then I'll show you our app.js. So let me zoom out. I'll open up my terminal, I'll clear everything. And then of course, first, I want to navigate to the star one. So I'll grab it over here. And then we're going to go with npm install. And then of course, we'll also spin up npm start. Now, when it comes to package JSON, of course, there are a few other packages as well. And I'll talk about them once we get there. And when it comes to app.js, essentially, first, I require .env. And of course, that is in order to access the env variables. Then we have express async errors. And if you remember, we use that package just so we don't have to set up our own async middleware. Then we grab the express from express, and we invoke it, and we set it equal to app. Then we're looking for two middlewares, not found one, and error handler one. And if you take a look at the folder, the middleware one, of course, you'll see the error handler. This is the one that we used all the way in the project number three. This is essentially what we set up, where we have the custom API error. And of course, we're looking for that instance. And then if that is the case, then this is the response. If not, then we just send back the 500 one, the generic one. And of course, since we're using our own error class, of course, we also have it in the errors. So if you take a look at the custom error one, of course, you can see that we have the class that is extending from the error. And we'll do that because, of course, there's going to be some instances where we'll implement our own class instead. And of course, I'm importing both of them from the middleware, like I said. And then you can find the other one, the not found here as well. And then we'll also work on the authentication middleware. That's what we'll find here, the empty file. So then we keep on moving and we can see that we have app.use. So we implement the middleware. And in this case, I'm looking for a static one. So essentially, we're serving static files because this is where our front end app lives. Notice over here again, we have index.html, style CSS, as well as the browser app.js. And then, of course, we have express JSON. And that is simply because one of the routes is going to be a post route, and I want to access request that body. So I want to get that data that's going to be coming in. And then, of course, we implement both middlewares, the not found one, as well as error handler one. And then we have the port variable. We set it equal to process.env port or 3000. And of course, in the final one, it's a little bit different. I believe it's 5000, just so we don't have the port issues, meaning just so we don't have two apps trying to access the same port. And then, of course, I have a start one. However, you'll notice that in this case, we're not connecting to the database. So I simply wanted to showcase how everything is going to work without database. And of course, in next project, we'll implement the database because, of course, that will add an extra layer of complexity. And of course, in here, I just call app that listen set up the port, set up the console log, and if there's an error, I log one. Now, if you're wondering why I kept this DB folder with connect one, just so you don't forget the setup. Again, in the next projects, of course, a major part of the application is going to be setting up everything with the database. 
In this case, I just wanted to showcase how everything is going to work in isolation. And if you can see server is listening on port 3000, you can bravely navigate to your browser. And we're looking for localhost 3000. And of course, you'll see the app. Now, nothing is going to work. I can guarantee you that because of course, we have no route, but you should see the UI. So you should see the form as well as this gibberish here in the bottom. And if you do, then of course, we're in good shape. And now we can start working on the project. Beautiful. And once we're done with the setup, next, I want to set up our two lonely routes. So we'll have one fake one for the login or register and sign up. And please understand that, of course, in the following projects, there's going to be a huge distinction, whether we're registering, or we're actually just logging in. But in this case, we'll jam both of them together. Because our main concern is going to be that JWT or JSON web token. And as a quick side note, in the following videos, when I use term JWT, of course, I'm talking about the JSON web token. And then basically what we want is to set up those two routes. And we already know how to do that. So of course, we have the routes folder in there. Eventually, we'll have the router. And then we'll also have the controllers. So in this case, let's just start with controllers. So I'm going to go here with const and effectively I'll set up both of these functions and I'll go with the sync because remember we have the package that handles that the express async error. So we don't have to set up the try catches or our own middleware. And we can simply go with rec and res. And as far as the response, we'll just go with the res dot and then send. And here I'm just going to say fake login register and then of course the sign up and like i said normally of course there's going to be a difference whether we're logging in or we're registering however in this case we'll just mush all of them together and then we'll say route here and that's for the login and when it comes to dashboard this is where we want to share that secret or authorized data so let's just say here dashboard and that will be equal again to a sync rec and res and here let's do it a little bit more interesting where i just want to set up some random number and i'll call this a lucky number and of course that will be equal to math random which is coming from the javascript we'll multiply this by i don't know maybe 100 and then let's wrap everything in the math floor and essentially we should get the random numbers between zero and 100 and then once we set up the lucky number, let's just go with the res dot status. And of course, eventually this route will be protected. But of course, for time being, we'll just go with the res dot status 200. And then we'll say JSON and we'll be sending back the object. I'll say message here. And eventually it's going to be the name of the user. And therefore, I'll place everything right away in template string. But for now, since we don't have the user, I'm just going to say John Doe. And then the other property on the object is going to be a secret. So let's say here, comma, secret. And again, we'll use the template string. And we'll say here is your authorized data, your lucky number. And then, of course, we'll access the variable. And once we have all of this in place, once we have the first string as well as the second one with lucky number, now, of course, we just want to export them. And I think for now, I can just close the console as well as the sidebar. And we'll just go with module exports. And of course, we're exporting the object. And we're looking for two functions, login and dashboard. And it looks like I made a big old doozy where essentially I set up my code in the router instead of the controllers. My apology. So take all of this code, cut it out from the routes. And you're actually looking for the controllers. We copy and paste. And then back in the routes, of course, this is where we want to set up the router. So in here, we're looking for express, just like we did before. we we'll go with require. We're looking for the express package, of course. Then we want to set up the router. So const router is equal to express.router. Router, we invoke it. And then we're looking for both of the controller functions. And those are login and dashboard. And both of them are coming from the controllers. So hopefully you're able to fix my bugs. And essentially, we want to go two levels up. And then we're looking for the main. 
and then once we have all of this in place, eventually there's going to be a middleware for authentication as well. But for time being, we'll just go with a router, and then in here, let's go with dashboard first. So, dashboard, and this is going to be a get route, and we'll simply pass in the dashboard controller. Now, the login one is going to be a post one because, of course, we want to get those user credentials, the username as well as the password. So we go here with router, then route, then forward slash login. And of course, in this case, we go with post method and then we'll pass in the login. And then the last thing we want to do is, of course, export this. So module exports and we set it equal to the router. And then once we have all of this in place, we go back to the app JS. We're looking for the main router. So I'm going to go above both the middlewares and I'll say here main router. Now that is coming from my routes. So require and it's in the same folder. Essentially, it's in the root. So we simply go with forward slash. We're looking for the routes and more specifically main. And then where we have the middleware for not found one and all that above it, we'll just go with app dot use. And again, what is going to be that root endpoint? Well, in my case, again, I'm going to go with API and then version one, because that's the setup that I have, of course, in the postman. And then, of course, we'll just set up that every time we get a request on this root endpoint, we'll just go with main router. So we go with main router. And of course, in the main router, we have the dashboard. So that one will be API version one forward slash dashboard. And then for the login, you already can imagine that it's going to be API version one and login. And once the basic controllers as well as the routes are in place, now, of course, we can move on to our next task. Nice. And once we have our basic controller set up in place, now let's also test it out in the postman. So in here, we want to go with another collection. And of course, I'll give it another name. And I'm going to go with zero five and pretty much the same as the app name. So I'll say here, JWT basics. And then in here, we'll have two routes. One, like you just saw, is going to be the get one. And we're just going to be looking for the URL. Then we'll go with forward slash. And then we're looking for dashboard, of course. So that's going to be our get route. Once we send, of course, we should see hello, John Doe. Yada, yada, yada. The lucky number is 90. And notice how every time we send, of course, we'll get a different value. And this is done on purpose, just so you can see that we're getting a new request out. And then, of course, I just want to save it. So let's say over here. And of course, I want to save it here in my latest collection. And then I want to do the same thing with my other route with login one. But of course, that one is the post one, correct? So let me close this one. And we'll just start with post. Then we're looking for the URL. And of course, the route is login here. And just to jog your memory, when it comes to the post route, of course, we want to send some kind of data to the server, because effectively, we want to create a resource on a server. So therefore, we go with body, we'll go with raw, and we'll set it equal to JSON. And in here, let's just go with username because this is what we'll be sending from our front end application, as well as the password. And of course, since we're just testing everything out, we can go with whatever values you want. And as a side note, in general, we'll only check if the values are provided. Now in the following projects, of course, this is where the things are going to get way more interesting than that. But for now, you just want to send username, and then a comma, and of course, the password. And as far as the password, I think throughout this project, I'm just going to stick with a secret. And then once we send, of course, we have fake login, blah, 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 which means that everything is correct. And once we have tested both of the routes, and once we have properly saved them in our collection, so in here, let's just call this login register. And of course, we can start focusing on the real logic. Therefore, in here, I'm just going to save it. And we can start working on our next task. And before we continue, let me just give you a big picture of what we're about to do. 
So first, we know that we have a post route, the login one. And essentially, since we want to log in or register user, in this case, we're going to be looking for two things. We're going to be looking for username, as well as the password. And we already know that it's going to be available in the right dot body. Now, if both of them exist, we want to create a new JWT. If not, then we want to send back the error response. Then we want to say, hey, listen, please provide email and password. Now, if we're good, if we create a new JSON web token, then of course, we want to send it back to the front end, since front end needs to access it in order to send another request in order to send the get request, where essentially we display this secret information. And on our end, we want to set up the authentication. So only the requests with JWT can access the dashboard. Otherwise, if you go currently to our front end, notice and click here, and I can actually access the data. But that's not what we want. What we want on the front end here, or from the postman doesn't really matter. But of course, with front end, it's just easier to see, we want to provide username and password. And only if both values are provided, then we get back the token. And only with our token, we can make a successful get request, and eventually display our secret data on a front end. Otherwise, we get an error, since the dashboard route is restricted, and only accessible by authenticated users, or in other words, only by the requests where JSON web token is present. And if we take a look at the comments, the first thing we want to do is check for username and password. And since it's a post route, we already know that data is going to be in the right dot body. So in here we go with const and then I'm looking for both things, username and password. And this is going to be the case where I will log them out. So I'll set up here log and I'm going to be looking for both username and password. This is the case where you can send those requests from the front end. But I highly encourage you to do that from the postman first and only do that later once our JWT functionality is in place. So in my case, I'm going to navigate to my postman. I'm looking for the login one. I have the body. Yeah, that's awesome. And then I'll send it and back in my application. If I take a look at the console, of course, I have John and secret. There also could be a case where the user is trying to log in with just empty values, correct? So he or she can send this type of request. And now in the console, I can see that I have nothing. And before we issue the token, which eventually will allow the front end to access the route, I want to check whether the username and the password have been provided. Now, eventually, once we work with database, effectively, we have three options. First option, remember, when we use Mongo's required validation, it checks that for us. If the value is not present, it simply spits back the error. So that's definitely one route that we can take once we introduce the database. But in this case, remember, we're not connecting to the database. Another option we have is to set up the entire additional layer of validation, which is going to be sitting in front of all of our requests. And in order to accomplish that task, we'll utilize another package by the name of joy. But I only want to do that in later projects. Once we have a solid understanding of the JSON web tokens. Now, the third option is actually checking for both of these values over here, where I can say, hey, if the username or the password have not been provided, then I'll send you back a, a response. Now, in our case, what's really cool, we have that package that wraps all of our routes, and we simply want to throw a error. What error? Well, our custom one, where we say, hey, listen, you did not provide both the values. So therefore, we'll send back a 400 response, which essentially is a bad request. So let's try it out. I'm going to go back to my controllers. And here I'll say if and then if there's no username, username, and as I said, not, let me move these ones up. And I'll add that comment check in the controller in the controller. And once we're done, I'll actually show you how we could have used that in task manager as well. 
So let's go down and then we have username if it doesn't exist or if the password doesn't exist. So essentially, if one or both are missing, then we want to throw that error. Why? Well, because that's what we can do since we have that express async errors. Now, what error are we looking for? Of course, that is our own one. So in the controllers, what we want to do is import our custom error. So let's go here with const custom API error. Now that is equal to require. We're looking in the errors in this case. And more specifically, we're looking in the custom one. And if the user hasn't provided the values of username and password, then of course, we can simply throw a new error. And remember, this is going to be handled in our own error handler middleware, correct? The middleware that we set up, it's going to check for our own API error. And if that is the case, then we'll send back the status with the status code as well as the error message. So now we simply want to throw new custom API error. My apologies, I started typing error. Actually, we need to go with custom API error. And in here, we'll say, please provide email and password. And as far as the error code, it's going to be 400. So 400 stands for bad request. And once we have the code to throw the error, now I can remove this console log. And let's just go back to the postman and test it out. So if I haven't provided anything, I should have please provide email and a password. And status code should be 400. Again, if you already forgot how the custom API error works and all that, please go back to the previous projects. I believe we set it up in task manager, where I covered all of this in great detail. So essentially, if these two values are not provided, we have three options, we can either use Mongo, and you know, what? just so it's less confusing, I'll write here, mongoose validations, or we can set up another validation layer with the help of package by the name of joy, which we'll do later, or we can simply check in the controller. And just to showcase, if you take a look at the task manager, so remember, that was our third project where we essentially just started working with the database, more specifically, if we're looking in the controllers, and then create task. Remember, we handle this with the help of mongoose, correct? Because if you take a look at the models, you'll see the name. And this one is set to required. Now the same way we could have just checked in the controller, we could have just said, Okay, check if the task exists. If it doesn't exist, we throw the error. In this case, it was a little bit different. We used next since we used our own async wrapper, the general idea doesn't change, we're still throwing the error. And if everything is great, then we're creating a task. And the only reason why I'm telling you all of this is just so I understand that you have multiple options, you're not limited to just setting up the validations in the mongoose. Yes, you should do it. It doesn't mean that you should skip that part. Just be aware that there's extra layers of validation that we can add. And in our case, we simply set them up right in the controller. So if the username or a password is not provided, just throw the error, which gets handled in our own middleware in the error handler one. And here we just check for the custom API. And then we send back the response. And of course, if that is the case, we don't send back this string, we send back the error. All right, we check for empty values. Now what? Well, now we need to create a JSON web token and send it back. But before we do that, let's back up a little bit and take a look at the big picture one more time. So far, we have been setting up all our routes in the following fashion. As long as the endpoint exists, user just needs to make a request, and our server will send a response. But that's about to change. From now on, we'll have two types of routes, the public ones, accessible by anyone, and restricted ones, accessible only with correct signed JWT or JSON web token. So back to our app, if the user provides correct credentials, meaning in our case, of course, those are just some values in the username and password, we send back the signed JSON web token. And in order to access the dashboard route, he or she, basically a front end, needs to provide the same token. Otherwise, we'll kick it back with an error response. And before we analyze the structure of the JSON web token, let's talk about some big picture things first. And let's start with general concept. 
JSON Web Token is just a way to exchange data between two parties. And probably the most common example for such parties is a front end app and our API. Now, why using JWT is far better than just some random string is simply because JWT has a security feature where we can be sure about the integrity of our data. If the token passes the validation, it means it's the same token we sent to the client and the data wasn't tampered with. Second, for now, don't worry how and where the front end will store the token. I'll discuss it in more detail in few videos. And third, please keep in mind that one of the features of HTTP is that it is stateless. And that simply means that server does not know, or you can think does not remember any previous requests sent by the same client. And as a result, yes, even after the first second, or even the 200 successful dashboard request front end will still need to provide the valid token. Otherwise, the access will be denied. Remember how I suggested to think of JWTs as long strings? Well, of course, it's way more complex than that. So now let's spend a few minutes on the JWT structure. And then of course, we'll dive back into the code. And a very good resource is cited by the name of JWTIO. Again, the URL is JWTIO. And more specifically, we're interested in two pages, the introduction one and the debugger. And I'll start with introduction. And I'm not going to read the entire thing line by line. That just seems a big waste of your time. But I do want to point out some things here and there. As always, if you are interested in learning more, you know already where to find it. And the first thing that I want to point out is this sentence where it says oh, this information can be verified and trusted because it is digitally signed. So this is what I was saying in the previous video. And essentially, we do that using the secret and the algorithm. And we'll learn more about them in a few seconds. So let's just keep on scrolling. They say when you should use tokens. Okay, yada, yada, yada. And this is going to be the structure for the web token. And like I said, the result is going to look like a large string, but of course, it's way more complex than that. And essentially, in the JSON web token, we have the header, payload, as well as the signature. And when it comes to header, it consists of two parts, and one is going to be the type of token. And of course, we're going to go with JWT. And the second one is going to be the algorithm that is used, of course, to create that signature. Then this one gets encoded with base 64 URL. So I'm going to code this one. And then we have the payload. In the payload, this is where we'll place the information. And as an example, we can place here the ID of the user that just signed on or logged in or registered or whatever. Then we send back the token, the entire token with that payload back to the front end. Then the front end sends it back to us. And then when we decode, we get that ID. And essentially what that means is that if the user has some kind of resource, we access right away resources that belong to only that user. So essentially, if you create some kind of resource, only you can access it or modify it or whatever. Then we keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling. And I'll talk about the payload, of course, when we actually create our own token. This is just an example of what we can send back. Again, this also gets encoded with base 64 URL. And then lastly, we have the signature. And as far as the signature, this is where the algorithm is used, the one that is specified in the header. And then we add here the secret to sign our token. And as far as the secret, this is something that we'll have to keep on the server. And again, I'll talk about when we actually create our own signature. So once we set up our first token, then I'll talk about it, how and where we should store the secret value. And the idea is we have the algorithm, we have the encoded header, as well as the payload, then we take the secret string value that is always going to be only on the server. And then we sign this one. And then once we sign, this is going to be a result. So essentially, this is what we're sending back to the front end. And after that, we have a bunch of useful information of how we can send back the token from the front end. And this is something, again, we'll cover a little bit later. 
once we already create our token. So we'll swing back and I'll discuss what is the bear and all this cool stuff. And as far as the structure, I think we're pretty much done. I just want to showcase in the bugger that, of course, we have the token. Like I said, this is the signed token, the encoded one. And this is what we're sending back to the front end. So this is what the front end will receive. Now, once we decode, there you go. You'll have information about that user. So you'll have some kind of ID, maybe a name and when it was issued. And of course, later we'll do something with that data. So this is that ID that we're looking for, the user ID. And then we can use this ID to access the database resources and all that cool stuff. Hopefully we're clear on the structure. So now we can take a look at the package we'll use to sign and decode our tokens. When it comes to signing and decoding our tokens, there are quite a few packages out there. So you definitely have plenty of options. But for my projects, I usually use package by the name of JSON Web Token. Of course, if you're using the starter, I already installed it for you. But if you ever want to use it in your own projects, just run this command. And as far as the docs, since we'll use only two methods, I'm pretty sure I won't return here. But of course, if you ever need more info, just utilize the search engine. Nice. And once we have discussed the general principles of JWT, now let's try to issue one in the project. And first, what we want to do is import the package. And again, the package we're looking for is this one, the JSON web token. And of course, we want to assign it to some kind of variable. So I'm going to go with JWT is equal to require. And of course, we're looking for the package. And once we have the package after the if, assuming that both of the values are provided, we want to create a new token. And we do that in the following way. So we come up with some kind of variable. In this case, again, it's going to be a token, pretty straightforward. And then we go with JWT, so the package name. And then we're looking for the sign method. And then in the sign method, we want to provide three values. We want to provide a payload, a JWT secret, which essentially is just a secret string, and then the options. Now, when it comes to payload, you go with object, and pretty much in here, you can pass whatever you want. Sky is the limit. Now, please remember one thing you don't want to send back some kind of confidential information. So don't stick a password over here. That is a very, very, very bad practice. Now, what normally gets sent back? Well, if we're creating a user, a ID is very helpful because then later on, when we're authenticating the request, we can check for the user. If I'm creating a user and that user is, I don't know, checking for some kind of resources, we only provide resources that belong to the user. So in our task manager application, we only provide tasks that belong to the user. And as a result, only the user who created task, for example, can view it or delete it. And hopefully you get the gist. So in here, I'm just going to go with username that I was already provided over here. So that's what I'm sending back. And like I said, normally send back the ID, but since we don't have the connection to the database, I'll create a dummy one from the scratch. I'll simply go with ID and then I'll go with new date and I'll say get time. And let me just add a comment just so it's clear that this is only for demo. And once I have both of the comments, first I'll add the ID. And then I just want to mention here that when it comes to payloads, it's a good idea to keep them small because the bigger the payload, the more data you're sending over the wire. And of course, as a result, for someone with bad internet connection, the user experience might not be the best one. So that's about it for the payload. And then we want to provide that JWT secret. So we go here with a comma and we right away want to set it up in our dot envy. So of course, we need to create one from the scratch. And in the star, we're going to go with new file dot env. And then we need to come up with a variable name. And in my case, I'm going to go with JWT underscore secret. And when it comes to value in this application, I'm just going to go with something really simple as JW secret 
But let me grab the comment that I left here just for demo in production. Use long, complex and unguessable string value. And when it comes to more complex projects, I'll show you how we can create one. So let me just take this one out. And then I think I'll just leave that in the controller there right below the payload small comment where again, you always, always when it comes to production, want to have them long, complex and unguessable. In this case, we're just cheating because I don't want to bother with that. So we go with variable and then some kind of value. And now, of course, we just need to go back to the controller here. And then remember, we can access it with process dot env. And then more specifically, we're looking for JWT and then underscore secret. And if you're confused, we're just wondering why we're so fussy about this JWT secret string. If you recall the JSON web token structure video, this is the secret that is used to sign our tokens. And therefore, it's a good practice to only keep it on a server and make it more complex than our current JWT secret. Just keep in mind that if someone gets a hold of your key, they can start signing tokens on your behalf. And that's definitely not the spot you want to be in. As you can see, even in the docs, they suggest your 256 bit secret. And like I already mentioned in the following projects, I'll show you where and how we can set up a proper secret value in no time. And then the last thing we want to provide is options. And we're going to go with expires in option and we'll set it equal to 30 days. And I'll come back and talk about the expirations and all that a little bit later. So once we have the token, now, of course, we want to change our response where instead of the string, we're going to go with actual status. So set it up over here, 200. Then that. And of course, we're going to be looking for the JSON here. And then let's just add here a message and we'll say user created, user created. And this is the case where the front end is using that message. So I strongly suggest keeping it the same way. And then we'll go with token. So effectively, we have our token. And now we just want to send back to the user. So once we save, we're going to go back to the login one. And in this case, I'll try one more time providing empty values. And of course, in that case, I get back my error one. But if I go here and if I say John and secret, I should get back my JSON web token. And of course I do. And what's really cool, if you take this value and just head back to the website and just copy and paste, what do you know? Of course, now I have username, some kind of fake ID, and this is going to be the expiration. So as you can see, this is the payload that we're sending. Not bad, not bad. We signed a token, sent it back to the front end. Now what? Well, first, we need to understand how the request with the token already present is going to look like. But before we continue, let me just emphasize something. Since it's a back end course, we're not going to dwell too much on do's and don'ts on the proper JWT storage on a front end. And yes, of course, there are best practices. And don't get me wrong, they are important. But our current goal is to secure resource access on the server. And therefore, we're only really interested in how the request is going to look like. So we can implement the correct functionality on our end. And if you keep reading the introduction, you'll see that a common approach on a front end is to set up the authorization header in the request. So of course, in our case, that is going to be a get request. And then add the bearer schema. And essentially, what that means is that we have the header by the name of authorization, then we go with bearer, and then space, and then the token. And in this video, I'll show you how it looks like on a front end, as well as the front end code. And then in the next video, we'll do it together in postman. And basically, the idea is following where I have the username, password and all that. And I just go here with Peter. And then I pass in my secret. And what I'd want you to see is the local storage because of course at the moment we have nothing in there and the idea is following where i will get back the token 
is of course i'm providing some kind of values in the username as well as the password and now check it out here i have the token so now of course when i'm making that next request so if i go here with get data of course in my code i just grab the token from the local storage and of course i'm successful and if we take a look at the network requests so again this is going to be for the login this is to get the token and then of course as far as the dashboard we just open it over here and notice the headers so we keep on scrolling the request headers blah 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 and what we're looking for of course is this authorization one so that's the one that we want we have authorization then we have the bear and then of course we have the token and if you're interested in a code just navigate to browser app.js and first what you want to do is to look for the form event listener we're listening for the submit event and then in here i have try and catch and in the try and catch i'm using axios library with a post request and surprise surprise i'm sending this post request where to a login one and what am i passing in passing in username and password and what happens if i'm successful notice this line of code we go with local storage set item token and then whatever i got back from the server so i right away save this token in the local storage now there's also a catch and in this instance i just remove the token now again this is just my preference just so i can demonstrate things but hopefully you get the overall idea that of course on the front end you'll store this token somewhere and then of course when it comes to actual request i have the button i have the event listener the click event listener and then i'm issuing a get request of course where is it going it's going to the dashboard and the way we add the headers again this is just for axios library but the idea is going to be exactly the same for fetch or any other ajax library where you'll go with headers and then of course the name is authorization and then like i said we go with bearer schema and then we add the space and then we pass in a token and as you can see i'm getting this token from the local storage and of course let's take a look how we can send the same request with a postman and once we have discussed in theory how we can send back the token let's try doing that in the postman so in the login every time i send a successful request meaning where the username and password are valid values instead of empty strings then of course we're getting back the token and of course all this time i'm creating with john but just understand that every time we're getting that unique token and what we want to do take this token so copy this one and of course don't worry later we'll set it up with different usernames at the moment there's really no need for that and then back in the dashboard so in our get request we're not looking for the body we're looking for the headers and in the following projects i'll show you how we can do that dynamically in postman because of course when it comes to bigger project it is going to get annoying really fast if you'll have to all the time copy and paste those tokens just to test something out but in this project yes we'll do this manually so again we are in the dashboard that's the route of course it is get and all that and then we're looking for the headers and the header name is going to be the authorization one then we want to set it equal to bearer that's the name and you have to follow this to the t so bearer and then copy and paste the token so now of course if we send yeah we get the value blah 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 we have the number but what's more interesting if we go back to the dashboard and if you log request headers you'll see something really cool where if i go with a request and like i said headers now let me send one more time again the token is still valid we have 30 days so everything is going to work if i scroll up check it out we have authorization header and then of course i have the bearer and then this is the value and this is what we'll do in the following videos we'll extract this and actually validate it and if it is valid only then we'll send back the data with the actual username At the moment of course we just have john doe but eventually we'll set up where whatever username gets sent back to the front end well that one will send back here 
because that way we'll showcase that we only access the specific resources that the user has, not just some random ones. Beautiful. And in order to get to this value, we'll just have to do a little bit of JavaScript magic. And we'll also have to throw a few of the errors if the values are not provided. So in the dashboard, first, I want to assign that authorization header to some kind of variable. And in my case, I'm going to go with auth header. And then I'm looking for a request. And then, of course, headers, like I said, and then we're looking for the authorization one. So once I have access to the header, then I want to check whether it actually exists, because maybe user is sending a request without the header altogether. And if it exists, whether it starts with a bearer and then the space again, this is very, very important that the syntax is exact. Because if it's not going to be exact, then of course, all of this loses the meaning. So let's say here if and then auth header. So if it doesn't exist, or the auth header, and then starts with that's the method that we can use on JavaScript strings. And in here, I just want to say, if it doesn't start with the bearer, then of course, we'll throw the error. So if there is no authorization header, or it doesn't start with bearer, then of course, we'll throw our custom error. So I'll just add here bearer, and then the space. Now, if that is the case, what we can do? Well, we can throw our own custom error. And in order to speed this up, I'm just going to copy and paste, we're throwing the error. And normally, you're going to be way more vague than this. But in this case, since we're of course, just testing the JWTs, I'll say here, no token provided. In that case, if you hit some kind of roadblock, at least you know where the error is coming from. And when it comes to text, normally it's going to be along the lines of invalid credentials to access this route. And as far as the status code, instead of 400, it's going to be a 401. So that is not a bad request. That is actually the authentication error. But again, in this case, just to make it easier, if you need to debug, I'm going to go with no token provided. And then as far as the error, we're going to go with 401. And of course, in order to test it out, why don't we go back? And then I'm just gonna uncheck the authorization, just so we can actually see what we get back. And once we click, check it out. Now we have message no token provided. And what is the error? Of course, error is 401. Now, if I go back to the authorization adder, and if I send, now I can see something went wrong. Try again later. Hmm, that's interesting. So let me double check my code. And yes, of course, it starts with not start with. Let me try one more time. Let's send and there you go. Now, of course, we have hello, John Doe, and of course, the secret as well. And once we have passed the first stage, now I just want to get that token. And we can access it in a following way, where I'm going to go with const token is equal to auth header. And then we want to split it again, this is a string. So we split it on a space and we're looking for the second value. And if you want to double check, let's go with token. And let's console log it just so we are on the same page. So let's send one more time. And as I know, there's a tiny bug there as well. And you should see in the console a token. And I'm also going to fix it over here, where I'm going to say your lucky number. And once we have all of this in place, now, of course, we just need to set up the verification, where yes, we got back the token from the front end. However, now we want to verify whether the token is actually valid. And as far as verification goes something like this, where if you take a look at the docs of the package, the JSON web token one, you'll see that one of the options we have is using try catch. And then we just need to come up with some kind of variable name. In my case, I'm going to go with decoded. And that is equal to the package. So JWT. Now the method name is verify. And here we need to pass into values, we need to pass in the token. And then the second value is that secret string. So again, we go with our process dot env and then the JWT. And if there's some kind of error, for example, 
the token might be expired. We'll handle that in the catch block. And what do we want to do? Well, we want to throw another custom error. And this is going to be the case where I'll show you that vague response where again, we'll throw custom error if we're not able to verify the token. And as far as the response will say not authorized to access this route. Hopefully this is clear. So we try to verify if there's any kind of issue, we throw another custom error. And in this case, we go with not authorized to access this route. And again, the code is still 401 because that is authentication error. And then of course, if we're successful, then we just keep on typing because all the data is going to be in this decoded. Now, what data you might ask? Well, let's go with console log and let's check it out together. So let's console log one more time. Let's send it here. And now, of course, you can see that I get back my ID, username, as well as other two properties issued at an expiration. And of course, all of this is coming from our payload, the one that we passed over here when we signed the token. So of course, you can already imagine that if the name is going to be different for the username, of course, this value will also change. And by accessing that value, now, of course, we can set up a dynamic response. So what do we do over here? We just say, okay, we have access to the decoded one. So let's take our code and just move it up, place it in the try block. And then instead of just console logging, I'll keep the random one and all that. Don't worry. There's going to be a little bit different setup in a second anyway. But instead of John Doe, we'll go over here with decoded. And what is the property that I'm looking for on the object? Of course, that is the username. So we just go back over here to the username. And if I navigate back to the postman, now, of course, once I send, I'll get back to John. So let's go over the steps in the postman first, and then we'll try it out in the front end in our application. So first, let's go with login. Again, I'll try to log in without providing the username, for example. I'll send it over here. Now, of course, I have please provide email and password. So that was that first check. So if we are successful here, if I provide Peter, then of course, I'll get back my token. Awesome. And I can see that the user has been created. Then we want to go to the dashboard and where we have authorization header. Now I want to change this around where instead of this value, again, just make sure there's that space. That's a big deal here. We'll provide this value instead. And now, of course, I have hello, Peter. And then again, some random lucky number. And if everything works in a postman, it should also work on the front end. So let's try it out over here. Let's refresh. Of course, we can see no token present. And in here, I'll just try to get the token without providing the values. And of course, not successful. So I get back the error. And therefore, I'm going to go with Anna. And then again, some kind of dummy password. We send it. Now we're successful user has been created. Of course, I can see that the token is present. Oftentimes the token is going to be in local storage. And of course it is. So now, of course, when we're making those following requests, now the token is present. So we're successful. Now we can clearly see our username and then we're getting those random values. So all the following requests are going to be successful as long as we provide a token. And since token is in the local storage, of course, we can always access it when we make it. And then we're good to go. Now, if we remove it, and in this case, I just set up the functionality that if the user tries to get the token without providing the values, then I just wipe out the token in the local storage. So if we go back, notice it's actually empty. Now I'm not saying that that's always going to be set up on the front end. It's just something that I used in this case. So now if we go back again, we don't have the token. So we get this not authorized to access this route. Nice work. We're actually done with the main functionality. But just like in the previous projects, once everything is in place, let's also work on some improvements, which we'll use heavily in the following projects. And first, I want to set up the authentication middleware. And essentially, the idea is following where, yes, at the moment, we have the dashboard route. And in there, we're successfully checking whether the JSON web token has been provided. And of course, 
if it's there, then we send back the lucky number. If not, then we throw the error. But we need to understand that in a more realistic application, of course, there's going to be multiple routes that use this functionality. And what are we going to do? Are we really going to copy and paste for every route that needs it? Or it just makes more sense to take all of this code, stick it in the middleware, and then just choose which routes need to be authenticated. And of course, the answer is setting up our own middleware. So first, let's go to the middleware directory. In there, you'll find auth.js. And we'll just start very simply by creating a function. That function, of course, is going to be a sync. And we'll be looking for rec, res, and next. And next is very, very important, because otherwise our whole cycle is going to break. And then, of course, we just want to console log. So in the beginning, we'll just console log, and then we'll set up the functionality. So let's go over here. As always, naming is really up to you. I'm going to go with authentication, and then middleware, and that is equal to, like I said, async. Then we go with request and response, and then next. Because remember, in order to move on to the next middleware, which of course, in our case, is going to be a dashboard route, we'll have to call next. And I'm going to go with console log, then I'm looking for rec headers. And then more specifically, I'm looking for the authorization one, just want to check whether it exists. And then I want to go with next, like I said, and then of course, we invoke it. Now we just need to export this. So we're going to go here module and export. And that will be equal to my authentication middleware function. And now another million dollar question. So where are we going to use this middleware? Now in a later project, we'll actually use it on multiple routes. But in this case, we only have dashboard that needs it, correct? So as far as the login, this is going to be for public access. But when it comes to dashboard, this is going to be protected by that authentication middleware. So therefore, in the router, in the main JS, we're going to go here, const. And then of course, I'm looking for my function. And in this case, I'm just going to call this auth middleware. And that is equal to require, of course, then we head to the middleware folder, and the auth file, and the syntax is following where where we have this get method before the dashboard, I actually want to stick my middleware. So I'm going to say auth, and then middleware. And I'll add comma. So now, of course, every time someone's going to be hitting this route, first, they will go through the middleware. And of course, in the middleware, since I have next, then I'll pass to the dashboard. And in order to test it out, I'm just going to navigate to the browser. So this is where I have the working application. And it doesn't really matter whether you're logged in or not, just go here to get data. And of course, in my case, I haven't logged in, I have no token. So therefore, I'm getting back this not authorized access this route. But what I'm more interested is back in my application. In the console, I can see bearer, and that is set to null. So now I know that all the requests that are going to the dashboard are actually hitting this auth middleware first. So now, of course, we just need to add the functionality, and we'll be in good shape. Beautiful. And once our bare bones setup is in place, now we simply want to go back to the controller, the main one, and we'll need to copy and paste two things. And again, I'm just doing this just so we can get to the functionality. And you're looking for JWT, because of course, we'll implement that functionality, as well as the custom API error. And as I said, not in the following videos, we'll work on more errors. So essentially, we'll create here more error classes. So we'll have to do some refactoring as well. But for time being, we'll just grab these two lines of code, we want to go back to the auth, we want to make sure that the paths are correct. So as far as JSON web token, of course, it doesn't really matter. I mean, that's the package we installed, we just want to make sure that this path is correct. And it looks about right. So now, of course, let's go back to the controllers. Let's keep scrolling, keep scrolling. So of course, that was the previous route the login one. And as far as the dashboard, we simply want to take this logic where we're looking for the header. And if there's some kind of issue, of course, we just throw the custom API error, then we get the header. And if everything is great, if we can verify the token, then instead of setting up right away response, 
in our middleware. We're actually going to set up a property on a request object. And the property is going to be user. And then we'll pass it to the next middleware, which, of course, is going to be this dashboard route. So let's go step by step. Let me take these. I mean, what is it? Five lines of code. Take it out. So everything up to the try and catch. You want to go back to the auth JS. Now you want to remove the console log and just keep the next because that is very, very important. Then back in the controller, you also want to take the try block, but we'll have to do a little bit of acrobatics here because I'll actually need these lines of code. So let's go back over here, take the try catch as well, step by step, and then copy and paste. And in here, the logic is following where you want to remove this response with lucky number. So these things go, you want to cut it out and go back to your controller and set it up in a dashboard. So this logic stays, of course, the same where we have lucky number. We generate that. And of course, we only send that response if we're successful. Now, back in the author JS, like I said, we're still checking for the header. We're checking whether it starts with bear. If not, we throw the custom API error. That's why we import it over here. Then we keep on scrolling. We get to the split. We get the token. And now, of course, we have try and catch where we are invoking the verify method. We pass in the token that we're getting back as well as the secret one. And then if we're successful, then instead of sending a response, since we're working in a middleware, the logic is going to be following where I'm going to go with const. And then I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for ID and the username here. And that one will be equal to decoded. So of course, if I'm successful, this is going to have some kind of value. If not, we'll throw the error. And then if that is the case, I want to go with reg dot user. And I'll just set it up to the object where I'll have ID and username. And of course, once I have set up the user property with this object value, now, of course, I want to call next. So we'll move this next up over here. And what happens in the controller in the request, we'll have that user property. And now instead of looking for decoded, of course, we'll look for the user. Now, in order to make it a bit more explicit, I'll actually console log it just so you can see where it's coming from. So I'm going to go here with rec and user so you can clearly see that we're getting that from our middleware, of course. And then instead of looking for decoded, we're going to go here for user and username. Now, in this case, I also need to add rec since, of course, I didn't destructure it. So on the request object, I'm going to have the user property. And in there, I'll have the username as well as ID. And let's just test it out one more time, the functionality. So again, I'm going to be on localhost 3000. I don't have the token. So now, of course, I shouldn't see anything in the console. And I don't because remember, we only get to the dashboard if we're authenticated. So let's try it out here where I'll say Peter. And then again, my secret password, I'll submit. OK, I created a user token as present. And then once I click on getting the data now, of course, I have hello, Peter, and I'm getting the lucky number. And now if I take a look at the console, check it out. Now, of course, on the request object, once we get to the dashboard, we actually have the user with ID and username Peter. And of course, this is coming from our middleware, where essentially, again, we check for the authorization header, then we check for the bearer, we split it up, we get the token, then we use try and catch, because we want to run the verify method. And then we pass in a token, we pass in the secret. And then from the decoded, we get the ID and username. And since we want to pass it to the next middleware, essentially, we create a new object, we say user object on the request, and then pass it on to the next middleware. And of course, if we're not able to verify the token, then we send back our custom API response. And again, the end result is following where you can set up whatever amount of routes you want. And in front of all of them, you can just stick auth middleware. And then you don't have to repeat this code. The code is sitting in one place and check for token. If the token is not present, then you just send back the error response. And once we have the middleware in place, now I want to switch gears 
and talk about the errors. And if we take a look at our application at the moment, we have two types of custom errors. We have one for 400. That's going to be the bad request. And then we have another one for authentication, where, of course, we have 401. And technically, we have been doing fine with just this one custom error, but there's actually a better approach where, yes, we have custom API error that extends from the error. So this logic stays the same, but instead of just using this one class, we'll actually extend from this custom API error. And then for every type of error we have, which again, in our case, R2, we have one for bad request and the second one for authentication, we set up two more classes. And then in those classes, we right away hard code the status code. And I fully understand that this might sound confusing. So let's just start working on it. And in the process, you'll see what I mean. So first, what you want to do in the custom API error, just remove the status code. We'll set them up in the separate classes. And then we want to create three more files. And we're going to start with index.js. And you'll see at the very end of the video why we want to use that. Then we want to set up two more. And we're looking for bad request. And we'll go with JS. And then I'll set up another file by the name of unauthenticated. And then, of course, it is JS. And then in the bad request, what we want to do is pretty much take the code that we have in the custom error one. Pretty much just copy and paste because we'll just change some things around. So I'll copy and paste over here. And then I want to close this one. So I'll say close saved. And then instead of the custom API error, we're going to go with bad request, bad request. And of course, this is going to be extending not from the error. Actually, it's going to be extending from our custom API error. So let's go here with const. And we're looking for custom API error. Now, this is in the same folder, correct? So we just go here with a require. And then we pass in the path. So the path, of course, is custom API error. And instead of, like I said, extending from the error, we're extending from custom API error. And then we still have the constructor. We don't want to use the status code over here. And as I said, not, you know what? In the custom error, I also want to remove it. So we just have the constructor and a super here as far as the message. And then in the bad request, this is where not only we have super method with a message, but we'll also go with this dot status code, status code, and we'll set it equal to some kind of hard coded value. Now for the bad request, what value we're going to use? Well, we're going to go with 400. And then of course, instead of exporting custom API error, we're going to go with bad request. And now we simply want to take all of this code, copy again, just so we can save a little bit of time and paste in the authenticated one. And then, of course, again, we'll have to change some values around where this is going to be the unauthenticated error. So let's go over here on authenticated. And we'll call this error. Of course, we're still looking for the custom one. So we're still extending from this one. Now the status code is going to be 401. And in here we'll also say that we're exporting on authenticated error. And then we want to go to index.js. And here we'll import all three of them, the custom error, the bad request, as well as the unauthenticated. And then we'll export them as one big object. And you'll see once we start refactoring the application, why it's more useful. So essentially, if you want, you can technically leave it the way it is. Just remember that every time you'll need to use one of these, you'll essentially need to look for that specific file. If we set up this index.js, first of all, you'll be able to look just in the errors because by default, the index.js will be served and in there we'll have all of the errors. So let's start here with const and then custom API error. And of course, I'm looking for the file by the name of custom API error, then we copy and paste. And we just want to change these values around. So of course, this will be the bad request one. And then last one will be that authentication one. And of course, we just want to change these files around. So this will be the bad request one. And then the last one 
will be equal to our authentication one. And then we want to set up the object where we'll say module exports, and that is equal to our custom API error, and then the bad request one, as well as the authentication one. Now, of course, at the moment, our imports are a little bit different. But before we do that, I also want to talk about the status codes. So let's just fix the status codes first. And then we'll do both things. We'll import the proper error classes in our application. And we'll also right away set up the status codes using the external library. All right, so far in our application, every time we need a status code, we just type the number value, which is kind of okay, but there's actually a better approach. And that better approach is using the library by the name of HTTP status codes. And of course, we need to install the library. So this is the code if you need it for your own project. In my case, of course, I already installed in the star, so that's why it's available. And then we simply want to get the status codes from the library. And then this is an object. And then as far as the properties, we just need to look for the text values. For example, for 200, we're going to go with OK. Now, if you want to take a look at the codes, of course, just keep on scrolling. And you'll notice that if we want to go with 200 response, of course, then we just type OK. If we want to go with bad request, then we just type it. And this is going to be 400. And hopefully you get the gist. And as a result, we'll accomplish two things. It's going to be easier to understand what is happening as far as our responses instead of juggling the 400s and 401s and all that in your head. And a second thing, of course, we'll have more consistency. So let's try it out. And in this video, we'll just try it out here in the error classes. And then, of course, in the next video, when we'll be refactoring our code, since, of course, we have different set of 40 errors, then we'll also implement those status codes there as well. And what we want to do is go to the bad request, and then below or above the custom API error. Again, this part doesn't really matter. We're just going to go with const and then we're looking for status codes. Now, this is a name, the import. So make sure that the name is exactly the same status codes. And then that one is coming from our library, HTTP status codes. And then instead of this 400, we're going to go with status codes. And then we're just going to be looking for bad request. Notice how they right away give you all of these suggestions. Again, it's easier to read. It's easier to understand what is happening. And second, we'll have the consistency. And we want to do the same thing in on authenticated as well. So let's navigate to this file. Again, we'll copy and paste just so we can speed this up. So copy and paste, we get the status codes. And in this case, of course, we're not looking for the bad request, which one we're looking for on authorized. So let's go over here. Let's say status codes dot, and then we're looking for the unauthorized one. And once we have fixed the error classes using the status codes, now, of course, we just need to hop back to our application and refactor it since, of course, our error handling has changed as well. Awesome. And as far as the refactoring, we actually need to work in three files. We want to look for our middleware. So, of course, that is going to be the auth one. So let me just close all of them for now. And then let's start from the scratch. So like I said, we're going to be looking for the auth middleware. That's the first one. Then we also want to work in the main JS. We'll have to change the code here as well. And then lastly, of course, it's also going to happen in the error handler. So where we have the middleware for error handler, we'll have to change some things around here as well. So first, let's start in the auth JS. Now, what error are we throwing over here? Well, the moment it is custom API error. But actually, what error is it? Well, of course, it is the authentication error, correct? And we already have the class for that, which has the unauthorized status code. So what we simply want to do is look for index.js. So of course, this is going to be the errors folder. And then more specifically, we want to look for this error. I'm just going to copy this value. And then back in the auth, now, of course, we're exporting as named exports. So we need to change this around where I'll say, OK, I'm expecting here the object. And this is now going to be coming from the custom error. It's actually going to be coming from the errors. Copy and paste. And now, of course, I just get the unauthenticated error. 
And then instead of the custom API error, we're gonna go here and we'll say on authenticated error. And now, of course, we don't need to pass in that status code, correct? We just need to provide the message. So let's remove it over here. And then we want to do the same in the catch, correct? So the functionality is going to be exactly the same. And just so we can speed this up, maybe let me grab the first part over here and copy and paste. And then again, we don't need the status code. We just remove it and we'll be in good shape. So that's the first file we want to fix. Then we want to go to the main JS in the controller. And pretty much it's the same thing, where at the moment I have custom API error. But effectively, what error I want to throw here? Well, I want to throw the bad request one, correct? And pretty much everything after that is just for successful responses. And I think I'm going to remove the console log since we already covered that. And then let's scroll up again. We want to change what we're actually requesting. So in this case, I'm looking for this bad request error. So let's go back to the main JS and we'll set it up as an object over here. And then again, we're not looking in the custom error. We're looking in the errors. And keep in mind that since we're exporting as object, if you have multiple errors, we simply want to add comma and then just get them. So now we're looking for bad request error. And instead of custom API error, we'll exchange it for bad request error. We already have the status code. So we can remove that. And then finally, let's go to the error handler one. And in here, of course, I'm still looking for the custom API error. So as far as the instance, this doesn't change because both of them, the bad request, as well as the unauthenticated extend from our custom API. So this will be still true. The difference, of course, is that we're looking for the object in this case, and we're looking in the errors. That's number one. And the second thing we want to do is get those status codes. And that is coming from the HTTP package. So let's say here, HTTP status codes. And in the if block, everything is going to stay exactly the same. Because of course, we're getting the status code from the object, correct? And then as far as the message, it's also there. But when it comes to this 500, we can change this around. We can say that we'll be looking in the status codes, and this is going to be equal to the internal server error. And when it comes to message, I guess it can stay the same. And with all of this in place, let's just navigate to the browser and then let's test it out. Let me refresh. Let me remove that token. So we're not cheating here. So let me remove it from the local storage and let's try it out. And let me refresh one more time. We have no token. Okay, that's awesome. I can see not authorized to access this route. So I can clearly see that my functionality works, at least for now. And then, of course, if I want to see something, I'm going to go with Anna and then I say secret and then we submit and user is created, token is present. So now, of course, let's get data. And of course, the user is still the same and everything is correct. And if you want to try out setting up the user without any kind of values, let's try it out. We have please provide email and password. And if we inspect, we should see in the console bunch of errors, meaning we have one for 401 and then we have one for bad request. And again, not to be redundant, but all of this code refactoring and then introducing new packages as well as setting up more error classes is going to make way more sense as we progress to more complex projects. My idea is following where I want to show you the simple setup first and then show you these changes on a small project, because that way I believe that it's going to be easier for you to follow along because now we have only what six, seven files, something like that. Correct. But as our projects grow, we'll still rely on these topics. We'll still rely on multiple error classes. We'll rely on the status codes as well as setting up the middleware. But of course, then it's going to make way more sense because we'll have way more routes and way more functionality. And with all of this in place, we're done with the project. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it. And I hope to see you in the next one. All right. And welcome to our next project, the jobs API where we'll finally combine our auth knowledge with CRUD functionality 
and as a result, we'll have an API where users can log in and manage their job search. During the project, we'll also learn how to deploy our app to Heroku, so host our apps on the cloud and set up nice documentation with Swagger UI. For this project, I still managed to build a matching front end app, but moving forward, so in our future apps, I'll exclusively use documentation to showcase the end result, since building a front end project for every API is just too time consuming. And before we take a look at the features, let me stress one more time. Our job will be setting up the API, so the back end. The front end is there just to give you a better overall perspective on how the API is going to be consumed in real life. And basically, the idea is following where we have some kind of front end application and we can log in or register. So, of course, if I haven't created my account, then first I would need to register. So I go over here and then I'll type some kind of gibberish. I'll say that I'm Peter. The email will be peter at gmail.com. And then we go with secret. Now, regardless, whether you're logging in or registering, we'll be sending the token, the JSON web token. And then on the front end, we'll right away be able to showcase the user account. So if I go here and if I say that I want to register and if I submit, if I provide the correct values, now I can see my dashboard. Since I just created my account, I have no jobs. So of course, in here, I just need to provide the values. I'm going to go with Apple again, and I'm going to be looking for front and position. I submit. Now I have my job. I can delete the job. I can edit the job. And I can also take a look at the single job. So in this page, I'm actually fetching data about that one single job, and I have functionality to edit. Once I change some values, now when I'm sending this HTTP request, this is going to be a patch request. So in here, I edit, and if I provided the correct values, then I successfully modified the job. So now I can go back to the dashboard and I see that I have my job, but in this case, instead of pending, which is going to be the default case, we have the interview. And if I'm no longer interested, or maybe they sent me a rejection, I can also remove the job. And once I do that, I have no jobs to display. And as a quick side note, if you're just interested in the front end project, just navigate to johnsmilk.com. And at this point, it is still on a homepage. But if you don't see it there, it's always going to be available in the projects page. And you can quickly find it if you look for YouTube. Now, YouTube doesn't mean that the project is going to be on YouTube. I'm just grouping my projects that way. And then in here, you can take a look at the application. If you click on this massive, massive button, and if you want to take a look at the source code, just look for star files or complete. Both of them actually go to the same repo. And then in the source, you'll be able to find everything. And a few things to know about the project. When it comes to the URL, of course, I'm using my API. So if you want to clone the project and test it out on your backend, you just need to change the URL. And that is in the Axios.js. So in the source, I have Axios JS, and as you can see, the URL is pointing to my backend. But if you want to test it out on yours, you just need to change the URL. And lastly, keep in mind that I recorded this in July of 2021. So eventually, once the React 18 is stable, I might refactor the code to take advantage of the new features. All right. And as always, we'll start with the setup. And essentially, we're looking for the folder number six of the jobs API. And then more specifically, we have two more directories. We have the final one, as well as the star. And of course, we'll do all of our work in the star. And then final is for your reference. So this is the complete project. Now, at this point, you should be able to already spin up the final project if you want to. Just look for README. And then here you'll find the info where we do need to create a dot .env file in a root and then set up two variables the Mongo URI, as well as JWT secret one. And of course, this is going to be the connection string, the Mongo URI, which you're getting from MongoDB. You just need to set up the proper password as well as database you want to use. And as far as the JWT secret one, 
for time being, you can set up some kind of silly value like we did in a previous project, because in the jobs one, I'll show you where to get a proper JWT secret value. And after that, just run npm install and npm start. And the final project should be good to go. Now, as far as the starter, we'll just navigate here to the folder. And the first thing that I want to do is go with CD and then drag and drop the starter. And before we do anything, let's just go with npm install and npm start. So that should install all the dependencies and spin up the dev server. And as far as the setup, in this case, we're going to have two controllers, one for authentication and the second one for the jobs. Again, we have DB one where we're connecting to the database that should be already familiar. Then we have errors folder with all our classes. So we start with our custom API one. And then we have one for bad request. We have one for not found on authenticated as well as index JS, where we essentially pull in all the classes and then we can start using them around the project. Since we have index JS, we simply need to reference the errors folder and that will be the default export. And then we have middleware one where we've got a authentication one. So essentially this is going to be exactly the same like we did in the previous project. However, on this one, I want to retype from the scratch because we only did it once. And then probably in the upcoming projects, we will reuse this one as well. And then of course we have error handler one. So this is where I got the custom API one. And then I'm just checking if that is the case, if that's our custom API, we send the response with the status code as well as the error message. And I'm using the status codes library. And I prefer using this package because in my opinion, it adds a bit more consistency to our application, as well as it's easier to understand what's happening with a status code. In this case, we have internal server error. And also during this project, we'll do more work here in the error handler one, because I want to show you how we can check for multiple mongoose errors instead of sending back always this 500 one with the long error message. Then we have not found. So if the user is looking for the route that doesn't exist, we send back 404 and then a route does not exist. After that, we have two models. So we'll have job and user. And also the same goes for routes. We'll have the auth as well as the jobs. And then eventually we come to app.js where again, we have two packages that we have used quite extensively, .env as well as the express async errors. I don't think I need to repeat what they're doing. Then we're looking for express. We invoke it and we set it equal to the app. We have two middlewares. We have not found one as well as the error handler one. Then we invoke .json because there's going to be some post routes and we want to access data in reg.body. There's a simple route app.get, just a forward slash. So this, of course, is going to be to our homepage just so we can test it out whether that's the postman or the browser. And I pass in the not found one as well as the error handler one in app.use. And I set up the port. In this case, I'm going to go with 3000. I believe the final one is 5000. And then we have a start function where we just invoke app.listen. And eventually we'll add here more code. If you can see clearly in console server is listening on port 3000. And if you navigate to the browser and go for localhost 3000, you can see the jobs API. We are in good shape and we can start setting up our application. All right. And once our basic app is up and running, let's start setting up the structure and we'll start with our controllers. So essentially in here, we want to set up the functions that eventually will be controllers for our routes. And I want to start with auth. And again, this is just going to be a structure. So we'll just add some dummy code like registered user or login user and that sort of stuff. So let's go here with const register. So this is going to be our first function. And again, it's going to be a sync, rec, and res. And in the body, like I said, I'm just going to go with res.send and we'll go with the register user. Register user. And then as far as the author out, the second one will be a login one. So let's just copy and paste. And I simply want to change here the name for the function as well as the string. So let's go with register login, or I'm sorry, 
we're gonna go with login user. My bad. So login, and let's go with user. Since I have the controller, I also want to export it. So we're gonna go with module, then export, and I'll set it up as an object, and we'll go with the register and login. And essentially, in order to speed it up, I just want to take this whole thing, copy, and then back in the jobs, we're gonna go with get all jobs, get job, create job, update job, and delete job. Essentially, we have a CRUD functionality. So I can just remove the second function as well as the login one. We will rename them. And let's just start with get all jobs. So this is going to be a get route that gets me all the jobs. So I'll say the same thing in the string. So get all jobs. Let's just change what function we're exporting. And now we want to copy and paste this four times, I believe one, two, three, and four. So we'll go here with get job. This is going to be a route to get a single job. Then we have one for creating a job. So create and job. As far as the string, we'll go with create job. Then we have one for updating the job. Update job. And let's do it over here as well. Update job. And lastly, we have one for deleting job. So let's say delete and job. The same goes for the string. So delete job. And now I just want to add the rest of the functions in my object, the one that I'm exporting. So I'll go with get job. Then we're looking for create job, the update job. So comma, update job, and delete job. And once we have the basic controller structure in place, now, of course, we can do the same thing with our routes. And as far as our routes, let's start with auth.js. And of course, we need to set up the router. So let's go with const express is equal to acquire. Acquire. And of course, I'm looking for express. Remember, we need to go with some kind of variable in my case router. And we'll set it equal to your express dot and router. We invoke it. And then we'll import both of the functions from auth controller. And remember, the names were register and login. So let's go over here, login and register. And both of these things are coming from our controller, the auth one. So let's navigate over there. We have controllers and, of course, the auth one. And once I have my imports in place now, of course, we just need to set up the routes. And if you remember, we also had an option of router and then dot and then whatever is the method. And both of these are going to be the post routes. So I'll simply go with router dot post. And then we go with forward slash register. And then, of course, we'll pass in our controller. After that, we'll copy and paste again, router dot post. In this case, we're looking for the login one. And of course, the controller we'll invoke is also going to be a login one. And then at the very, very end, we'll just go with module exports. And that is equal to the router. So that should do it for auth.js. And before we navigate to app.js and import it and set it up, let's also do the same thing with the jobs router, because essentially the idea is exactly the same. Where I want to go to jobs, and again, in order to speed it up, let's just take these two lines of code. And I'm sorry, I navigated to the wrong file. So here in the jobs, I set up the router. Yep, that stays the same. And now we just want to go with const and we want to import. We want to import get all jobs, get job. Also, I'm going to be looking for create job, create job, and then we want to update the job. And lastly, we want to get a job or I'm sorry, not get job, delete job, delete and job. And all of that is coming again from the controllers, correct? So go with require and we'll set it equal to the controllers folder. And of course, we're looking for the jobs. And once we have these imports in place now, of course, we'll do the other way where we go with router dot route and then we'll have post and get on the forward slash and then we'll have the get delete and patch on forward slash and then the route param so let's go with router dot route and this is going to be the forward slash of course and therefore we'll go with post so this is going to be to add the job and get all the jobs remember that was the structure for rest api and we're looking for the controller of create job 
of course, let's go with dot and then get. And this is going to get me all the jobs. Then we'll copy and paste and we'll add here the ID. Remember the route params. And in this case, we're not going to have post. So I can remove this one and we'll start with get. Now, this is going to get me the single job here. Then we're going to have one for delete. Of course, the controller is the lead job. And then lastly, we have one for patch. And here we'll pass in update job. And then at the very, very end, of course, I want to go with module dot exports and the router. Now, of course, if you prefer this syntax, you can also use it here in all JS. I just thought that this is a nice refresher where, of course, we can set up our routes this way as well. And once we have both of the route files in place, now, of course, we just need to go to app.js. We need to import both of them. And again, as always, this is really up to you. But I'm going to do that above the error handlers because there's also going to be a connect DB here. So connect DB is still coming up. Let's just go with routers. And here, let's say const auth router. And that, of course, is equal to require. And we're looking in the routes. And then more specifically, of course, I want to access the auth one, copy and paste. And this is going to be a jobs router. Of course, this is coming from routes and forward slash and jobs. And then I don't think we need a dummy one anymore. I think we're pretty clear on what's happening. So now, of course, let's remove it. Let's say app dot use. And as far as the path, I'm going to go with API version one again. That's my setup in Postman. So we might as well continue using that one. And as far as the auth, I'm going to go with forward slash auth. And of course, what that means in here, we have the full path of API version one auth and then a register. And the same goes for the login. And as far as the jobs, we'll do exactly the same where we'll go with API version jobs and then the forward slash is just going to have the create one and get all of them. And then the route params will have the rest of the three. Hopefully that is clear because again, we pretty much keep repeating the same thing. So let's go with API version one and then auth. And then let's just pass in the auth router. So now, of course, we just need to copy and paste. And let's go with jobs one. And of course, now we want to implement the jobs router. So I'll save over here. And I don't think I'm going to do any kind of testing since it doesn't make sense at the moment. I'm just going to check my error. So it says over here, router.post requires a callback function, but it's not given. So let's see, let's see, let's see. Maybe I didn't export something. So let's go to jobs. That's the router. And of course, I'm looking here for the auth one for some reason. So let me move this one. And then as far as create job, looks like I didn't export it or something along those lines. So let me take a look at the jobs. Of course, there's a naming issue. It's a create job. So create job. And of course, I need to do it over here as well. So once I fix this tiny bug, now we should be heading in the right direction where we have the routes, we have the controllers. So now, of course, we just need to start adding the logic. And the reason why I'm not testing anything right now, because of course, we'll work in each of the controllers quite extensively. And before we do anything, of course, we'll just check whether we're getting this silly string response. And if we do, then of course, we'll work on our logic. All right. And before we can start registering our users, the last thing that we need to do as far as the general setup is to set up connection to the database. And of course, we have the function. We already have connect JS with the functionality where, of course, we use the mongoose. We set up the connect. We pass in the URL. And of course, these are going to be our options to remove those depreciation warnings. And the only thing we need to do is set up in a star dot env and here let's go with mongo underscore uri and of course you want to pass in your connection string so let's go to connect we're looking for connect your application i'll take this one over here and copy and paste and as far as database i mean it's not going to be a surprise if i go over here with zero six and i'll call this jobs api 
And then, of course, I just need to provide my password. And once you do that, just navigate to app.js. So let me close everything just so it's not so busy. And I guess in the app.js, I'm going to go above the routers. We'll say const connect and then db. And that will be equal to require, of course. And we're looking for our function. And that is located in the db folder. Not the error, sorry. The db one. And then we're looking for connect. And then we'll just scroll down where we have the start. And we'll go with await. And we'll invoke the connect db. And now, of course, we want to go with process dot env. And then the mongo mongo underscore and URI. So underscore and URI. And once I save, and uh, if I can still see servers listening on port 3000, that means that our connection is ready to go. And now can finally start setting up our authentication. All right. And once the database connection is in place, the first thing we want to do is to create a user model. And in the process, we'll learn a few more built in Mongo's validators. And as I note, if you need to reference the steps we're about to take, just navigate to the readme in the root. So in the star root, look for readme. And here you'll find all the steps. And since I want to show you more validators, let me open up the mongoose docs. So in here, we're looking for a validation. And then more specifically, just look for the string one, because in the user, pretty much all of them are going to be strings. So just click on any of these ones. And here and there, I'll just use this as a reference, just to showcase what's happening. And essentially, we want to navigate, of course, to the user model. So the file is over here. And remember, we're looking for the mongoose, of course, so const mongoose is equal to require. And of course, I'm looking for the mongoose. And after that, we will add two more packages, the JWT one, the JSON web token one, as well as bcrypt.js, but of course, that is still coming up. And I want to start by creating a schema. So let's go over here, let's call this user schema, and that is equal to new mongoose. And of course, we're looking for the schema here in this case. And I want to go with parentheses, pass in the object. And as far as the properties, we'll have three, we'll have name, email, as well as the password. So let's go over here with the name. That's going to be the first one. I think I can close the sidebar just so I have a little bit more real estate. And we'll start with type. Type will be equal to string. Then we'll right away set it equal to required. And then we'll set it equal to array. Remember, the first value is whether it is true or false. Of course, in my case, I'm going with true. And then we'll say, please provide a name. So of course, that is our required validator. And after that, I just want to showcase that in the mongoose docs, we can see that we have min length and max length. Now, of course, as far as the values, that's really up to you. In my case, I'm going to go with min length, and I'll set it equal to three. And of course, I'm going to also set up a max length. And I'm just going to say 50. Then I want to go with email. And in order to speed this up, we will copy and paste. And of course, I'll change the name here. This is going to be an email, then I'll still set it as required. So that's going to stay the same. Let's set it over here. And then we also have a match one, which pretty much creates a validator that checks if the value matches the given regular expression. Now, why we want to use that? Because I want to use the regular expression to check for the valid email. There's plenty of suggestions out there. Most likely the first answers that are going to pop up are going to be from Stack Overflow. Just pick the one that makes the most sense to you and you'll be good to go. Now, as far as this project, you have two options. You can either get the code in the readme or just look in the final one. So in the final, of course, I have the models and all that. And then just look for the user one and you can take the entire property. That's really up to you. So in my case, I'm just going to navigate to the readme. I'll take here this code. And then I want to go back to the user. And more specifically, the email, I want to remove both of these, the min length and max length. And then we want to go with match. And we pass in the array. So essentially, that's the syntax. And then we want to pass in the 
regular expression, then comma, and then whatever error message we want to provide. And in this case, it's pretty much going to be the same. I'm just going to say, please provide valid email. And once I have the match in place, the last thing I want to set up for the email is unique and true. And essentially what unique does, it creates a unique index. And this is something you need to be aware of where technically it's not a validator. And that becomes important when we run validate method manually, which we haven't done. So don't lose your sleep over that. And when you're writing automated tests, and of course, you can read more about it in the docs. But the way it works, it just creates that unique index. So if I'm trying to save a user, but there is already a email in use, then I'll get the duplicate error message. And lastly, I want to go with password. And in here, I think I'm going to take the name because pretty much is going to be exactly the same where I'm going to go with password, password, and then required will be true. Now, of course, the error message is going to be a little bit different. Let's say here password. And then as far as the min length and max length, I think I'm going to go with six and no longer than 12. So let's set it up this way. We have the user in place. The only thing left to do is, of course, export it. So let's go with module and exports and we'll set it equal to our mongoose model. And of course, we want to pass in our name. And in my case, I'm going to go with user as well as the user schema. So user and schema. And once we save, now, of course, we can start setting up our register controller. Beautiful. Our user model is in place. So now, of course, let's set up the first route and the steps are going to be following. Where first, we want to validate a name, email and password, whether, of course, the user has provided the correct values. And in this case, I'll purposely go with Mongo's option, just because I want to show you how we can send back nice error responses instead of those big objects. Then we want to hash the password. And don't worry if this looks like gibberish to you right now. Of course, I'll cover it extensively a little bit later. After that, if we're successful, if we can hash the password, if the values have been provided, then of course, we create the user. And once we have the user, we want to create that token that's going to be associated with that user. And with that token, the user can start creating resources, which of course, in our case, is going to be jobs. And in order to get that token to the user, of course, we will include it in our response. So let's get cracking. And of course, we're looking for the controllers in this case. And of course, I have the final open. So I'm actually in a wrong folder. So let me look for controllers. We're looking for the auth. And of course, more specifically, the register one. We're going to start by importing the model. So in here, I'm going to set up a user. And that is going to be equal to require. Then we're looking two levels up. And of course, I'm looking for the models. And then more specifically, a user model. And once I have the model, before we do anything here, let's just check in the postman whether we're getting this silly string. Because if we don't, then of course, we do need to troubleshoot. So let me navigate back. Of course, here I have all my workspaces and I'll create a new one. That's not a surprise. I will rename it and I'll say 06 and let's call this jobs API. Now the URL, of course, is going to stay the same. Remember that global variable. So that saves us a little bit of time. And I want to go with new request. This is going to be a post request. And here I'm going to be looking for my URL, of course. So URL. And then remember, we're looking for auth and register. Hopefully that is correct. Let me just double check. So in the app.js, yeah, I have API version one. So that should be still in my global variable in the postman. And then more specifically auth. And then if we take a look at the routes in here in the auth, of course, I have the register. And like I said, both of them are going to be post routes. So why don't we start by selecting a body, then we're going for raw, we want to go with a JSON. And then let's just set up the name. And it's not going to be surprised if I'm going to go with john, then as far as the email, let's just go with the dummy one. So I'm going to say john at 
gmail.com. And then lastly, we want to go with password. And I'm just going to stick with secret because that's the most simplest one, in my opinion. So I have name, email, as well as the password. And of course, once I send, I should get register user. If you don't, then again, please troubleshoot because otherwise anything we're about to do, it's not going to make sense. And before we move along, let me just save this one. And I'm going to look for my jobs. And let's just call this a register and user. So let's save it over here. And let's right away test whether we're getting back the correct values, meaning whether I can access them in a reg dot body. So we'll change this one around, where we'll say res dot JSON, and I'm just going to pass in a reg dot body. Again, in this case, I'm just checking whether my middleware is correct. And if I can see all the three values that I'm sending from my postman, then of course, we are in good shape. Now, I also want to get the status codes. Remember, that was the library that we used before. So let's go over here, let's say const, and we're looking for status codes. And that is coming from our library, the HTTP status codes. So require, require, and we're looking for the HTTP status codes. And then in here, I want to set up the status, status, and of course, dot JSON after that. And let's just go with status codes. And then we'll set it up as created. Because remember, we are creating a resource. So this will send back the 201. And once we have all of this in place, now, of course, we can create that new user, correct? So let's go here, let's say const user, and we'll go with await, because of course, this is asynchronous, then the model name user, and we'll go with create method. And in the create method, since I want mongoose to do all the validation, I'll simply pass in reg dot body, just like we're doing over here. So now, of course, I can remove from my JSON. And for time being, I'll just send back the user. Our current code actually is a big, big mess, because we're saving the passwords as they come in as strings. And that's a very, very bad practice. And don't worry, we will fix that a little bit later. For now, I just want to see whether everything works. And once we hop back to the postman, we should be able to send the request. And in my response, I can see that I created a new resource in a Mongo database, since I have that underscore ID, and then the rest of the properties that I provided in my request. And with this in place, now, of course, we can move on to our next step. Beautiful. We can save our user. And before we cover why it's such a bad practice to save our password as a string. Now, let me remind you about the error checking. And more specifically, let me just jog your memory on the fact that we can check for the empty values right in the controller. Because keep in mind that at the moment, we are doing that using the mongoose. So first, let me show you how we can do that in the controller. And then I'll talk about it, why we're checking in the mongoose, essentially what I'm trying to accomplish. And if you remember, we simply check it in the following way, where we go with name, email, and password. Now, all of that is coming from rec that body, of course. And then we want to go with if and if one of the values is missing, then we'll throw our own custom error, more specifically, the bad request one. So let's say over here email. And then we'll do the same thing for the password. So if one of them is missing, then of course, we'll throw the error. And of course, we need to import that. So we'll say here const, and we're looking for bad request, quest, and error. So that's the one we're looking for. Now, if you don't want to make the typo, then of course, just navigate to the errors folder, more specifically index.js, and then just grab this value. So that way you'll avoid some unnecessary typos. So let me just make sure that the name is correct. Looks about right. And then we want to go with require, of course. We're going two levels up and we're looking for the errors. And since we have index.js over there, of course, we don't need to be more specific. By default, we'll get back the index.js. And once I have the import in place, now, of course, we just want to throw the error in the if block, where it'll say throw new. And of course, I'm looking for bad request one. And then we just need to pass in the message because remember, 
the status code is already there. And let's just say, please, please provide name, email and password and password. And once I save and once we navigate back to the postman, if I'll remove the password completely and if I'll just send notice now, of course, I will get the message. Now, our functionality will still work because, of course, we're using the mangoes validators, even if I remove this code. So if I comment this one out and if we go back and if we send without a password or without any of these two values as well, of course, we'll get back the error. Now, the reason why I'm using the Mongo's validator, because during this project, I also want to show you how we can send back more meaningful response, because at the moment, of course, I'm sending 500, which technically isn't a case, because, of course, now we have a bad request instead of internal server error. And also notice these massive objects probably would be better if we would send just please provide the password or the email or the name. And therefore, in this project, we will use Mongoose validators quite a bit, just because, of course, I want to show you how we can send back more meaningful messages. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to check in the controller. So, of course, this one is optional, but there's going to be some cases where, yes, we will have to set up that check directly in the controller. So this one I'll remove because this pretty much is a repetition here. But when it comes to different routes, yes, there might be some cases where we check directly in the controller. Hopefully that is clear. So now we can start tackling the password issue. Not bad, not bad. If we take a look at our database, we should see users collection and overall life is great. If only not for one big doozy. Notice how we store password as string. So now if someone breaks into my database, he or she can easily ruin the life for all my users, since in most cases, people use the same password for everything. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from this course, please never ever store user passwords as strings. Trust me, they will thank you for that later. Okay, but well, what's the solution? Well, we want to hash them instead, which in simple terms means generating random bytes and combining it with the password before we pipe it through the hash function, a mathematical algorithm that maps data of any size to a bit string of fixed size. Something to remember, hashing is a one way street, meaning it cannot be reversed. Also, if the input changes even tiny bit, the resulting hash will be completely different, which is really, really good for storing passwords since we can accomplish two things at once. Store passwords in a form that protects them even if the password itself is compromised and at the same time being able to verify the correct user password, both of which we'll cover extensively in the upcoming lessons. When it comes to password hashing for this and following projects, we'll use a library by the name of bcrypt.js. Again, the library is called bcrypt.js. And if you're using the star, I already installed it for you so we can start using it right away. And as far as the syntax for hashing the password, it goes something like this. Well, first, we want to import the library, of course, and we're looking for the bcrypt.js again. Please keep in mind that the library name is bcrypt.js. Don't install the bcrypt one and then wonder why you have bugs. So again, the name of the library is bcrypt.js. And the only reason why I'm telling you that because fully understand that it's very easy to mix them up. And once we have access to the library, instead of dumping the entire body with our name, email and password, we want to create a new temporary user object. And in here, I'll just pull out the values from the regular body. So my apologies, we already had this code, but I removed it with a bad request. So now I'll have to retype it one more time. So we'll look for name, email and password. And all of that is coming from rec.body. And then I want to set up the temp user object. And of course, keep in mind that in the temp user, all three properties 
need to be there. Otherwise, we'll get back the error. So of course, in here, I'm passing rec dot body. Now I want to set up a new object. And you'll see why I'm telling you that in a second. And effectively, I first want to set up the hashed password. And then I'll go over line by line and explain what's happening. So let's start over here with const temp user. And we'll use the ES6 thing, where I'll go with name is equal to name and email is equal to email. And what I want to do here is set up also a password, but password will be equal to a hashed password, which of course, at the moment we don't have. And in order to set up the hashed password, we need to run two methods. We need to run gen salt and then the actual hash method. And first, I want to create a variable and I'll say salt. And we have an option of running them asynchronously. So I'll just go with await. Then I'm looking for bcrypt. And like I said, the method name is gen salt. And then we want to pass in the number value. Again, I'll explain all of this in great detail in a second. And then once we have the salt, then we want to create that hashed password. So let's say over here, hashed and password, and we'll go with await, then bcrypt again, bcrypt, and the method name in this case is hash. And we need to pass in two things. We want to pass in the password we want to hash, as well as the random bytes, which essentially is that salt. So let's start over here with password, the then comma, then we pass in the salt. And now where we have the password in the temp user, instead of directly using the password, we'll go with hashed password. And now, of course, instead of dumping the entire rec dot body, we'll go with dot dot dot. Again, we want to spread them out. And then we'll go with temp user. And once we save all of this, now let's hop over to the postman. And let's try to send the request. So in here, we need to keep in mind two things. First, the fact that we have set up four unique emails. So if we'll try to send the same email, we'll get the error response. That's number one. Number two, remember when we're setting up the password, the basic password, we also add the max length since I wanted to showcase that we have that value there. Now, in this case, of course, we will get an error because the hashed value is going to be way longer than 12. So let's try it out. Let's send. And like I said, we will get an error where the max length is 12. And of course, this is the hashed password value. And in order to fix that, of course, we just need to go to our user model and then remove the max length. Like I said, I added this just so I can see that we have this option. But of course, in our case, we are not going to use it. And then once I fix that, then the another bug is going to be that we have a unique email. So if I send with john at gmail.com, of course, I'm going to get an error, which pretty much tells me that I have Mongo error. And more specifically, there is an issue with an email. And this is the case where, again, we'll work on these custom error messages in a second. Now we simply want to change the john to john1 at gmail.com. And once I send, check it out. Now, of course, I'm getting back the user. Now, it's still not a good idea to send back the password. So that's also something that we'll work on a little bit later. Now, the good news is that if we navigate right now to our MongoDB, and if we take a look, we'll see our second user with a email of John1. And of course, now the password is hashed. And what that means is that even if someone breaks into our database and steals all the data, instead of actual password values, they will get the hashed ones, which prevents them from easily reusing them later. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't protect your database. Of course not. That's not what I'm saying. Just make sure that you always, always hash your passwords and never, ever, ever store them as strings. And as far as the code, if we take a look at auth.js in line nine, we generate salt, which essentially just means random bytes. And we do that by running the method gen salt. And in there, we provide a number of rounds. So how many random bytes we'll get? And of course, the bigger the number, the more random bytes we'll get. And of course, that also means that the more secure our password is going to be. 
But we also need to keep in mind the more rounds you have, the more processing power is going to require. And therefore, I just went with 10, which I believe is a default one. And trust me, that is already a very, very secure password. And then, of course, we take that salt. So those random bytes and we pass in the hash method and hash method is simply looking for the password. So the password we want to hash as well as the salt. And once we provide both those values, as a result, we get back that hashed password. And of course, that one we can safely store in our database. So we just add it to our user and we're good to go. Beautiful. We now know how to hash user passwords. And if we take a look at our register user steps, essentially, we just need to generate a token, which should sound already familiar since we spend the entire project on that. And uh, we'll be good to go, right? Well, yes and no. That's true. We don't have much left. But if we take a look at our controller, it's getting somewhat busy. So if we'll keep on adding more functionality and just keep jamming the code in the controller, eventually it's going to get bloated and way harder to manage. Now, what's the solution you might ask? Well, another set of middleware. Only in this case, we're talking about the Mongoose middleware. But just keep one thing in mind. The end result is going to be exactly the same. We'll still hash users' passwords. It's just the logic will be stored nicely in a separate place. And since I want to show you the entire documentation, I'm going to navigate back. We're looking for the middleware. And of course, you can read yada, yada, yada. We have pre and post. So before and after hooks. And essentially, we're looking for pre and more specifically, pre save. And the way we set it up, we have the schema. So in our case, of course, that is going to be our user schema. Then we go with pre. So that's the syntax. And we're looking for save. So before we save the document and then in the callback function, this is where we can access the properties in a document and do some exciting stuff. And of course, since this is a middleware, then we just go with next. And once we're done, we pass it on to the next middleware. Now, I'll also show you with async await. So this is coming up first. Let's just focus on this next one over here. And essentially what we want to do is take the bcrypt. We'll just save a little bit of time and we will go to our models. We're looking for the user one, of course. And then here, let's copy and paste. We have the bcrypt. Let's keep on scrolling. OK, that's our setup. And here, this is where we want to go with our schema. So before we set up the model, we'll go with user schema. That's the name, of course. Then we're looking for pre and then save. So pre save. And since we'll use await, we'll right away set it up as a sync. And then let's go with function. And I highly, highly, highly suggest using the good old function keyword value, because that way this will be scoped to our document. So if you'll go with arrow functions, if you're familiar with them, you know that as far as scoping this, there's different set of rules. In this case, if we use the good old function, that's why you'll see that in a docs as well. This will always point to our document. So in here, let's go with our function. And it is a sync. Nice. Then let's pass in the next, of course. And then remember the functionality. What are we looking for over here? Well, I want to generate the salt, correct? And of course, I want to get the password. And just so we get comfortable, let's write it from the scratch. So let's go to the user one. And essentially, I want to go with const salt. So now we're generating those random bytes. So let's just go over here with await and then bcrypt. And of course, the function name was gen salt. And I'm not going to go 20 rounds. I'm going to go with 10 here. And then as far as the password, well, this is where the callback function comes into play. Where in this function, this will point to the document. So when we type this over here, basically what we're talking about is our document. Before I want to save a document, what do we want to accomplish? Well, we want to hash the password, correct? So what we can do, we can go with this dot and we're looking for password. Of course, this is over here and we simply want to go with await and we want to hash it. We want to go with await, then bcrypt. And then, of course, the method name 
is hash. And then we're looking for this dot password. So our current password for saving. And then we pass in salt. And that's it. That's all we have to do. And once we're done with the functionality, what's left? Well, we want to pass it on to the next middleware. So we just go with next and we invoke it. And now check it out. If we take a look at our controller, since we're not sending the bad request here anyway, I don't really need all these lines of code. That's it. I simply want to take my body just like we had before with dot 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 rec dot body and everything else is taken care of over here. And you have to agree that this is much cleaner and nicer to work with. So let's go back. And then, like I said, I'm not interested in any of these things over here. And we'll simply go with dot 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 rec dot body. I'm still sending the user just because I want to showcase that we'll be hashing the password, but don't worry. That's also not a good practice to send back the password. So we won't do that in a few seconds. So let's go back to our postman. We want to send it and check it out. We have John with John, blah, blah, blah. And of course, we have our hashed value. So our functionality still works. And the last thing that I want to cover in this video, notice the docs in Mongo's 5.0, blah, blah, blah. Next, we can go with async await. Well, that simply means that back in our user one, we can just remove it. And what they're telling us in the docs that it's still going to work. So let's test it out. In this case, I'm going to go with John too. Since remember, we have those unique emails. Let's send it and we still get the response. So we know that that works. And if I go to my database, now of course, I should have quite a few users already there with hashed passwords, apart from the first one. Of course, that is where the secret is. And now I can remove it and we're good to go. Now we can hash the password, but we're doing that using the Mongo's middleware. Nice. We're a little bit familiar with Mongo's middleware. So now let's continue with our steps for saving the user. So we're good on that. And now, of course, we just want to generate the token and send back the response. And we'll first set up the functionality again in the controller. So we're clear on what's happening. And next video, I'll show you another nifty setup that we can use with Mongoose. And like I already previously mentioned, this should feel familiar because we spent the entire project on that, the JWT basics. So if we go back to the controllers in the fifth project, meaning the folder name is five, of course, this is not the fifth project. And if we take a look at the main, check it out. We go with JWT sign, correct? And of course, that is coming from our library, the JSON web token one. Then we pass in whatever we want to pass it on to the front end. And of course, later we'll use the ID to access the resources that are associated with that user. Then we pass in the JW secret one. And in this project, I'll show you where we can get a proper value. And eventually we'll pass in the options and we just say in how long it expires. So let's try to recreate that back in the auth JS. And what are we looking for here? We're looking for the library, of course. Now I can remove the bcrypt because everything is already set up in the model. So let's go over here with JWT. We will set it equal to require, of course. And then we're looking for the package, the JSON web token one. And then once we create the user, this is the case where we want to create that token, correct? So let's go over here with const and then we'll go with token and for the time being i'll just pass in some random string and then we'll set up properly everything after that so let's go here with jwt then we go with sign of course and we want to pass in the data we want to send back and in my case again we'll go with id and name so let's start with user id that's just how i decided to call my property here so user id is equal to user so that's the user that I'm getting back over here. And remember, on that object, we have ID property, correct? And if you want to double check, it's right over here. This is what we're currently sending back. And we go with underscore, of course, and then we'll go with ID. And again, that's just my preference to kind of separate the two. Otherwise, you have job ID, you have user ID and many more IDs. And then if you just keep using this underscore, in my opinion, 
is just hard to manage everything. So that's why I always go with user ID, job ID, or whatever. So that's the first thing that I'm sending. And next, I want to send the name. So I go with name, and then again, user, that's my object, and then name. And like I said, I'm just going to pass in some JWT secret right away. So I'm just going to be cheating a little bit over here. And then we'll add a comma. And then let's go again with expression. Remember, this one was expires in 30 days. So we'll use the same value. And of course, a little bit later, I'll talk about other options as well. So let's go here. Let's say expires and in. And I'll set it equal to 30 days. Then we save. And of course, instead of sending back the user, I want to send back the token. And this is the case where, as always, there's multiple setups that you can have. You can send back maybe only the token, or you can be like, hey, maybe my front end needs the name directly. Now, what am I talking about? If I go back to the application that I built for this project, if I go to login, and of course, more specifically, I'm going to be looking for register, and then I'll try to use some kind of values here that are not already in a database. So I'm going to go with Anna and maybe let's add a two because then for sure everything is going to work. Once I submit, not only I'm going to get back the token, I'm going to say here never, I'll also get back the name. But again, this really depends on the setup that you have on a front end. You can send back only the token. And actually, there are setups where the front end decodes the token instead. Instead of me sending here a name and set it equal to username, front end decodes the token. Now, it's not going to be our case, but just keep in mind, that's why you don't ever want to store anything here as far as the secrets. Because as far as the coding, you can actually do that. Now, of course, when it comes to verifying, that's where you need that JWT secret. But as far as decoding, yes, there are some setups where front end just decodes and gets whatever property it needs. So in my case, the jobs app, I'm also looking for the user and more specifically the name property. But hopefully it is clear that in this case, it's just my preference when I was building the front end app. When it comes to response, what you definitely want to send back is the token, because that, of course, will allow that user to access resources on a server later on. So in my case, I'm going to go with user. So that's going to be another property I'm sending. And in this case, of course, I'll access my user object. And I'm just going to be looking for the name. So I'll have another property there by the name of name. And then I'll set it equal to user and then name. And of course, now I just need to add a comma. And we're successfully sending the token. And again, let's test it out in Postman first. So I'm going to go here with john3 at gmail.com. We send it back. Now notice we're not sending back the password anymore. And of course, I'm getting the user as well as the token. And just to reiterate on the front end, of course, I'm using the an over here. So in React, I set up the state and I set up the state value just to showcase that. Notice over here, I have my reducer, blah, blah, blah. I have user and notice the name. Of course, that is Anna. And I'm accessing that right from the response. And then when it comes to the token, you'll have multiple options. And one of them is going to be storing it in a local storage. So now, of course, in the local storage, not only I have the name, so that way, when I refresh, of course, I can still showcase Dana, but I also get the token. So when I'll be making future requests on behalf of Anna, of course, I'll have the token. Hopefully it is clear. And now, of course, we can take a look at another solution that Mongoose provides to make our code cleaner. Awesome. And to complete our register functionality, let's learn about schema instance methods in Mongoose. So I'm going to navigate to the docs. In this case, we're looking for schemas. And if we take a look at the list, we see this instance methods. And essentially what happens? Every document we create, we can have functions on them. So these are going to be instances, of course, of our schema, correct? And the way we set up those functions, we go with the schema name, then methods, and then whatever function you want. 
So essentially, once I create that user over here in the register, that user will have a function. And you can probably already guess that we'll create a function that just generates that token. And of course, in that function, we'll pretty much have the same code. And therefore, we won't have to bother with that in the actual controller in the register controller. And let's start somewhat silly, where I want to go back to my model, the user one. And let's just go with user schema. So of course, that is the name that stays the same. Then we go with methods. And then let's just say, get name. So let's imagine that we're just lazy getting the username. And we have multiple options. We can set it up as a sync, or we can just set it up as a regular function. So in this case, we'll just go with a regular function. So no async keyword. But again, we do want to use this function keyword, not a error function, because that way, this will always point to our document. And with get name, simply what do I want to do? I want to return this dot and name. And now, of course, we just want to go back to auth.js and where we have user.name. Let's just invoke. Let's say user, and we're going to be looking for get name. So invoke this one. And now let's go to the postman and let's try to send it. So I'll navigate back. I'll send it. And because I wasn't careful, of course, I didn't pay attention to my email. So, of course, I need to change it to john for gmail.com. And I can clearly see that I still have the name. So if I'll change this one around and if I'll say Anna and maybe I'll go with Anna gmail.com, then I'll still be able to access the name. And what that means is that we can generate the token using the instance method instead. So again, we're trying to keep all our logic in one place where we have the user schema instead of scattered around our controllers and let's just fix everything back we'll say username we'll stay with that for time being of course we can cut it out and i think we'll retype one more time from the scratch just so we can get comfortable with jwt now i'm not gonna need the import here for the token anymore so i can definitely cut it out i have my user awesome and eventually i'll invoke a method that will get me that token so now let me save auth.js back in the user. Of course, the name is not going to be get name. And you know what? I'll just set up everything from the scratch. I'll say user schema. Then again, the syntax is methods. And then we're looking for the function name. And in this case, I'll call this create JWT. And again, it's going to be a simple function here. And as far as the logic, we'll just return right away JWT sign. And of course, in here, I need to get the library. So let's go with JWT at the top and then JWT sign. And again, remember, in the function, we can access the document. How? Well, by using this, correct? And as far as the payload, again, I'm going to go with user ID. Then I'll set it equal to this and underscore ID. So this points to the document. And then we're going to go with comma name. And then we'll just go with this dot name. And again, we'll just cheat a little bit where we'll say JWT secret. And then as far as the expression, again, we'll keep it at 30 days. So expires and we'll set it equal to 30 days. So now if I go back to auth JS, I simply want to call create JWT. That's it. That's all we have to do. So once we create the user, of course, we have that instance method. And here I can just say token. And I'm going to go with user. And of course, the name of the method is create and JWT. We invoke it. And now, of course, we can go back to our postman. Now we already have one Anna. And let's just change the name just so we can see that it works. I'm going to go maybe with Peter. And I'll set it here as Peter as well. And then once we send, of course, now I have the Peter as well as the token. And of course, that means that everything works. And successfully, we're done with our register controller. And in the process, we learned about hashing the passwords, setting up the mongoose middleware, as well as the instance methods on a schema. All right. And once we're good with register out, like promised, 
let's swing back to the JSON web tokens. And the first thing I want to talk about is the expression. So remember, in options, we go with expires in. And as far as default setup, so if we just provide a number, this is going to be in seconds. Now, if we provide a string, then we need to make sure that we add time units, whether that's days, hours, and all that. Otherwise, it's going to be interpreted as milliseconds. So if you go something like this, string of 120, it's going to be equal to 120 milliseconds. And of course, we'll return to this one once we start refreshing the tokens and all that cool stuff. For now, just be aware that by default, it's going to be seconds unless you provide a string with a time unit. That should do it for expires in. And as far as that secret string, yeah, you can get away with JW secret. But of course, a more proper setup is generating some kind of more secure key. And I prefer using all keys generator.com. Again, this is a free one. Of course, if you want, you can donate and all that, but you can use it for free. You're looking for encryption key. And then more specifically, you're looking for 256 bit one. And then of course, you can get the value and just take that value and stick it in the dot env file. And as a side note, we can also set the expires in in the dot env as well. And actually, this is exactly what we'll do right now. So let's now get back to our project. I'm looking for dot env. And then I want to set up two values. I want to go with JWT underscore secret. And that is going to be, of course, equal to my encrypted one. And then the second thing that I want is that expression. And as far as the name, I think I'm going to go with JWT, JWT underscore and lifetime. And now, of course, once I have both of these things, and as I know, of course, I need to set it to some kind of value. So in my case, I'm going to go back to my 30 days. And once I save both of them, now, of course, I just need to spin up the server and I'll be able to access that in my user model. And once my server is up and running, I can just go back over here and instead of hard coding, simply go with process dot env. And in this case, of course, I'm looking for JWT underscore secret. And then as far as expires in, I'm going to go with my value. And again, we're looking for process dot env and we're looking for JWT and lifetime or however you called your variable. And once we have both of these in place now, of course, let's test it out just to make sure that we don't have any silly bugs. And let's go with Peter and we'll set it up as 23. I send and everything is correct. So once I have all of this in place now, of course, we can switch gears and set up the login functionality. Beautiful. Once we can successfully register the user. Now, of course, let's worry about the login functionality. And to tell you honestly, we have covered pretty much all of the things apart from checking the password. So of course, since we're using a library to hash the password, of course, we want to compare it as well. Now, since that involves creating another instance method, we'll actually do that in next video. In this video, simply want to check whether we're getting the email and the password with some kind of values, because that's the whole setup for the logging in. In this case, they don't need to provide name. They just need to provide email and a password. If they don't, we send back the bad request one. After that, we'll check for the user in our database. So basically, we'll go with our user and find one and we'll pass in the email. And if we can find one, then of course, we'll send back the user. And if not, then of course, we'll send back another error. And let's start here by removing that res.send. I'll close the sidebar here and let's start by const email and password. And this is the case where I'll do the checking, the initial checking right in the controller. And I'll actually cover why that's my preference in this case. Once we're done setting up compare passwords functionality. So first, in the request, I'm looking for email and password. And right out of the gate, I'll say if no email or if no password, then of course, we'll go with our bad request. And of course, we'll do that in the if block and we'll say throw new 
and we already have the import for bad request. So we just go with bad request error and we just need to provide a message. Please provide email and password. And once I have this one in place, then of course we want to check for the user. Correct. How do we check for user? Well, we have the model, we have the user model and on it, we have a method by the name of find one. So let's come up with some kind of variable name. In my case, it's going to be user. And we'll go with await. Of course, it is synchronous. Then we go with user dot and find one. And then instead of passing in the ID and all that, we'll pass in the email. So whatever we're getting from the user, we'll just pass it in here. And effectively, at this point, we have two options. If the user exists, awesome. Then, of course, we can send back the response with the username, as well as we can create a token, of course. Now, if the user doesn't exist, then of course, we want to throw another error. Now, in this case, though, we're not going to be throwing bad request error. In this case, if there is no user, then of course, we'll send back the unauthenticated error. Because in this case, the user is not providing valid credentials. And that's a big difference. So let's go back to auth.js. Of course, we want to import that. So in here, let's go with on authenticated error. That's the class we're looking for. And in here, let's check. And eventually, there's also going to be code for comparing the password. But like I said, we'll do that in next video. So that is still coming up. For now, we'll just say, if there is no user, then please throw that error, throw new. And again, we're looking for our auth error and we'll simply say invalid credentials credentials and once we have taken care of this now of course we want to create the token because if we go past this error that means that user is there user exists and remember the instance method we created in the previous videos the create token one or create jwt don't remember i believe it was create jwt of course we want to invoke it and essentially, we want to send back the same response. So the same response as we sent when we registered the user. So if user exists, let's create that token. And of course, we'll go with user, create JWT. We invoke it, we get back the token. And now it's the same deal. We go with status. Now, in this case, we want to go with status codes. And it's not going to be 201. It's going to be 200. And of course, that one is the OK one. And then as far as the JSON, same deal. Also in my setup, on my front end, I'm looking for the name property. So not to be redundant, but you always want to send back the token. But optionally, you want to include some more things as well. And in my case, those more things is just a username. So I'll go with user I'm looking for name, of course, the property, and then username, and then comma. And of course, in here, we're looking for a token. So right after the name, we'll go with token. And of course, that is equal to the token that we're getting back from create token. And now, of course, we can go and check it out in the postman. So let's go back over here. I believe we just created Peter 23. So now let's just test it out. I'll create a new route. So let's say here, new route. It's still going to be a post route, of course. And as far as the URL, again, we're looking for our global variable forward slash, and it's going to be auth. And of course, in this case, it's a login one. And then let's just grab these values over here. Let's say that we'll take the name, email, as well as the password. Now, of course, we won't use the name, but we can nicely copy and paste just to save a little bit of time. Copy and paste. And of course, forgot about my curlies. So let's place it here properly, everything. And this is turning out to be a mess. Okay, I set up everything correctly over here. And I don't need the name. And I'm just going to be sending the Peter 23 with a secret. Again, for time being, we're really just checking whether that secret is there. I'll save it. And I'll say in the jobs one, and we'll say login user. And then let's test it out. Of course, so we're here. Still have the body. Yes, everything is correct. And of course, I'm getting back to Peter. Now, if I'll do some mistakes, 
if, for example, I'll remove the password, we should get the 401. And that's the please provide email and password. Okay, that's good. Let me add the password. And now let's mess up the email. Instead of 23, I'll go with two. And now, of course, I have invalid credentials. And of course, the error in this case is 401. So our base functionality works really great. The only thing that's left to do in here is just to compare the password using our library. And uh, if you remember, the library name was bcrypt.js. Not bad, not bad. We can register the user. We can almost log in. And the reason why I say almost, because of course, moment, as long as there's some kind of value for the password, we're actually sending back the token. So now let's fix that. Let's actually compare the password. And this is that interesting thing where you might be like, okay, but wait a minute. Back when we were registering, of course, we were hashing this password, correct? We went with gen salt and then hash. And the deal is following where essentially we have our library. We have the package, the bcrypt one. And in the bcrypt package, of course, there is a function by the name of compare. And it compares the hashed passwords. So again, it's a one way street. Once we hash the password, that's it. But with compare method, we compare those hashed passwords. And of course, if they match, awesome, we send back the token, and user has successfully logged in. And of course, keep in mind that we can set up this functionality right over here. But why we would want to do that, if we already know how to set up the instance methods. So instead of jamming more code, in the login controller, we'll simply go over here and we'll say user schema. And of course, we need to go with methods. And then as far as the name, I'm going to go with check password or compare password. Again, naming is really up to you. In my case, I'm going to go maybe with compare password. It sounds a little bit more sophisticated. And this is going to be a sync function. And then this function is going to be looking for one argument. And that, of course, is going to be the password that's coming with a request. And I'm just going to name this one candidate password. And password. And then as far as the function body, I want to come up with some kind of variable. And in my case, I will call this is match. And we'll set it equal to await because we can run the compare method asynchronously. And we'll say await. Again, the package name is bcrypt, of course. And then the method name is compare. And then in the compare, we'll pass in two things. We'll pass in the password. So the candidate password, essentially the password that is coming in with a request. And after the comma, of course, we'll get the password from the document. Of course, the one that is already saved in a database. So let's go back to the compare. And we'll just go with candidate password. So again, the one that's coming in with a request. And of course, in order to access the document password, we simply go with this dot and we provide the password. And then what we want to return from the function is the match. So I'll say here return and is match. And once we have the function in place, now we simply want to go back to auth JS. And if we can see that we have the user, we also want to set up one more if statement where we'll check the password. So now, of course, I can move this comment down and I can say if there is a user, I also want to check whether the password matches. And we can do that by going with const and then come up with some kind of variable is password correct. And of course, we need to go with await because our function is asynchronous. Then we're looking for the user. So, of course, this only happens if we have a user. If we don't have the user, then we right away send back invalid credentials. And in here, we'll go with check or I'm sorry, compare password. Of course, I went with sophisticated name. Then we pass in the password that we're getting from the user. And now, of course, we want to do the same thing where we want to check if the password is correct. Then, of course, we just return a token and all that. If not, then we'll throw the error. And I'll just speed this up and we'll copy and paste and we'll do the same thing if the password is false, meaning if we get back is match as false, then of course, we'll just throw this error. And now let's go and test it out in the postman. So at this point, I have email as well as the password. 
and they should be correct. So let's send it here. And of course, I get back the response. But if I start messing with the values, for example, if I go with a wrong email, now, of course, I'll get invalid credentials. So let's set it back to 23. And then if we do the same thing with the password, we'll also get back the same message. So notice here we have this invalid credentials. Now, if I provide the correct values, the correct email, as well as the password, then of course, everything is great. And we get back the token. Now, lastly, you're probably wondering, okay, but why did you check over here, right in the controller? Because technically, we need to understand that yes, if there is no email, of course, we'll get that mongoose error, correct? Well, let me showcase something. So I'll comment this one out. So basically, now we're not checking for empty values. And let me provide the correct one. Let me say that, yeah, the correct email is going to be Peter 23. Yada, yada, yada. But I'll remove the password. And essentially, once I send, I get back this error response, but it is empty. So let's go over the reasons why is that happening. Well, if we take a look at the user, of course, we have the compare one. And this one will throw an error. It will throw an error because, of course, we're passing in the empty value, correct? Back in AuthJS, we're getting back the password, but password is just empty string. And we are getting the error, and we are actually handling that error in our error middleware. So let's go back over here, the error handler. We are handling it over here, and I can actually showcase that. We can go with log, and we can console log the error. And again, let me send one more time. And in the console, you will see the error. And again, it is thrown by our library. Notice here, legal arguments, undefined. And I just find it easier to check it right over here or something we'll learn later to set up a validation layer. And again, that is all coming up for time being. I just find it easier to check for that error right here for those empty values and then just send back the response instead of chasing it in error handler. Again, that just my preference. Of course, if you don't like the setup, you don't have to use it. But that's my explanation for using this bad request over here. Hopefully everything is clear as far as the register and login. And now, of course, we can move on to our next step. All right. And once the login and register are in place, as far as auth, the last thing we need is auth middleware, where we can verify the token. And if everything is correct, get the user ID and pass it along to the job routes. Now the functionality is going to be exactly the same like in the previous project. I might just use different variable names here and there. And to answer your question, yes, I'll purposely retype everything from scratch, just because I find repetition to be very important aspect of learning. Now, if you don't agree with my opinion, essentially, you have two options. You can just copy and paste the code from the previous project. And I'll show you, of course, where you can get it in a second, or make this a challenge and try to recreate everything from scratch yourself. And of course, if you get stuck, utilize the previous project code or this video lecture. And of course, the code that I'm talking about is this one. If you navigate to folder number five, the JWT basics one, and then more specifically, if you look in the middleware, of course, you'll find the middleware that we are about to set up. And now, of course, I'll close everything and I'll start from the scratch. So I'm looking in the star, I'm looking for the middleware, and I'm going to go for my authentication one. And first, let's start with imports. And essentially, we're looking for the user first. So that's going to be our model. So let's go with require. And I believe this was two levels up. So let me look in my models. And of course, user. Okay, that's good. Then I want to go with my JWT because of course, we want to verify the token. So let's go over here with require. And the package name is JSON web token. And the last thing that I want is the unauthenticated error, which of course is coming from my errors. And this is the case probably where it's going to be faster if I just copy and paste. So let me take a look at index.js. And of course, the name is right here. So let me import this from my errors. And again, I think I'll have to go two levels up. So let me take a look at the require. And we're looking at the errors folder. And since we have index.js, you already know that we don't need to specify the path, we just simply say errors. And with all of this in place, 
Now, of course, what we want to do is go with const off. So that's going to be our middleware. And of course, it's going to be a function. And it's going to be looking for three things, the rec, res, and next. And then as far as the function body, remember, the first thing we want to do is check for the header. So let's add here the comment. And we're looking for a header first for the authorization one. And then we want to check whether it starts with bear. So first, I'm going to set up the variable. And I'll say auth header, and that is equal to require headers and the authorization one, of course. And then after that, I'm looking for if statement. And in here, I want to check if it doesn't exist, if there is no header, then of course, we'll throw the error or if it doesn't start with better. So let's go over here with auth header and we'll go with starts with. So of course, that's the javascript method that we can use on a string and then we go with bearer and in some setups you'll see this space added as well but to tell you honestly it doesn't really matter because remember once we are done with if statement we're still getting the token and if there's going to be no space then of course the token won't make sense we won't be able to verify the token we're splitting the token anyway and let's go over here with throw new and of course we're looking for on authenticated error and as far as the text let's go with authentication and invalid and you know we'll also need to add here async so let's add over here async now we're checking for the header as well as the bearer and if one of them is false then of course we throw the error and once we're done with that let's go with our token so let's say const token is equal to auth header and then remember we're splitting it and we're splitting it on the empty space. And then we're looking for the second value. And that's why we go with one. So we turn this into array. And then we're looking for the second item in an array. And this is what I'm saying. So even if you omit this, and if you just check for the bearer, if the user has sent a bearer and then right away token, well, this one won't make sense because basically this will be undefined. We won't be able to split the string and of course if that's the case we won't be able to verify hopefully that is clear so let's go over here with try catch and then as far as the try block we'll try to get the payload so let's say over here payload and remember the method name is jwt and verify and here we want to pass in two things we want to pass in the token comma and then of course we're looking for process dot env and then jwt underscore secret and now of course once i have the payload i just want to pass it along to the job routes and in order to do that we'll first add a comment attach the user to the job routes and then as far as the logic we can simply set up a reg dot user so i'm right away setting up the property on a request object and as far as the values in there i'm going to go with user id Again, that's just my preference. And then I'll go with payload. So this is what I'm getting back from the verify. And of course, in there, I'll have the user ID as well. And technically, we won't use the name. But just for testing, I'll pass in the name as well. So let's say here name. And again, we're looking for payload, and then that name. And again, if you're a little bit confused, essentially, in here, we're just getting the payload that we're setting up in the route. So if we take a look at our index routes, I'm sorry, not the index routes. If we're looking at the auth routes, and notice here when we're creating the JSON web token, right? Now, of course, the functionality, the actual functionality is in the model. So let me go over there in the user. Essentially, this is what we're passing in. We're passing in the user ID as well as the name. So in the authentication middleware, of course, this is what we're getting back. And again, this is just for testing, essentially, in our controllers in the job controllers, of course, we'll just use the user ID. But since I want to showcase that this is actually the same user, I'll also pass in the name here as well. And then as far as the catch, well, we have the error, and we can just throw it, we can just say over here, throw new, and we'll go with our error. And essentially, the text is going to be exactly the same. So I'll just take it from here and copy and paste. And before I let you go, of course, remember that we need to do two things. We need to export the auth 
as well as we need to invoke the next because otherwise we won't get to the job routes anyway. So let's go over here with next first. So now, of course, we pass along the user to the job routes and we need to go with module exports and then we're looking for auth. And I'll set up the actual middleware as well as test it out in the next video. All right. And once the auth middleware is in place, now, of course, we just need to decide where we're going to place it. Because if you remember the previous project, we only had one authenticated route. And of course, we just use the router for that. And technically, we can do the same thing over here in jobs. But we just need to understand that, of course, in this case, we want to authenticate all the routes. So basically, we want to protect all of them. Because if I create a job, I only want to look at my jobs. And I don't want you to modify my jobs. Or you probably don't want me to modify yours. So essentially what I'm saying, we want to add that protected route for all of them. So we want to protect all of our routes as far as the jobs, not just one of them. So technically you can say, yeah, well, okay, we can import and then we can just add them one by one. And technically it is an option, but there's actually a better one. If we go to app.js, take a look. We have app.use. And then, of course, we have all the job routes. And in this scenario, what we can do, we can just get the middleware and then stick it in front of the jobs router. And with that in place, all of our jobs routes will be protected. So instead of going one by one, we just do that in app.js. And as a result, we'll protect all the job routes. So let's do it. We're going to go where we have the connect and above or below doesn't really matter. I'll say authenticate user and we'll go with require. And of course, I'm looking for my middleware. And in there, I'm looking for authentication one. And then we scroll down. We go with authenticate user, pass the comma, and we're good to go. And in order to test it, we'll go to the controllers over here. And since we'll start working in create job anyway, I'll look for create job and we'll just test it out. And we'll test it out in the following way where I'll go with res.json. And let's just pass here rec.user. So I'm getting that user from my auth one if everything is correct. And of course, I should be able to see the user as well as the ID. So let me save it over here. And as a side note, I actually removed all my current users in the database just so we can start nicely from the scratch because as we were setting them up, we used the dummy string and then we set up the proper one just so we don't get any dumb bugs. I also suggest to do the same where remove all the users and we'll start everything from the scratch. So now, of course, I want to go to the postman. I already have the register route, correct? So let's just get the token first. So I, of course, I go with name, email and password. I get the token. Awesome. That's what I wanted. And now, of course, we want to set up a new route. Now, again, this is going to be a post route to create a job. So let's go over here. Let's say new route. We're looking for the post method. And we use the same URL, of course. And then if you remember, the difference was that for jobs, we just go with forward slash and jobs. And if you want to double check, just go to app.js first. Notice that's the path. Again, this is already part of our variable, the URL one. Then we have the jobs. And then, of course, in the routes, as far as the post, well, that's going to be a root anyway. So that's going to be the forward slash. Now, if we're getting the single job, deleting and all that, then, of course, it will pass in the route parameters as well. But for the post, it's simply forward slash, which just means that we go with the URL and then the jobs. Now, we're really not concerned with the body because we're just testing whether our authentication works. But what we do need to get is authorization over here. And my apologies, I'm actually looking for the headers. And the reason why I'm showing you the authorization because at the end of this project, or maybe in a few videos, I'll show you how we can set this up dynamically. So you don't have to every time just copy and paste the user token, because we need to understand that, of course, we can use multiple users, correct? And you don't want to copy and paste every time that token. So I'll show you a dynamic way how we can set that up but not yet. So let's go here where we have the headers. Again, 
we're looking for the authorization one and then we want to go with bearer and we want to pass in the token and once i send if everything is correct check it out i have the user id which should match to whatever id i have in the database and of course i'm not gonna check value by value but hopefully you understand the idea where these ones should match this one and the one that i have over there in the postman and i can clearly see the name so what happens if i go with different user and uh, if i register this user instead and let's go with anna here again the same secret we get different token and now of course we should get different name correct so in the jobs i'll remove the john token and i'll paste the anna one once i send of course now i get back the anna so what that means in any of the job routes i will have anna's id or john's id or whichever token i'm getting and when it comes to any of these functionalities we'll only deal with the resources that are associated with a user hopefully we're on the same page and now of course we can start setting up the functionality and once we're done setting up our auth middleware i also want to mention something whereas you're looking at someone else's code you might come across the syntax where instead of creating a object like we are doing in line 20 what they do is they look for the user in the database so they take the model the user model and then either find by id or find one that also works and then of course they just pass in the id that is coming from the token and in most cases they will use the select to remove the password there's really no point to pass this password to the upcoming middleware meaning our requests and therefore they just use the select and remove it and then when it comes to erect dot user well they just set it equal to this variable and it's definitely an option but the reason why i'm not doing that in this project is simply because if we just think about it we really have no functionality to remove that user anyway so if i'm getting my id from the token i'm pretty sure that there is a user on the other side again you might see this code and yes we might implement ourselves in the future project but not in this case i really didn't see the point of looking for the user since we have no functionality to remove it in the first place now if you do decide to go with this logic then of course just make sure that you remove line 20 because otherwise you're overriding with our current setup anyway awesome and once our auth is working now essentially we want to set up a model for the job and of course work on the rest of the routes now before we set up the model though let me also quickly save it so this is going to be create job so let's set up the name create job and of course i'll set it in the jobs one and i also want to test it out really quickly where if in a headers i make that mistake and i don't add the space what response i get of course i have authentication error so again this just proves the point that i was making before where essentially even if we omit the space over here we still check the token and of course in that case we're not able to split it meaning we are splitting it but we're just getting undefined and as a result our token is undefined as well so hopefully that is clear so now let me just navigate to the models and i want to create a job model and the first thing that i want to do is set up the mongoose and of course that is equal to require and we're looking for a package the mongoose one and after that let's just set up our schema so let me close the sidebar just so we have a little bit more real estate so job schema and that is equal to new mongoose and schema schema and here let's pass in the object and as far as the properties i'm gonna have the company and that will be equal to an object of course type will be set to string then required will be true and essentially we'll set it up as an array of course and let's just say true and as far as the message we'll go with please provide company and name and last thing that i want to set up 
for the company's max length that we can use on strings. And in here, we'll set it up as 50. Of course, if you want to go with different value, be my guest. So let me take the company and we'll copy and paste this one one time. And the second property we want to set up is the position. It's going to be a string again, It will be required. And in this case, of course, we'll say position, please provide position. As far as the max length, in this case, let's maybe increase it. In my case, I'm going to go 200. And then as far as the job interview, well, there's always the status whether it's pending, so whether we're waiting for a response, whether we already have the interview, or it was declined, correct? And essentially, we want to do that using the status property, so comma, status, and then again, it's going to be an object, it's going to be a string, but we'll use that enum. Remember, option where we can set up the array with a possible values. So let's say here, enum, and as far as possible values, like I said, we'll go with interview, then declined, declined. And then the last one will be pending. And this is going to be the case again, where on a front end, we'll just provide these two values, the company one and position when we are creating the job. So these are going to be the values that are required. However, the status one, we will manipulate when we're modifying the job. So therefore, we'll go with status, these are our options. And then like I said, lastly, we'll go with default, and we'll set it equal to pending. So that's the setup I'm going to have. And then probably the most most important property that we haven't set up is the created by why? Well, because in here, we'll tie our job to the actual user. And the way it's going to look like we'll go here with created by again, the name is really up to you, but that's the setup that I have created by. And then type is not going to be string or a number. In fact, it's going to be a mongoose, then types. And then we're looking for object and ID. So this is very, very important. So essentially, now we're tying our job model to the user one. So we have the user model over here, correct? So this is where we're creating the user. So every time we'll create a job, we will assign it to one of the users. And as a result, of course, our functionality will work, because every job that we will create will be associated with a user. So first, we have a type, and we need to go with mongoose types, and then object ID, that's going to be the type for our property. And then we need to go with a ref, and we need to specifically say, well, which model are we referencing? And in this case, we'll go with user, of course. So I want to tie the job to the user. Hopefully that is clear. And then of course, we want to go with required as well, because we don't want to create a job without a user, we'll set it equal to true. And then as far as the value, again, let's just go with please provide an user. And then lastly, right after the schema object, the first option that we have over here, I want to go with comma, and we'll set up timestamps and true. And I'll showcase them once we actually start sending requests from the postman, because you'll see the benefit of using timestamps right in the response. So don't worry about them. For now, I'll show you once we start getting back the responses. And of course, eventually, what we want to do is just go with module exports, and we want to set it equal to mongoose, then model, and then as far as the name, I'm just going to go with job. And then we'll pass in the job schema. And once we have all of this in place, now, of course, we can focus on routes. And I guess let's start with the create job one. Nice, we have the model. So now let's just set up the functionality for creating the job. And then one by one, we'll deal with the rest of the controllers as well. And in order to set everything up, First, of course, from the postman, we need to send the data. And what data are we looking for? Again, let's jog our memory. So we have the job model. And here I'm looking for the company name, as well as the position. Now let's not worry about the created by yet. Since that one we will get from our auth middleware. And in here, let's just 
set up some kind of values in the body. So let's go with raw and we're going with JSON, of course. And then here, let's say company, company. And then I'm just going to go with Google because why not? And then as far as the position, well, let's just go with intern. So position and then we pass in the intern. Now let's go back to our controller where we have the jobs one create job. And instead of sending back the user, I want to send back the rec that body again, just so we can test whether everything works. So I have create job route, I send it here. And of course, I have invalid authentication because I didn't fix my better one. So let me go back. And let me just add that space. And now everything should work. Where of course, I'm getting the values for the company, as well as the position. So now what's left to do is go back to create job. And of course, in here, we want to import finally, our model, correct. And we want to create a new one. So let's do that. We're going to go at the top here. And we'll create our imports. And effectively, we're looking for three things. I want to get the status codes, I want to get the job model, as well as the requests. And for the requests, we have two options. We have bad request error, as well as not found one. So let's go with cons job. So that's going to be my model. So require. And of course, we're looking in the models here. And more specifically job. Then we want to get the status codes. So const and then status codes. Now that is coming from our library, of course. So require and HTTP status codes. And then lastly, we have those two errors. So let's go here with bad request and error. And the second one will be the not found one. So not found error. And both of them are coming from and of course, the errors. So let's go two levels up. And we're looking in the errors folder. And once we have all the imports in place, we'll swing back to create job. And essentially, the idea is following where, of course, at the moment, I'm just passing in the rag dot body in the JSON response, correct. And if you remember, what was the method name to create new document? Well, that was, of course, create. And of course, in this case, we're looking for the job one, correct. So the way the setup is going to look like we're going to go with job then we'll await, of course, and then we go with model name and create and we pass in the rec dot body. But at the moment, what we're missing is that user. And where is the user located? Well, of course, it is located in the rec dot user. Now, what are we really looking for is the ID, correct? So what we want to do here is just go with rec dot body. Again, if you want a console log, of course, you can definitely do so. But I'm just going to skip that part and we'll go with rec dot body. Then we want to create on rec dot body a new property by the name of created by why? Well, because in our job model, that's how I called my property. So I add this property on rec dot body. And where is it located? It's located in rec user and the property name is user ID like so. So now, of course, once we pass in the rec dot body, we'll still have the validations. But if everything is correct, we create a new job. And now, of course, we just need to handle that as far as response. So let's just set up res dot status. Now, again, this is going to be the created one. So let's go with status codes, status codes, then we go with comma, or I'm sorry, the dot and then we go with created. And then as far as the JSON, I just want to send back the job. So let's go over here. And let's test it out. So now I'm getting back the company and position. But if everything is correct, I should get way more than that. And once we send, unfortunately, instead of getting back the job, I get back the error where it says created by and it is a validation error, which actually just showcases that our validation still works, which is really, really good. And the problem, of course, is in here where I went with Rec dot body, and it should be created by not create by. So let me save and let me test it out one more time. And once I send now, of course, I'm getting back the job. And as far as the job, I have the status, 
So like I said, by default, it's going to be pending. So this is going to be the job ID. And this is very, very important. That's why on the auth, I set up that user ID. And that's why also when I was setting up the JSON web token, I prefer using that user ID. Once you start building a bigger application, you'll get a bunch of these underscore IDs and it gets confusing quite fast. And therefore, I prefer setting up that extra piece of code where I go with user ID or job ID or whatever. And if you keep looking at it, okay, you can see the Google, you can see the position, all that is nice, but you're also probably noticing the created by, and essentially this points to Anna. And of course, what that means is that now this job will always, always be tied to Anna. So once I register and log in and get my token and all that, I won't be able to modify, look at it or whatever. And you're probably noticing these ones as well the created at and updated at. And effectively, we get them by default once we set up timestamps as true. So Mongoose schemas have that timestamps option that tells Mongoose to automatically manage created at and updated at properties on our documents. So what that means is that, of course, we don't need to set them up manually. And you can probably already guess that this one will always point to the time when the document was created. And this one will change as we're updating. And of course, we can use these properties, for example, in filters. And essentially, this is exactly what we'll do when we're getting all the jobs. And once we can successfully get back our first job, I want to congratulate you on pretty much getting over the biggest hurdle, because from now on, everything is going to be exactly the same like we worked in the previous projects. The only difference, of course, as far as the controllers will always, always get that user ID as well, because, of course, we'll need to use it to search for jobs, to update jobs and all that cool stuff. Awesome. And once we can create the job now, of course, let's worry about the rest of the functionality and let's do it one by one. So next one up, we have get all jobs. Now, in order to get the jobs, we already know the method that is find, which is, of course, available on the model. However, in this case, when it comes to the filter object, of course, we'll pass in created by property and we'll set it equal to the user, because what we want is to get only the jobs that are associated with the user. And I know that I keep pretty much repeating the same thing, and my apologies for that, but that is very, very crucial. In this case, we're not looking for all the jobs like we did in a task. We're only looking for the jobs that are associated with this user. And as far as the functionality it goes, something like this, where we'll go with jobs that is equal to await. And then we'll go with job find and remember the filter object. And remember, if it was empty, then, of course, we're just getting all the jobs. But that's not what we want in here. We want to say created by and we want to set it equal to rec user and user ID. Again, that user property is going to be on every request since in the app JS, we placed our auth middleware in front of all of our jobs routes. And then let's also sort it quickly and let's sort based on created at. Remember this property, the created at. Let's sort based on that. So let's say here dot sort and let's just pass in the property created at. And as far as the response, well, let's just go with res dot status. And as far as the status codes, of course, we'll be looking for OK one. So status codes and then OK. And when it comes to JSON response, I want to send back the jobs as well as the count, because that's what I'm looking for on my front end. Again, this is really optional. You can, of course, send just jobs. But in my case, I want to send both. And once I have all of this in place, now, of course, we can go back to the postman. I'll save both routes, the register user as well as create job. And you know what? Why don't we create a few more jobs? So in here, we'll say Apple and we'll say front end developer, developer. And then let's create one more. And this one will be Facebook. 
And as far as the developer, let's just say back end one. So let's send it here. And once I send, I want to check my database in there. I have jobs. Okay, that's good. And as far as Anna, I believe I'm setting up everything as Anna. I have the one for Google, one for Apple, as well as the Facebook. And once I have all of these jobs in place, now, of course, we can create a new route. So let me save it over here. And let's just go with get route in this case, of course. And we're looking for URL. And this is going to go to the same one as create job. So we simply go with forward slash and jobs. And of course, we just send it. And if everything is correct, we should get authentication invalid. Why? Because of course, we do need to include the header. So let me go back to the headers. Let's go to authorization. So now, of course, we know that our middle order works. We cannot just randomly access all the jobs. You can only access your jobs. And then let's go with bearer. And then let's pass in the token that we have for Anna. Again, I'll show you in a second how we can set this up programmatically so we don't have to copy and paste every time. So let's say here bearer. Let's send. And now, of course, I have jobs array with the count of three. And I can clearly see that all the info is correct. All right. And once we can create the job as well as get all jobs, why don't we set up that token dynamically in the postman? Because as we'll be creating more users and, of course, add more functionality, it's going to get annoying quite fast if we'll have to copy and paste each and every time that token value. And first, what I did is saved the request, the get all jobs one. And as you can see, that's the name. And of course, I saved it in jobs API. And as far as the setup, it's going to go something like this, where we'll start in login user, and then we'll repeat the same in the register. But for time being, I just don't want to worry about setting up those unique emails. So let's go over here where we have the login user. And we're looking for a test. And we just need to add a little bit of code. First, we want to access the response that we're getting back. Notice, of course, if we're successful, if we have logged in, then of course, we'll get back the token, correct. And in order to get that, we'll just set up some kind of variable. In my case, I'm going to go with JSON data. And we need to go with PM, so postman, and then dot. And we're looking for a response. And in there, we have a function by the name of JSON. And then let's just go with our token value. And let's set up our global variable. And notice here on the right hand side, we actually have snippets. So if we want to set up a new global variable, we we'll just click it. And now we just need to provide the values. And effectively, the name is going to be access token. And then as far as the value, this is where we go with JSON data dot. And of course, I know that in my responses, token is going to be located in token property. So I simply go with a token. And now, of course, once we send, we should see in the globals a new variable. And of course we do. And the only thing that's left to do is to go to either get all jobs or create job. Doesn't really matter. We can go here and instead of authorizing that manually, I'll unclick it. And then we're looking for authorization. Then we want to go with bearer. So probably you have by default here this inherit. Just go to bearer token one. And then as far as the value, well, this is where you want to access that global one, correct? So you just go here with access token. And now once we send, we should get back the job. Now, of course, I created with the same values if I check the body. So I have Facebook and backend developer. So if I take a look at my database, and if I refresh, I should have two values. I'll have one that I created before. And the second, one, of course, was created when we we're testing this dynamic setup. And of course, we can do the same thing with get all jobs as well. So let's take a look. We have the headers here. And I'm sorry, I'm looking in the wrong place. So we have the headers here. Let's remove it. Let's check the authorization again. We have bearer token. We're using access token. And then once we send in the body, now we should get four jobs. And in order for everything to work, we also need to do that in the register user. 
So let's go back quickly to the login one. Let's grab these two lines of code. Then we'll go to register one again. We have the tests. Let's save it here as well. And now let's try to create another user. So let's go to, I believe, in the body, right? This is where we were creating a new user. And I'm going to go back to my good old Peter, peter at gmail.com. We send, we get back the token. And now the moment of truth, if I create a job, and uh, let's just say in this case, Netflix. And then it's still going to be a back end developer. Now this one should be created for Peter. And again, notice how we don't need to worry about those headers anymore. So let's go back to our database. Let's refresh. And if everything is correct, I should have user by the name of Peter that I created. Of course, there it is. There's my Peter. And if I take a look at the jobs, Peter should also have a job. So I keep scrolling. And yes, there is. I have the Netflix one. And of course, it is a back end developer. So if I take a look at get all jobs, now, of course, I should get only one that is associated with a Peter. So let me go back to get all jobs. Let me send. And now, of course, I have count of one. So hopefully it is clear that now we're dynamically setting that access token. So you don't need to manually do that each and every time. And once we have all of this in place, now, of course, we can continue with our application. Beautiful. And once we can set up the access token dynamically in the postman, now, of course, let's keep on working on our routes. And uh, next one up, we have get job. And I think this is going to be the case where I'll actually log in back in as Anna. So where I have the login user route, I'll just go with Anna. Now, of course, I get this token just because she has more jobs. Now, let me save all of these routes since I don't want to set up everything from the scratch. And then once I have logged in as Anna, let me just double check, get all the jobs. Yep, I have four of them. And then remember for get job, what we'll need to pass. Of course, that is going to be the route parameter, correct? And this is where we'll provide the ID. And if you want to double check that, just go back to the routes. We're looking for the jobs one and notice. So the post and get all jobs is for the route. And then we have the forward slash and then colon and then the ID. Of course, this is going to be that route parameter, which will get me that single job, make sure that I can delete one as well as update one. And in order to test it out, whether our basic functionality works, essentially, whether we can get that silly string, we need to go back to the postman. And I think I'll just leave the login user one. And then I'll open up a new tab. We're looking for get request, of course. Then we go over here with our URL and then forward slash. And this is where I want to pass in the ID. So in get all jobs, as far as the response, of course, we'll get back those IDs, correct? And now if I want that one single job, I just need to take underscore ID. Again, you're not looking for the user here. You're looking for underscore ID, which just signals a job ID. So copy this one, then go back to the get one. The one will get the single request. And remember, we still need to go with authorization. We need to set up bearer token. And of course, we'll use the access token. And once we send, if everything is correct, of course, we should get route doesn't exist because I was pretty smart and I forgot to add the jobs one. So let's go over here and let's say jobs. And then once we send now, of course, we have get single job. So we know that this functionality works. And of course, now we just need to go back to our controller. And in here, I'm going to be looking for two things in the request. First, we need to remember that as far as the jobs, we can access it in the params object. That's going to be the job ID. And when it comes to user, of course, that one is located in the user object that we're getting from the middleware. So let's destructure both of these things, because as our functionality gets more complex, I think it's easier if we can clearly see where we're getting those values from. So I'm going to destructure my request object. And in there, I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for the user object. And remember, in the user object, I have the user ID. So now, of course, we're doing the nested destructuring. So I'm looking for that first. 
And then what I want is the params. So this one, of course, is provided by the express. And then more specifically, we're looking for the ID. Now, why we're looking for ID? Because that's how I called it over here. And then since I want to have more clarity on which one is which, I'll right away give it an alias of job ID, like so. So now we have both. We have the job ID from the params. So this one is coming from here. And then since we have the access token, now, of course, we can also access the ID of Anna. And then it's simply a logic of finding that one job where the ID is the job ID as well as created by is equal to the user ID. And if the job doesn't exist, then we'll throw this error. Because remember, we have two types of error. Either we'll get a casting error where the syntax doesn't match to that of the mongoose object ID, or simply we just pass in some kind of wrong job ID. And then, of course, if everything is correct, then we send back the job. So let's try it out. We're going to be looking for the job, and that will be equal to await, of course. Then we go with our model name, and then we go with find one. That's the method name. And then in here, in the filter object, we pass in underscore ID, which is equal to our job ID first. Now, of course, in here, the order is not important, but we do want to check for both. Otherwise, somebody can just get the ID and then they can access the job. So let's go to created by and we'll set it equal to our user ID. And then, like I said, we have two options for errors. Either we have a casting error, which we'll handle a little bit later as far as the nice responses, or we simply have a case where we provided some wrong ID. And we'll simply check that by saying, if there is no job, then we'll throw our new error. And of course, we're looking for not found one. And then we'll pass in the actual text with the job ID. So let's say no job with ID. And since I'm using template string, I can right away access it. And I'm going to be looking for my job ID. Now, if everything is correct, then of course, we'll get back the entire job. So we'll say here, res dot status, of course, we're looking for our status codes, then we'll go with OK. And then we'll go with JSON, and we'll send back the job. Now, of course, we can just test it out in our postman, where instead of this get single job, I should get the job that matches that ID. In this case, I'm getting the Google one. So now let me double check where I have all the jobs. And I'm going to be looking for well, these ones technically are both the same. So let me look for the Apple one. And I'll grab the ID. That's the job ID. Again, keep that in mind. That is very, very important. We're not looking for the user ID. And once I send, of course, I should get back the Apple. And if you get the same results, then of course, we can move on to our next step. Awesome. And up next, we have update job. And essentially, I can tell you right away that a lot of the stuff that we already wrote in a get job will repeat over here. So therefore, in order to speed this up a little bit, of course, I will do some copy and pasting here as well. And in order to test it out, I'm just gonna navigate again back to the postman. This is where I'll start. I'll save this one first, the single job one. So get single job, single job. And then let's create one for patch, meaning one for update. But of course, the method will be patch. And I'll leave get all jobs since I want to keep using those IDs, of course. And I think I can close the login one for now, because we already have logged in as Anna. And then let's look for the patch method and a send out. I'm messing up the get single job. My apologies. So let me open up the new one. And I'm going to go with patch. We're looking for the URL one. And again, we'll be looking for the jobs. And then we want to go with that route parameter. And of course, this is going to be that job ID. So let me get all the jobs. And you know what, I'll work with that last one, since we have repeating values. So let me grab here this ID, and then pass it here. And remember, authorization, we'll go with bearer token, and we have access token. And if I send and if I get update job, then of course, we know that we can start setting up the functionality. And as far as the logic, like I already said, I mean, most of it is going to be exactly the same. The difference, of course, is the mongoose method we're going to use. 
and the fact that I'll check for both. I'll check for company as well as the position, and I'll check whether they are not empty. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So where I have the update job, let's just start working. And first, same deal. I'm going to be looking for the user as well as the params. So that won't change because remember, in the routes, I mean, all of them are looking for a route parameter, correct? So let's take this one. There's really no point to repeat ourselves in this case. So let's copy and paste. However, the difference is that in this case, since we're updating, also in the body will provide some info. And in my case, I'm going to be looking for both. I want to get the company as well as the position. So let's go here with the raw and we'll go with JSON here. And if you want to speed this up, you can actually go to create job and just take these values. So that's going to be our patch one, copy and paste. And we just need to remember to add the curlies here. And as far as the values, well, let's come up with some kind of company and I'll call this random. And then it's not going to be a backend developer. It's just going to be a full stack. And then back in my controller, we also want to add it over here. So I'm still destructuring the request object, correct? And in there I have params. I have the user now, as well as the body. Because remember, in here, we're sending that in the body. So let's go back and let's say body. And in the body, we'll be looking for company company and position. Don't forget to add the comma. And right after we destructure everything, I also want to check whether the company or the position is empty. And if that's the case, I want to send back the bad request. So I'll say here company is equal to an empty string or position is equal to an empty string. And if that is the case, I'm going to go with throw new and we're looking for bad request, of course, so bad request error, and we'll say company or position fields cannot be empty. Let's save it here. And then of course, we want to use our find one and update. And remember, we need to basically pass in three things. We want to pass in what we want to update. We want to pass in which job we're looking for. And then, of course, we also have options where I want to get back the updated version as well as I want to run the validators. So let's do that. However, there is a tiny bug over here. And essentially, I'll come back to this one, why I prefer setting up the check in the controller once we start talking about the mongoose errors. And let's just go with const job and we'll set it equal to await. Then a job, of course, that's the model find one and update. And then like I said, first, we want to pass in, well, which job are we going to update? And the setup is going to be exactly the same, where I want to look for underscore ID, as well as who created it. So let's go here, let's say, underscore ID is equal to my job ID, of course, job ID, then we want to pass in the comma, and we'll go with created, and then by now that is equal to my user ID. And then, of course, we want to pass in what we want to update. So let's just go here with the rec and body. And then we want to pass in the options. And I'm going to go with a new true. So we'll be getting back that updated job. And then I also want to right away run my validators. And of course, the property for that is run validators. And we'll set it equal to true. Now, if the job doesn't exist, we already know what we can do. We can simply throw a not found error. And if everything is correct, then of course, we return the job. So let's scroll down, copy and paste. And our functionality should be working. Where if everything is correct, I'll get back the updated job. If not, then of course, I'll get back the error. So let's test it out right now in the postman. So I'm going to go with full stack developer. And you know, what? before we send the correct request, why don't we remove that last value in the ID. Let's send it here. And now, of course, we're getting back that massive Mongo server that we'll work on a little bit later. And then if I just change it around to four, then of course, I'll get back no job with ID such and such. So let me change it back to three. I think that was the correct one. And now once I send now, of course, I am the company and the position is 
full stack developer. And with this in place, we only need to worry about remove job functionality. Beautiful. So now let's just set up remove job functionality. And I guess let's start by saving our request in the postman. So again, we go with save as or just control or I believe command s. And then let's just write update job. Update a job. And now, of course, we want to set up the same thing for the lead job. And let's just start everything from the scratch again. We have a new request. We're going to go with delete. And then the URL is going to be our global variable, then forward slash jobs. And now back in get all jobs. Why don't we remove that random one? So if I go with get all jobs, I can clearly see that I'm getting back the random job. That's the one that we just updated. So why don't we remove this one? So again, I'm looking for underscore ID. I'll right away set it up as my route param. And as far as the logic, well, we're not going to be setting up anything in the body. We really don't need to. What we're looking for, of course, is the authorization. Again, want to go with pair token, access token. Awesome. Let's send. We should get back the lead job. And as far as the functionality, again, we're going to be looking for user and params. Both of them are located in the request, correct? So one is coming from auth middleware, and the second one is coming from the params. Again, I know this is a repetition, but it's very, very important that we understand that. Then let's copy and paste. So we have access to both of these ones. Then as far as the method name, we're looking for find one and remove. So let's go here with const and we'll set it equal to job and we'll set it to await. And of course, like I said, job and then find one and remove. That's the one we're looking for. And as far as the filter object, let's just go again with underscore ID and then job ID, of course. And the same goes for the user ID created at or sorry, created by. And then we set it up as user ID and the same deal. If the job doesn't exist, then we send back the error. And if everything went smoothly, then we simply want to send back 200. That's all we have to do. And I'll do that by cheating a little bit where I'll take this code from the update one and just copy and paste. So we're throwing the error if there is no job or if everything is successful, we don't need to actually send back the JSON. Again, that's really going to depend on your front end. But in my case, I'm just looking for that 200. So if there's some kind of error, then of course, I have one functionality on my front end. However, if everything went smoothly, if I remove the job, then of course, I'm just getting back that 200. That's it. So now, of course, let's test it out in our postman, where we have the job, we want to remove it, let's send it here. As you can see, I'm not getting anything back, but I have 200, which is always a good sign. So now, of course, let's go to get all jobs or you know what, let's save this one first. Let's say save as and we'll say remove or delete job. It's really up to you. Delete job, Let's save it. And then when it comes to get all jobs, of course, I can send it and count is back to three when it comes to Anna. And with this in place, let's just quickly try out to log in as Peter. So we just simply want to change the name here. I'm going to go with Peter. The password is still the same. And of course, I just need to be correct with my email. I send it. Yep, I get the token. And now let's take a look at all the jobs that Peter has. And of course, it's only one. So now let me grab this ID. And first, I'll change it. So first, we'll go with update. And as far as the body, I'll just pass in random. And when it comes to position, I'm going to go back to the intern one. Intern here. So let's send it. That's the response. I have company random. And of course, I want to also see whether I can delete it. So when it comes to the lead job, I'll take the same ID. I'll go back here. I'll copy and paste. And once we run get all jobs for the Peter now, so let's go back to all the jobs. And once we run it now, of course, we have jobs as empty array and count is zero. But keep in mind, this is still a successful response. It's just Peter hasn't created any jobs or in our case, we created it. And then of course, we removed it. And with this in place, we're done setting up the core functionality for our application. Beautiful. 
And before we worry about deployment, let's make our mongoose error responses more user friendly. And before we start, let me just say that just like our error classes, we will only do this once. And after that, we'll bring it from project to project. So if at some point you get bored, just remember, we only need to do that in this project. And then for remaining projects, of course, we'll just reuse the code. And the idea is following where currently we have three mongoose errors. We have validation one. Remember, that is if the user doesn't provide one of the values. Then we have the duplicate issue where email is unique. And of course, we also have the cast error. And if you remember, that's when the ID syntax doesn't match exactly to what the mongoose is looking for. We want to go to the middleware. And more specifically, we want to go to the error handler. And of course, at the moment, I'm logging the error. And in here, I'm just sending back this generic response. So internal server error, and I'm just passing in the object. And if I take a look at the postman, I'm going to be looking for register route. And then if I have already a user in this example, Susan, so if I already have that email, and if I try to register one more time, of course, I'm going to get that duplicate error, correct? Because I already have the email in the system. And essentially, the goal is following where we want to send back more user friendly response. And also, we want to change the status code, because at the moment, we're just sending 500. But of course, this is 400. This is bad request. And the way we do that, we navigate back to error handler middleware. And we'll start by creating a object, a custom error object. And the reason we will do that because we'll set up multiple if statements. Now, technically, you can also manipulate this code. And I'll show you in a second why and how. But in my case, I'll just leave it the way it is. So if our error is our custom one, basically, if it's one of the classes, then we'll just right away send back the response. If not, there's going to be a new custom error object. And then as far as the response, we'll send back that object instead. So let's start working on that. And essentially, we want to go with some kind of variable. In my case, I'm going to go with let just so I know that I'm going to be manipulating those values. And I'll say custom error. And that one is equal to status code and the message. So here I want to set up two properties. And basically, we want to set defaults. So the same idea, if there's already something provided, then of course, we'll send back that. If not, then there's going to be some kind of default. And effectively, it's going to look something like this, where we'll go with the property name. So status code, and this will be equal to error, and then the status code. And eventually, there's going to be multiple if statements that will manipulate this value. So in here, I'm just setting up the defaults. I say, hey, listen, if in the error, I already have the status code, then use that. If not, well, then let's set up the generic response. Let's say status codes, and we're looking for internal server error. And that, of course, is going to be 500. And let's do the same thing with the message. So message property and error. And let's just say here message. And let's go with two vertical bars. And we'll say something, something went wrong. And let's say try again, again later. And now, of course, what we want to do is change this code around, where instead of sending this internal server error, and JSON and error, of course, we'll use these values instead. Now, I will still leave this code, meaning I'll just comment this out. So copy and paste and comment out just because I'll be sending those error objects back to the postman because I find it easier than logging it here and chasing it around the terminal. Again, that is just my preference. And essentially, what we want to change over here is the error. Now, of course, we're looking for custom error. And then we want to go with status code. And then as far as the JSON, well, the same thing, we're going to go with message, and we'll set it equal to our custom error dot. And of course, we're looking for the message. And you'll notice that at the moment, there's really no difference. So if I go back and again, try to register Susan, even though the email is already in use, I see this one, I see over here a message. And this is going to be that mongoose one. And of course, I still have this 500. 
So technically, nothing changed. Now, of course, this is what we'll work on right now. We're after our custom API instance. We'll go here if, and essentially, if you want to check, we'll have to take a look at the object one more time. So this is why I'll keep both of these responses, because it is hard to find that error over here. And essentially, I'll be sending back the object just so you can see what is happening. And I think for the time being, I'll get the error. So let me just save it here. Let's send one more time. And what you'll notice that, of course, if we have that duplicate issue, this is the error that we're getting back. And effectively, what we want to do, we want to check if the error code exists and the code is equal to this 11 and then three zeros, then we want to send back this value, this email one. So then we want to access this key value and then just come up with some kind of message. So it's going to look something like this, where we're going to go with if. Then, like I said, we're checking for error code. And keep in mind that I'm not talking about custom error here. I'm saying, yeah, there is a error object. And now I want to check whether it has the code property. And if it has, then I want to check more specifically if the value is equal to 11 and then three zeros. So go over here like this. And then if that is the case, then I know that I can access, of course, this key value property. And I just need to come up with some kind of message. Now, what we'll do over here, like I said, we'll modify these values over here. So in here, we just set up the defaults. If the error is not going to match any of our conditions, then either we'll use the actual error status code if it exists, as well as the message. If not, then of course, we'll have these defaults. Hopefully that is clear. And let's just start by setting up the message. Now, how we can do that? Well, we can go with custom error. So that's our object. And essentially, we're overriding the message, correct? I'm just saying the message value will be equal. And in this case, I'm going to use the template literals because I'll pass in the actual error key value. And as far as text, I'm just going to say duplicate value entered four. And now let's access the value. Let's say error. And again, remember, we're looking for this property over here, correct? So I'll say here error, and we're looking for key value. And then we just want to continue with the text. So field, please choose another value, another value. And of course, I also want to change the status code. So in this case, I'll go with custom error, and I'm looking for status code property, and I'll set it equal to 400 because this is a bad request. And since we can clearly see the error object, and since we already have all of the code that we need, again, I'm just going to hop around here. And I'll comment this one out because I will use this one in a later videos. And then we'll go back to this custom one. And once we set everything up, now, of course, we can navigate here, we can send and of course, this is the response. So now we have the message, we have duplicate value entered for object object, and we'll work on this one a little bit later. And what's really cool that of course, now we have 400. So we can clearly see that it is a bad request. Now, if we don't want to send this object object, which of course, is not that helpful, we'll simply need to use a little bit of JavaScript, where of course, we have the object. So our key value is an object. And in JavaScript, we have object dot. And of course, in our case, we're looking for keys. So this will give us a array of keys. And of course, in this case, will only have the email. So it's going to look something like this, where we go with object keys, and then we'll pass in our error and key value. And as a result, we'll get back array of the keys. So let's send one more time. Let's go back over here. And now, of course, we'll have duplicate value for the email field, please choose another value. And with this in place, now we're handling the duplicate error. And essentially, we're sending back more friendly user response. Awesome. And once we check for duplicate value, now let's quickly talk about our custom API ones. So our classes, and we can actually remove this if statement right now. Because remember, in the custom error, we are checking for the status code. So if that property is on the object, then beautiful, we set our status code value. And the same goes for a message. And in order to showcase that, I'm just going to remove this if statement for time being, I'll just comment it out, 
just so I can always put it back if I'm wrong. And then as far as the route, well, let's take a look at our auth JS. And I believe we're using it in a login, correct? We have our bad request error. So let's try it out. Now, of course, I'm going to go to login user and I'll try to get the token for Susan without providing the password. So let me remove it. Let me send it over here. And now, of course, I still have please provide email and password. And of course, the error code, the status code is also good. It is 400, which simply means that, of course, our logic works. Because again, we have this custom error one. And essentially, we're looking for the status code property on the error object that's coming in. Because remember, in here, of course, we're setting up a new one. And the same goes for a message. So you can simply remove this code. Now, I'll leave this one for your reference, just in case you want to use it. But effectively, we don't need to use this anymore. And of course, with our new setup, we don't need to import the custom API error class as well. So you can remove it and the code will still work. Not bad, not bad. In our current setup, we're nicely handling duplicate values as well as our own custom errors. So now, of course, we want to deal with those validation errors, which of course is the case, for example, in the auth when I'm registering the user and I'm right away passing in the reg.body. So I'm not checking for email or password or name over here. I simply let the mongoose handle that. And the way we do that is pretty similar to what we have over here. We simply want to set up the if statement. Again, we'll have some kind of condition. In this case, we're going to be looking for validation error. And if that is the case, again, we'll use one of the nifty JavaScript methods. In this case, we're not going to be looking for keys. We'll be looking for the values. And of course, we'll send back the nice response. And in order to test it out, let's just go back again to our postman. Now, I'm not going to do that in login because again, in here, we have our custom one, the bad request one. What I want to do is go back to the register user. And in here, I want to remove both the email and a password. And yes, I'm purposely removing both just so you can clearly see our functionality in action. And once we do that, once we send, I mean, we can still see 500. So that just means internal server error. But the message is already more user friendly, correct? We already have user validation failed, password and blah, blah, blah. So let me show you the entire object, just so you can understand the functionality we're about to set up better. And technically, I don't even need to comment this one out. Because if I have my first return, of course, this is what we'll send back. So let me go back to the postman, send it one more time. And of course, this is going to be that giant object that we're getting back. And the structure is following where we have this errors object. And of course, in here, we'll have all the values that are missing. So of course, in our case, that is password and the email. And this is very, very important. Because of course, if you have only one, then technically, you don't need to worry about multiple keys. But that's not our scenario. So in our case, we do need to worry about multiple keys in that object because maybe the password, email and name might be missing. And also in that object, in the error object, not only we have errors, we also have the name. And essentially in our if block, we just want to check whether it is a validation error. So let's go back. And I'm going to do that above the duplicate one. But of course, the position doesn't really matter, where I'll say error name, if it is equal to the validation error, so let's go over here with validation error. And if you need to copy and paste, just so you don't make some silly typos. So essentially, if you're like me, then of course, you can do that. So let's copy and paste. And if that is the case, then what I want to do is get all the values for the keys in the errors object. So notice, of course, I have the password, correct? Of course, I have the email. And what we want to do, grab this errors one and just get the actual values of these objects. Because errors is an object itself, then password and email are objects. So I'm looking for the actual values in there. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So I have if error name is equal to validation error, then let's just go with custom error. 
and we're going to be looking for the message. And like I said, we're going to go with object and values, and then we'll pass in the error and errors. So in the error object, of course, there is errors object. And in there, I have two more keys, I have password and email, and I want to turn them into array. And then I want to iterate over using map. So since we're getting back the array, of course, I can use my map method. And I'm just going to call this item. So each and every item, I'll call the item. And then I'll say item dot message. So in here, you'll notice that, of course, in there, in that values, I have a message property, correct. And then I want to access it and send it back. So let's say here item dot message. And then we'll just join it back to the string. And we'll add a comma. So that's going to be our message. Now, as far as the status code, again, 400. So let's go over here with custom error. And we're looking for status code. And that will be equal to 400. So once we save, and once we send it back, now, of course, we should get a better response. But of course, we don't because I mean, I left my first response in there as well. So let me comment this sucker out and then send it here. And now, of course, I have please provide password, please provide email, which effectively is way more user friendly than the object that we're sending back. And also notice the status code, of course, now we're sending back 400. And if you're confused about the code, just go back to the error handler, and just log what you're getting back from object that values, and it will make total sense. So essentially, the map and join will make total sense. So let's try it over here. We'll go with console log, and then we're looking for object dot values. And then here we want to pass in error. So the error object, and then more specifically, the errors object. So let's save it. And back in postman, we want to send it, of course, the response doesn't change. But in my terminal, I can clearly see that what I'm getting back from object dot values is array of objects. And then I'm iterating over that array. And then more specifically, in each object, I'm accessing the message. And then I just join all of them together. So I set it back to the string. And then I just add comma in between. And once we have all of this in place, now, of course, we can worry about our third instance. And that's going to be the cast error. And as far as the cast error, of course, in the auth, we're not going to get it, because we're not using the IDs. But in the jobs, we should get it. So back in where I have the jobs controller, if we take a look at, I don't know, get single job, of course, I'm passing in the job ID that is coming from params, correct. And in here, if I cannot find the job that has the job ID with the user ID, of course, I send back the not found error. However, there also might be a case where the syntax doesn't match to whatever the database is looking for. And of course, in order to showcase that, let me just go to get all the jobs. So this is going to get me all the jobs that Susan has. And as a side note, I think I logged out. So let me log in back as Susan. So let's say over here password. And in my case, while I'm testing, I'm pretty much setting everything up as secret. So let's send it here. Yep, we have the token. So let me now send get all jobs. Okay, awesome. I'm getting the jobs. And now of course, whether that's for get single job update job or delete job, I will have to provide that ID. And if I'll just mess up the values, that's one thing, then we'll get that 404. But we also might have that cast error. So let's go to I don't know, get single job, copy and paste the correct ID sent here. Okay, we should get back the correct response. But if I'm going to start adding the values or removing, we should see the casting error. Now again, in our case, we just see the string. So let me scroll down. I know it's a little bit annoying, but it's important for me to showcase those big objects just so I can see where we're getting the values from. And once I send it, of course, now I have error, and the name is equal to cast error. And now we just want to swing back to our error handler, and essentially set up the if condition where I'm going to be checking for cast error. If that is the case, then of course, I'll just send back some kind of string with 404. So again, that's going to be not found one. And I'll just provide the value just so user can understand what's happening. 
So let's go back over here. Let's say if and I'll just say error name and if it is equal to a cast error. And if that is the case, I want to go with my custom error, then the property name is message. And actually, I want to set it up as template string. So no item found with ID. And then we're going to be going for error. And of course, I'm looking for the value one. So in the error object, there's a value property. And I'm looking for this ID. So let's say here error value. And then the next thing is that status code. And in this case, we want to go with custom error. So custom error here and status code. And that is going to be equal to 404 or not found. Now, of course, if you want to use the status codes here as well, please definitely do so. I just thought that it's important for me the first time to show you the actual number status codes. And then if you want, you can use the library instead. So let me send it here. And of course, I should get back the proper response. But the problem is that I'm still sending back the first one. So now let me remove it. Since we're not going to use it, let's save it. And then once we send now we have no item found with ID. And we have the 404. And with this in place, of course, we can move on to the next topic. All right. So far, all our apps were nice and cute since we only use them in local setup. But with this project, things are about to get interesting. You see, this app will actually host on Heroku, basically deploy it on the cloud. And what that means that we also need to think about security, essentially how we can protect our API from some bad actors. And the good news is that with the help of community, so think NPM and more specifically NPM packages, we really don't need to do that much. Just install some packages and add them as middleware in our app, and we're good to go. Yes, it is that simple. Now, is our app going to be safe from any possible attack? Well, no, most likely not. Remember, our biggest security soft spot is still our user. Yes, of course, we should be protecting our API, but how are you going to stop the user from storing a token in a unsecure manner? There's really no package for that. And as far as the packages we're going to use, well, first, we are going to use Helmet, arguably the most popular security package out there, which sets various HTTP headers to prevent numerous possible attacks. In fact, Helmet is so popular, it's actually used in many other packages as a dependency. After that, we want to implement Core's library, which just ensures that our API is accessible from different domain. If you don't have Core's installed, you'll only be able to access the data from the same domain. If you remember in the previous projects, we did that in JavaScript file located in the public folder. And if you try to access our previous APIs from any other front end apps, you'll get a course error. Now cores stands for cross origin resource sharing, and it is a mechanism to allow or restrict requested resources on a web server depending on where the HTTP request was initiated. By installing and implementing the course package, essentially we make our API accessible to the public. After that, we want to use XSS Clean Library, which sanitizes the user input in reg.body, reg.query, and reg.params, and as a result, protects us from cross-site scripting attacks where the attacker tries to inject some malicious code. And lastly, we want to limit the amount of requests the user can make. And we'll do that with the help of express rate limit library. If you're using the star, all the libraries are already installed and ready to go. But if you want to use it for your own project, of course, just install them by running npm install, and then the name of the library. And also, if you want to get more info on any of them, a library docs is a very good place to start. In later projects, we might use some additional libraries or config options. But in general, as far as the standard security, this setup is a very good place to start. All right. And once we have covered general info about the security packages, now we simply want to go to app.js. We want to import them one by one. And of course, we just want to invoke them. And in my case, I'm going to do it over here where we have express.json. And I'm going to start by providing comment extra, and uh, let's say security packages. 
and then we're looking for helmet first and we'll set it, of course, equal to the package helmet. Then the same for cores. So this is the cores package. Then we have one for cross site scripting. So require and the package name here is XSS clean. And last one is express rate limit. And I'm purposely setting this one up last just because there's going to be a little bit of configuration there as well. So let's go with require and express rate limit. Then let's save, keep scrolling where we have the JSON. Let's start with our helmet. So app.use. And like I said, we just invoke the helmet. The same for the rest of them. So app.use. And of course, in here, I'm looking for cores. I can just copy and paste. Then I want to go for cross site scripting one. So XSS. And again, we invoke it. And then we have the limit one. So again, app.use then rate limit and you know what i think i'm gonna change the name here i'm gonna go with rate limiter not a big deal but just my preference and if we take a look at the package docs effectively what we want to set up is the time so in how long and how many requests and as you can see here they provide an object and the properties are window milliseconds Effectively, we get this in milliseconds and we just set up the time. And as you can see, this is example for 15 minutes and then how many requests. And also, if you keep on scrolling, you'll notice their responses. So by default, the message is going to be too many requests and the error response is going to be 429. And once we're clear on the setup, let's implement it in our own app. So first, what I want to do is move this rate limiter up. So I want to set it up as our first middleware. And then in order to speed this up, we'll just grab the object here with those milliseconds as well as the max request. We'll invoke it here, copy and paste, and our limiter is in place. Lastly, according to their docs, if our application is behind reverse proxy, which is going to be our case, since we'll push this up to Heroku, we also want to implement this app.set trust proxy. So let's just take this code and place it before the rate limiter. And with this in place, we have our security packages. So now we can move on to our next step. Just a friendly reminder that we're about to host our project on Heroku. And if in the MongoDB, you are using local IP address option, you'll need to switch to allow access from anywhere one. Otherwise, MongoDB will throw an error and your app won't work. Awesome. And once we have the basic security in place, let's complete this project by deploying it on a cloud. So we can start utilizing our API from any front end setup. And while there are many hosting providers out there, during this course, we'll use the following two, Heroku and DigitalOcean. They both have their pros and cons. So just like in most cases, at the end of the day, everything depends on your own preference. And for this project, we'll use Heroku. And since it offers generous free tier, in order to follow along, you'll only need three things, an existing Heroku account. And of course, the signup is free. So just navigate to Heroku.com and look for signup option. Second, since Heroku utilizes Git version control, you'll need Git installed on your computer. And since this is somewhat of an advanced course, my assumption is that that is already a case. My assumption is that you already have get properly installed. And third, you'll need a Heroku CLI, a tool to deploy our apps right from our computer. And as far as the install for Heroku CLI, you can find the entire setup in the Heroku docs. So once you sign up for the account, this is going to be your dashboard. And of course, I already have some apps in there. And you can find the CLI install by clicking on the docs. And more specifically, the Heroku CLI link. So let's click on a docs. And then, like I said, we're looking for Heroku CLI. And in here, just pick the operating system and follow the steps. Once you're done with an install, make sure to double check whether everything went smoothly by typing Heroku hyphen V in the terminal. And if you can see the version number, great. Feel free to proceed to the next video. If not, if you don't see the version number, please troubleshoot since you'll need a working Heroku CLI 
in order to follow along with deployment. So if I go back to my terminal and if I type Heroku hyphen V, of course, I can see the version number, which means that I have a working CLI on my computer. And lastly, in the next video, we'll actually deploy our app. And during deployment, we will utilize some common standard Git commands like init, add, and commit. And since this is not a Git course, I'm not going to dwell on them too much. So if you need to jog your memory as far as the Git basics, please utilize the search engine. All right. And once you have installed Heroku CLI, now let's finally deploy our application. And in my case, what I'm going to do, I'm going to look for the entire folder. So this is the entire course. And then for the jobs API. And after that, I want to get the final one. And essentially, I will make the copy just so I can set it up on desktop. Now, of course, in your case, that is going to be your current application. However, I do strongly suggest following all the steps and deploying the project as a separate project. And here's what I mean. So I'll make the copy of the final one here and I'll rename it. But before I do that, I'll just drag and drop and place it on a desktop. So here now it is on the desktop and then I'll call this jobs API or whatever. Again, as always, name is really up to you. And I suggest doing the same thing. Or essentially, if you have been working on starter, just make the copy and set it up on desktop or somewhere separately, because it's just going to be easier. Otherwise, if you're working in the entire course project, in my opinion, it's going to be hard to navigate around and set everything up. And you also might run into some bugs. So let me open up right now my text editor. I'll make this one a little bit smaller. Then I'll drag and drop my application and effectively will follow these steps. So let me go back to Heroku. We'll go to documentation here. And then we're looking for Node.js. And then more specifically, we're looking for deploying Node.js apps on Heroku. So these are all the steps we're going to take, plus some additional ones that I find useful. And first, what I want to do is go back to my project. And I always, always, always start by removing the existing Git repo, just in case there is one. And as far as the Magda command is rm, then hyphen rf, and then git. Now, if you're using Windows, if you take a look at my Twitter, if you look around, you'll probably find one of my tweets where I share both the command for Windows as well as the Mac. Again, this is very, very important. You always want to start from the scratch. After that, we want to check whether we have that process.env port variable. And by the way, by the end of the deploy, I'll show you where we can actually see the value that is on Heroku. But this is a must. Again, we can hard code and it nicely works in a local setup. But when you deploy, you always want to go with process.env and then the port variable. And then Heroku picks that port variable and, of course, spins up our application on that port. Then we want to set up a simple route. So at the moment, we have the auth and jobs. But what I also like to do is just to set up a simple dummy get route so I know that everything is fine and I have deployed my application. And in this case, I'm just going to go with app.get, then forward slash. So of course, that's my index. And then I'm looking for rec and res. And then in here, let's just send a silly little response where we say res dot and we'll say send and jobs API. That's it. That's all we have to do. And then we will navigate to package JSON. And this is where we'll take a look at the steps. So let's keep on scrolling. And they suggest setting the node version. And in my case, that is node 14. Because remember, initially, when we started the course, I installed node 14. But if you install a different version, of course, set that one up. And just to jog your memory, if you want to check your node version, just go to node dash and V. And again, in my case, that is 14.15. But essentially, we'll just go with 14. So in the package JSON, keep scrolling, then add a comma, and then let's say engines. And then inside of it, let's go with node. 
and pretty much set up the same code. So in order to speed this up, I'll just copy and paste and I'm in good shape. Then let's scroll up and where we have star command. We're not going to go with nodemon app js. This is, of course, only in development. Effectively, we'll go with node and app js, then save it. So that should do it for package JSON. And then lastly, as far as the initial setup, we want to set up a proc file and then add some values to it. Now, if you want to find more info about the proc file, just keep scrolling here, blah, blah, blah. And I think I already went past it. So let me go up. Notice here specifying a start script. And if you click on this proc file, you can find more info. But effectively, what we want to do is create new file. Now we don't add extension here, we just say proc file, like so. And then inside of it, we'll go with web and we'll set node and app.js. So pretty much this value is going to be the same as our start command. And that should do it for initial setup. So now, of course, we need to start working with git as well. And first, we'll start by git init. So we'll initialize empty git repo. Then we want to add everything to the staging area. So git add and then dot. And then, of course, some kind of commit message. So essentially, in this case, I'm going to go with initial commit. Okay, awesome. And then this is where the Heroku comes in. We want to go with Heroku. And you know, what? let me just clear everything so you can clearly see what's happening. So we're going to go with Heroku and login. So if you have the CLI, you'll be able to log in. Just press any key like they suggest over here. And then once you do that, they'll ask you to log in. Okay. Then, of course, we want to create a new Heroku application. And we do that in the following way. We go with Heroku. And again, let me clear everything. Let's go with Heroku, then create. And then we need to come up with a name. And keep in mind that you cannot start with a number. So if you remember in our course project, of course, I go with 0605 or whatever. In this case, I'm going to have to go with jobs API. And then this probably will be taken. Let me double check. Yep. Notice here is already taken. So we need to start from scratch. So let's say Heroku create. And then I'm going to go jobs hyphen API and then 06. Again, you cannot go 06 and then jobs API. It's not going to work because you cannot start with a number. So let's set it up. Now I'm creating that new application. Awesome. And as I said, note, if you just run Heroku create, it will create a name for you. So if that's what you prefer, I mean, go for it. And then I just want to quickly check whether git remote points to the actual repo. So let's say here, git remote and then hyphen V. And if you see these values, then of course we are moving in the right direction. And before we can push this up, we need to, of course, deal with our env variables, correct? Because if you take a look at the git ignore, of course, these are ignored. And that's how they should be. And effectively, we have two ways. We can do it using command line, but I'll just add one value using the command line. I'll just go with this lifetime one. And then I'll show you another way how we can do that in the dashboard on the GUI, because I find GUI to be easier as far as setting up the env variables. Now, with that said, of course, that means that initially when we push our application to the GitHub, it's not going to work because our application is looking for all the env variables. But I'm just going to show you one, the lifetime one, because if you'll try to do this secret, essentially in the command line, it's just going to be spitting back errors as far as the secret value. Now, of course, you can always switch back to string the, I don't know, secret JWT or whatever. But since I want to keep this value, I'll show you both setups. And after I've been rambling and rambling for about half an hour about it, let's go with Heroku, then config, config. And then we want to go with a colon and set. And essentially, this is where we want to set up those ENV variables. And yes, for all the env variables you have, you'll have to type this Heroku config. And as I said, not my typing as always is awesome. So let's go with config and then set more properly. 
and then copy and paste. And by the way, didn't copy this one either. My apologies. I'm literally on fire. So let's go back here and then copy and paste. And now, of course, we're setting that config variable, correct? So now we have one, the JWT lifetime and 30 days. So without setting up these ones, we'll push this up to the Heroku. Of course, our application won't work, but then I'll show you another way how we can set them up. So now let's go here and in the command line, let's clean everything and let's just type git push and Heroku. And then if you check the docs, they say, and by the way, this is that login screen you can close it. But if you check the docs, they say that you should go with Heroku and main. Now, in my case, if I type Heroku and main, I'm basically going to be getting this error. If I go with get push Heroku and then master, then everything works as expected. Now our application is being pushed to the GitHub. And from there, of course, the Heroku picks it up and now it starts to deploy. But we need to go back to our dashboard, our GUI. Then in here we can refresh. We should see the application, but again, it's not going to work. If you go to application, if you open app, of course, you will have some kind of dummy screen or whatever. But I can tell you right away that our application won't work because, of course, those env variables are not there. Now, in order to set them up in a GUI, we'll go over here and we're looking for settings and we'll go with reveal config wires. And notice we have the lifetime one, correct? And now simply what we want to do is add the rest of the values as well. So essentially here, I'm looking for my Mongo URI. That's going to be my first one. Copy and paste. And the same goes over here. So I want to take the value, of course, and copy and paste. Let's add this one. And the same will do with our secret one. And for some interesting reason, in the console, it spits back errors. But in the GUI, when you add that secret one, then everything works like peaches. So let me go back here. Let me grab the value, copy and paste. And now, of course, we want to add that var. And then in order to spin everything up, we just need to go here more. And we need to go with restart all dinos. So at this point, I'll freeze the screen. I'll change back to my actual password and then I'll restart the dinos. And once we restart all the dinos, yep, that's what we want to do. And if we take a look at the logs, you'll see how initially our application was on port 43710. So that was the port that the Heroku picked. Then we exited with a status of 143. So basically, we had the issue with our process.env. And now, of course, we're back to 46 and then 97. So that's the port. If we open up the application, notice I can clearly see my jobs API. And of course, I was just showcasing the port variable. So you get the clear idea of how everything is set up. That's why we go here with this port, because then Heroku picks the port where our application is going to be located. And once I have my application up and running, we simply want to grab the URL and we want to test it out. Now, I'm not going to test it out with all the routes, but I definitely want to create or log in the user and see whether I can see all the jobs. So in my case, I'm going to go to the postman. And since I don't want to mess up these routes, I'll actually create first a global variable because in here, of course, yes, I have the URL. But what is the actual URL? Well, it is localhost 3000. Correct. Now, what do we want to do? We want to go with edit. Then let's write here prod and then underscore URL. And then let's just copy and paste the value. So this is going to be the URL for your application. Now we're still looking for API and then version one. So that's not going to change. Let's save it here. And then I can close my globals. And like I said, I'll create a new route. And this is going to be a post route. And since I have that one Susan user, I'll just try to log in and then see whether I can see all the jobs that Susan has. And in this case, we're looking for prod and of course the URL. Okay, awesome. 
then we're looking for auth and then forward slash login. So that is going to be the URL. Now, as far as the credentials, well, where we have the login user, first, I want to grab the body here. So let's take all of this. And again, we're just doing that. So we don't have to type everything from scratch. So JSON, copy and paste. Okay, we have Susan Gmail, password and all that. And then remember, since I want to set that token automatically, what do we need to do? Well, we need to look for tests, correct? And just take these two lines of code. And then back in my production one, copy and paste. And now I want to send. And if everything is correct, which of course it is, I'm getting back my token. And I'm still setting it up in the globals, which is just awesome. And now, of course, we just want to create another route. Now, this will get all the jobs that Susan has. So let's go and go with get route. And we're looking for, again, the production URL, then jobs. And this is going to be the get route. That's correct. And then in here, I mean, let's go with authorization, of course. We're looking for bearer token and access token. And if everything is correct, I should see that Susan has two jobs, one for Netflix and one for Google. And wonderful, we have successfully created our application and we have deployed it on Heroku as well. Okay, once our app is chilling on the cloud, now it's time to set up some nice docs using Swagger UI. Don't get me wrong, there are quite a few alternative API documentation options out there, but it's hard to compete with a nice end result you get with Swagger. With that said, setting up Swagger manually, aka writing the code yourself from the scratch, is no walk in the park. It's not that it's hard, it's just really tedious and takes somewhat long time. And since I don't want to spend three hours on setting up the docs, I'll show you a nice shortcut where we can utilize the Postman docs and a third party library to essentially automate the process. And as a result, save ourselves a ton of time. Before we continue, please let me make it clear. This is not going to be a tutorial on Swagger UI. We just want to create working docs. And in fact, I won't dwell on any of the details. If you want to find out more about Swagger UI syntax and other options, please utilize one of the tons of nice tutorials and blog posts out there. And we're going to start our documentation setup with a little detour where I'll show you how to clone an existing Heroku app. Needless to say, technically it's optional. If you don't want to do that, you can just keep using the project we used for deployment. But if you're anything like me, essentially, if possible, you don't like keeping the projects on your local machine and instead you want to keep them on a cloud, I think you'll find this video useful. And I want to start by navigating back to my desktop. I'm looking for my terminal. First, I want to navigate to desktop. So let's say here, CD desktop. Then we want to go with Heroku. So that's the CLI. Then get clone and hyphen A. And after that, we need to provide the name of the app, which in my case is jobs API 06. So either you can copy and paste or you can type it out. And in my case, I'm going to go with jobs api and 06 and now on my desktop i should have the repo and what that means is that the url is pointing back to the heroku so every time we'll make some change of course we'll push it back to heroku and all the changes will be applied now what's missing of course is the node modules as well as the dot env because remember if we take a look at our git ignore this is not pushed up to the GitHub. Now, in order to fix that, we'll need to create a file. So I'll go with dot env, and then we want to provide all three values, Mongo URI and rest of the two for the JWT. Now, where you can get them, well, remember, if we navigate to our application, then more specifically settings, we have our variables, correct? Config vars. So just open this up, set it up in dot env, install all the packages, and then you can run npm start. And once I'm done setting up my environment variables, like I already mentioned, we're going to go with npm install. So I'll install all the packages. And then let's go with npm start. Now, since I want to make tiny changes here, 
there's not going to be that much code. Essentially, I will keep in the package JSON node app JS. Please keep in mind that if you want to add more changes to the project, it's probably more useful to set up the command where you're using the node mon. Because if you remember, it's quite annoying with node that you have to restart every time you make the change. Again, we'll have only like, I don't know, six lines of code. So it doesn't really matter in our case. But in general, if this is what you're doing, if you're cloning the app back from the Heroku, just remember to change the start command or set up some kind of command that you can use in dev, where effectively you are using Nodemon right from the get go. And if I can see that server is listening on port 5000, that means that everything is correct. And if I navigate to the localhost 5000 in my browser, I should have that silly jobs API. And with this in place, now we can start setting up the docs. Once our application is running on localhost 5000, we want to swing back to the postman and we want to get the documentation. And the way we do that, we look for our collection. And before you do anything, just make sure that the global URL variable is the same in all the requests. In my case, I'm using the production one, but it doesn't really matter since we'll change that value later anyway. So you can use the URL, just make sure that all the requests have the same value. Otherwise, you might get some weird bugs. And in fact, Postman offers documentation itself. The problem is that once you publish it, it actually goes to a separate URL. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, eventually, in our API, we'll have the route API docs, as you can see. And this is where the user will be able to access the docs. With Postman, once we publish the docs, they're automatically hosted online, but on a separate URL. And since I want my docs to be on the same server, that's why we're doing all this swagger stuff. And in order to export documentation, just look for the collection, again, jobs API, make sure that the URLs are all the same in all the requests. And then the option you're looking for is this export one. If for some weird reason you don't see it, just sign up for a free Postman account. It's not going to cost you anything. They're not going to charge your credit card. You just need to use the email and you'll be good to go. Again, this is the case if you don't see the export option. If you do, then smash the export option like there's no tomorrow. Afterwards, pick the second option, then decide on the name and location. And in my case, I'm going to go with Docs JSON and I'll save it on a desktop. And once we navigate to the location and we can see the JSON file, then of course we can move on to the next step. Awesome. Once we have the Postman JSON file, we are halfway there. We just need to fix a tiny issue. You see, we cannot pass Postman docs directly into Swagger UI. Effectively, we need to format our data first, just so Swagger understands what's happening. And in order to accomplish that, we'll have to sign up for one more free tool, API Matic. Important side note, just like other course resources, it's free and I have no affiliation to them. So in order to follow along with the videos, go to apimatic.io and sign up for free account. Assuming that you sign up for the account, this is going to be your dashboard and you're looking for the import option and we want to import that docs JSON. In my case, I'm going to be looking in the desktop and I want to import yes. Now, don't pay attention to those warnings. As long as you don't have any errors, we should be good to go. So I'm going to click on proceed. And once you have the API instance in place, before we can ship it to Swagger UI, we'll need to edit a little bit. So this is the case where we'll add the proper URL. We'll set up the proper authorization and all that cool stuff. So we want to click here on edit API uh, and let's just start with basic settings. And as you can see, we have tons and tons of options, but totally honestly, we'll just go with a bare bones setup since I don't want to waste too much of your time. And as far as the name, I think I'm going to go with jobs API. If you want, you can add the image. That's not what I'm looking for. So I'll just save basic settings. And this is very, very important. Make sure that you save for moving on to the next configuration options. Then we're looking for server configuration option. The environment will be production server name. I'll just leave it as server one. And 
when it comes to URL, this is where you want to pass the URL that points back to your Heroku project. So in my case, let me double check. I'm going to go back to Heroku here. I have my jobs API open app. So that's going to be my root. Now, one downside with Heroku is that, yes, it takes time to spin up that dyno. So that's one thing that you need to keep in mind. And I'll just take the URL. I'll navigate back to the API Matic, copy and paste. And then remember, as far as our routes, we still want to go with API and then version one. And then we'll have auth and jobs. Again, make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure that you save the config settings. It's very easy to make some changes and then just forget about it. And when it comes to authentication, yes, we'll use the bear token. So auth 2.0, that stays the same. After that, we want to move on to the endpoints. And in here in the endpoints, you'll notice that all of them effectively have the authentication. And that's not what we want. Because if you remember, as far as our API, well, these ones, the actual auth routes, well, we don't want to set up the authentication on them, correct? These are going to be the public ones. And only the jobs will be protected and will require that token. Hopefully we're on the same page. We're looking for register user and login user. So let me open up this endpoint here. Then we want to change the group and I'll change it to auth. And I want to skip the authentication because by default, the authentication is going to be added to all of them. So let's save the endpoint. And now we should see the auth folder. And in there, there's going to be a register user and we're skipping authentication. This is very, very important. And the second route that I want to add is the login one. So look for the login user and same deal. We want to skip the authentication and we want to place it in our auth folder. So let's save the endpoint. And then for the rest of them, we are not skipping the authentication. So don't click here. But what we want to do is change the folder. So for all the routes, one by one, I'll add group and the name will be jobs. And once I save, I have jobs folder with create job route, and I'm not skipping the authentication. And essentially what you want to do, apply the same group to the rest of the routes, get all jobs all the way to the lead job. And since it's not very useful for you to watch how I do that, I'll pause the video and I'll just add this jobs group to the rest of the routes. And once I'm done, I will resume the video. And once you're done, you should have two folders, the jobs folder with all the jobs routes. And again, we're not skipping the authentication and auth folder where we are skipping the authentication. And we have two following routes, register user and login user. And if that is the case, just navigate back to the dashboard. Then you're looking for this option. You're looking for export API. And this is very, very, very important that you go with open API version three. As you can see, by default, we have version two JSON, you're looking for this one, and you want to go with YAML option. So click here, and then export documentation. And eventually, this is what you should see on a screen. And if that is the case, now we can move on to our next step. All right. And once our documentation makes sense to Swagger UI, now let's test it out in their online editor which is a nifty tool that we can use to test out our API docs right in the browser. And if necessary, apply the changes and as a result, save ourselves a ton of time. So what I want you to do is go to your search engine and you're looking for Swagger Editor or Swagger UI Editor, doesn't really matter. And then you can open up two tabs because you'll notice that they do provide some boilerplate code, which of course you can use in order to understand the entire setup. And this is exactly what I'm going to do. So I have one tab open, and I'll open up the another one. And in there, I want to copy and paste this entire thing. So let me select it, then go back. And I want to copy and paste. After that, we can technically start testing our API. But the problem is that we still have the params unfixed. And also we have this extra tag. 
and we'll start with a tag where basically navigate to the bottom where you have the tags and just remove the first one. So that's done. And then let's deal with the query parameters. Because if you take a look at our project, notice we have jobs and then for single job, the update job and the lead job, these are query parameters. But at the moment, everything is hard coded. So how we can set it up in the swagger the params? Well, we'll use their docs. So this is going to be the case where I want you to, again, use your search engine and just type swagger UI parameters. A quick side note, if you can't be bothered going through the swagger docs, you can always find the correct code in the project readme. You're looking probably for the first link, then we'll keep on scrolling. Yep, all the details and all that. But what we're interested in is common parameters for all methods of the path. Now, I don't want you to take the path part, but I want you to take everything starting with the user all the way to get. So take this code. Yes, we'll modify, but this is just going to be faster if we set it up this way. Go back to your editor and what you're looking for are those single routes. So go up here where you have the patch, remove the hard coded one, including the colon. This is very, very important. And the same for get. And once you remove the get part, just copy and paste this one. In this case, we don't want to use the user because the route is jobs, correct? Then we have the ID. Yeah, that still stays the same. And instead of integer, it's going to be a string. It's going to be required. And it's going to be a job ID. Again, if you want to find more info, please just read their documentation. But essentially what we did right now, we added that ID parameter in all these three routes. Get single job, update job, and delete job. And once we have this in place, now we can start testing our API. And we'll start by registering the user. Now, I'm not going to try out all the routes, but I think I'm just going to go with a register and maybe I'll try to create the job and then take a look at the single job just so I can see that everything works. And the way we do that in a swagger, we look for try it out here. Notice these are the values that we're sending. And of course, once you already register user, you'll have to change these values around. But in my case, I deleted the Bob from my database so I can execute. Notice this is going to be the sample request this is going to be the url and voila this is the response so that's my token but the deal again in here is that these ones are protected so if i'll just try to access the job or create a job or whatever i'm not going to be able to do that so you want to copy the token and you have two options either you can set up in one of them and automatically it's going to be added to all of them or you can just scroll up and same deal. Just copy and paste the value authorized. So now I set up my token so I can close the register. I'm good to go. Now we just want to create the job. So let's go to the post request. Again, we're trying it out. I'm going to go with same Google and the front end developer. We'll execute and we should get back the job, the 201. And now if I go to get all jobs and we try it out, we just execute. We don't need to provide anything. We have our jobs array with a count of one. And if I want to take a look at single job, we want to copy and paste the value. And as far as the setup, either of these is going to work. So either get patch or delete. And in my case, I think I'm going to go with get. We want to try it out again. After that, we want to paste the job ID. Remember, as far as the authorization, we right away set up the token at the very, very start. So now, of course, we're authorized to make these requests. So once we execute, check it out. Now I can see my one job. And once everything is working, now the last step is just setting this up in our application. So we'll still need this code. So don't remove it or mess it up. But the good news is that we're pretty much done with the hardest part. So I promise it's going to be a smooth sailing from here on out. Beautiful. And once we have tested our API in a swagger editor, now we just want to add it to our application. And in order to do that, we'll need two packages. We'll need YAML.js. 
and the Swagger UI Express. Now, if you can see both packages in the package JSON, then of course you're good to go. But since I added these packages later, essentially they were not with initial star, you might need to install them yourself. So if you don't see them, just run the command of npm and I or install doesn't really matter. Then go for YAML JS and Swagger UI UI and Express. So this one will convert the YAML one to something that the Swagger UI can understand. And Swagger UI Express just adds Swagger to our application. So I'll install both packages even though I have them. And I'll start by creating a new file. And in my case, I'm going to call this Swagger and YAML. Now, the name is really up to you. Just make sure that the extension is YAML. And now you want to take this entire thing. Again, this is a little bit different than what we have from API Matic. This is already a working documentation. Copy and paste. And back in our app.js, we want to do two things. We want to require the Swagger UI Express, the YAML JS, and then load the YAML file. And then we want to pass it on to the Swagger UI. So I'm going to go below the extra packages. We'll add comment here. We'll say Swagger. And let's just start by grabbing the Swagger UI. Again, we're just coming up with some kind of name. And this will be equal to require. Then we're looking for the Swagger UI Express. And since I have YAML file, I also want to do that. And that will be equal to require. And we're looking for the package. And then we want to load the file. So in here, let's just come up with some kind of name. I'm going to go with Swagger document. And that will be equal to YAML. That's the variable. Then dot. And the method you're looking for is load. And in here, you want to point to the file, which of course is in the root. So we simply go with swagger dot and YAML. And once we have all of this code in place, now we just want to scroll down. And where we have here, the app dot get above it, below it, it's really up to you. We'll go with app dot use. Then we need to come up with a path. And in my case, I'm going to go with forward slash API docs. And you know what? Actually changed my mind. I'll place it after the forward slash. So let's go here. Let's say API docs. As you can see, we're using app.use. So it will be a middleware. And then as far as the code, we want to go with swagger. So that's our variable. And we're looking for the serve property. And then we want to get that YAML file. So again, we we'll go with swagger UI setup method. And in this case, we want to pass in that swagger document. Once all of this is in place, now I just want to go to app.get. And instead of sending back jobs API, what I want to do is send back the heading one. Let's say jobs API. I'll close the heading one. And then I'll just set up some link that goes to API. And for some reason, I went with API use. Should be API docs. My apologies. So let me go here. I'm going to go with href and we're going to set it up as forward slash API docs. And then let's close the link and let's just say documentation. And once we have all of this in place, now let's run npm start. But I can tell you right away that if you'll try to test this on a local machine, it's not going to work. Basically, you'll get a bunch of errors. So everything is going to work once we push this up to the GitHub. For now, I just want to see whether the basic setup work. So let me look for localhost. Then I'm looking for 5000. I should see the documentation. And once we navigate here, voila, we have our documentation in place. Now, the only thing we need to do is just go back and then add those three commands. We want to look for git add. So this is going to add to the staging area. Then we'll go with git commit. Let's just say swagger docs added and lastly remember the command get push heroku main or master so in my case it's master now we're pushing everything to the heroku and if there are no weird bugs we should be in good place 
and the nice swagger do condition should be added to our project. And to answer your question, yes, when you are setting up manually, basically when you're typing this yourself, you do need to provide all these properties. And I just thought that it's much easier to show you how to do that automatically because you need to keep in mind that. As we're progressing with the course, our projects are going to get more complex. And I really don't want to spend five hours on a project and then another five on the documentation because it seems like a big waste of your time. So now let me navigate back to my web browser. I'll close all of my tabs since I have 10,000 of them open. I want to go to Heroku. I want to open up the app. I have my documentation. Awesome. And now let's test it out. So before we do anything, why don't we remove that Bob user? Because I think that that way I don't have to waste too much time on changing the values. I'm not going to test every route, but I want to test out the major ones. So let me delete the user just so I can see that everything works. We're looking for a register user option. I want to go with try it out, of course, and we want to execute. We should get back the token, which is just awesome. Now let's quickly authorize the route. So let's add here, copy and paste, authorized. We'll close it and then let's create a job. So let's go here. We're going to go with try out and we'll execute. Yep, we're creating a job. And lastly, let's just get all the jobs. Try it out and execute. I can see that I have my jobs array with a count of one. So that's how we can add Swagger UI documentation to our API without typing any of the code ourselves.